Preface of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1660. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1660. By Samuel Pepys. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, M.A., F.R.S., Clerk of the Acts and Secretary to the Admiralty. Transcribed from the shorthand manuscript in the Pepysian Library, Magdalen College, Cambridge, by the Rev. Minor Sprite, M.A., late Fellow and President of the College. 1660 by Samuel Pepys. Edited with additions by Henry B. Wheatley, F.S.A. Preface Although the diary of Samuel Pepys has been in the hands of the public for nearly seventy years, it has not hitherto appeared in its entirety. In the original edition of 1825, scarcely half of the manuscript was printed. Lord Braybrook added some passages, as the various editions were published, but in the preface to his last edition he wrote, There appeared indeed no necessity to amplify or in any way to alter the text of the diary, beyond the correction of a few verbal errors and corrupt passages, hitherto overlooked. The public knew nothing as to what was left unprinted, and there was therefore a general feeling of gratification when it was announced some eighteen years ago that a new edition was to be published by the Rev. Minus Bright, with the addition of new matter equal to a third of the whole. It was understood that at last the diary was to appear in its entirety, but there was a passage in Mr. Bright's preface which suggested a doubt respecting the necessary completeness. He wrote, it would have been tedious to the reader if I had copied from the diary the account of his daily work at the office. As a matter of fact, Mr. Bright left, roughly speaking, about one-fifth of the whole diary still unprinted, although he transcribed the whole, and bequeathed his transcript to Magdalen College. It has now been decided that the whole of the diary shall be made public, with the exception of a few passages, which cannot possibly be printed. It may be thought by some that these omissions are due to an unnecessary squeamishness, but it is not really so, and readers are therefore asked to have faith in the judgment of the editor. Where any passages have been omitted, marks of omission are added, so that in all cases readers will know where anything has been left out. Lord Braybrook made the remark in his life of Pepys that the cipher employed by him greatly resembles that known by the name of Richard's system. When Mr. Bright came to decipher the manuscript, he discovered that the shorthand system used by Pepys was an earlier one than Richard's, viz. that of Thomas Shelton, who made his system public in 1620. In his various editions, Lord Braybrook gave a large number of valuable notes, in the collection and arrangement of which he was assisted by the late Mr. John Holmes of the British Museum, and the late Mr. James Yeowell, sometimes sub-editor of Notes and Queries. Where these notes are left unaltered in the present edition, the letter B has been affixed to them, but in many instances the notes have been altered and added to from later information, and in these cases no mark is affixed. A large number of additional notes are now supplied, but still much has had to be left unexplained. Many persons are mentioned in the diary, who were little known in the outer world, and in some instances it has been impossible to identify them. In other cases, however, it has been possible to throw light upon these persons, by reference to different portions of the diary itself. I would here ask the kind assistance of any reader, who is able to illustrate passages that have been left unnoted. I have received much assistance from the various books in which the diary is quoted. Every writer on the period covered by the diary has been pleased to illustrate his subject by quotations from Pepys, and from these books it has often been possible to find information which helps to explain difficult passages in the diary. Much illustrative matter of value was obtained by Lord Braybrook from the diurnal of Thomas Rugg, which is preserved in the British Museum. The following is the description of this interesting work as given by Lord Braybrook, Mercurius Politicus Redivivus, or a collection of the most material occurrences and transactions in public affairs since Anno Domini, 1659, until 28th March, 1672, serving as an annual diurnal for future satisfaction and information, by Thomas Rugg. Es natura hominum novitatis avida, Plinius. This manuscript belonged in 1693 to Thomas Gray, 2nd Earl of Stamford. It has his autograph at the commencement, and on the sides are his arms, four quarterings in gold. 
In 1819 it was sold by auction in London as part of the collection of Thomas Lloyd, Esquire, number 1465, and was then bought by Thomas Thorpe, bookseller. Whilst Mr. Lloyd was the possessor, the manuscript was lent to Dr. Lingard, whose note of thanks to Mr. Lloyd is preserved in the volume. From Thorpe it appears to have passed to Mr. Heber, at the sale of whose manuscripts in February 1836 by Mr. Evans of Pall Mall. It was purchased by the British Museum for eight pounds eight shillings. Thomas Rugg was descended from an ancient Norfolk family, and two of his ancestors are described as aldermen of Norwich. His death has been ascertained to have occurred about 1672, and in the diary for the preceding year he complains that on account of his declining health his entries will be but few. Nothing has been traced of his personal circumstances, beyond the fact of his having lived for fourteen years in Covent Garden, then a fashionable locality. Another work I have found of the greatest value is the late Mr. J. E. Doyle's Official Baronage of England, 1886, which contains a mass of valuable information not easily to be obtained elsewhere. By reference to its pages I have been enabled to correct several erroneous dates in previous notes, caused by a very natural confusion of years in the case of the months of January, February, and March, before it was finally fixed that the year should commence in January instead of March. More confusion has probably been introduced into history from this than from any other cause of a like nature. The reference to two years, as in the case of, say, January 5, 1661 to 62, may appear clumsy, but it is the only safe plan of notation. If one year only is mentioned, the reader is never sure whether or not the correction has been made. It is a matter for sincere regret that the popular support was withheld from Mr. Doyle's important undertaking, so that the author's intention of publishing further volumes containing the baronies not dealt with in those already published, was frustrated. My labours have been much lightened by the kind help which I have received from those interested in the subject. Lovers of peeps are numerous, and I found those I have applied to ever willing to give me such information as they possess. It is a singular pleasure, therefore, to have an opportunity of expressing publicly my thanks to these gentlemen, and among them I would especially mention Messrs. Fennell, Danby P. Fry, J. Elliot Hodgkin, Henry Jackson, J. K. Lafton, Julian Marshall, John Biddle Martin, J. E. Matthew, Philip Norman, Richard B. Prosser, and Hugh Callender, Fellow of Trinity College, who verified some of the passages in the manuscript. To the Master and Fellows of Magdalen College also, I am especially indebted for allowing me to consult the treasures of the Pepysian Library, and more particularly my thanks are due to Mr. Arthur G. Peskett, the Librarian. H. B. W. Brampton, Oppidans Road, London, N. W., February, 1893. End of Preface Particulars of the Life of Samuel Pepys This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1660, by Samuel Pepys. Particulars of the Life of Samuel Pepys The family of Pepys is one of considerable antiquity in the east of England, and the Honourable Walter Courtney Pepys says that the first mention of the name that he has been able to find is in the Hundred Rolls, Edward I, 1273, where Richard Pepys and John Pepys are registered as holding lands in the county of Cambridge. In the next century the name of William Pepys, is found in deeds relating to lands in the parish of Cottenham, County Cambridge, dated 1329 and 1340 respectively, Cole Manuscripts, British Museum. According to the court roll of the manor of Pelhams in the parish of Cottenham, Thomas Pepys was bailiff of the abbot of Crowland in 1434, but in spite of these references, as well as others to persons of the same name, at Braintree, Essex, Deepdale, Norfolk, etc., the first ancestor of the existing branches of the family from whom Mr. Walter Pepys is able to trace an undoubted descent, is William Pepys the Elder of Cottenham, Cambridge, whose will is dated 20th March, 1590. In 1852 a curious manuscript volume, bound in vellum and entitled Liber Talboti Pepys de Instrumentis ad Feoda Pertinentibus Exemplificatis, was discovered in an old chest in the parish church of Balney, Sussex, by the vicar of the Rev. John Dale, who delivered it to Henry Pepys, Bishop of Worcester, and the book is still in the possession of the family. This volume contains various genealogical entries, and among them are references to the Thomas Pepys of 1434 mentioned above, 
and to the later William Pepys. The reference to the latter runs thus. A note written out of an old book of my uncle William Pepys. William Pepys, who died at Cottenham, was brought up by the abbot of Crowlin in Huntingdonshire, and he was born in Dunbar in Scotland, a gentleman, whom the said abbot did make his bailiff of all his lands in Cambridgeshire, and placed him in Cottenham, which William aforesaid had three sons, Thomas, John, and William, to whom Margaret was mother naturally, all of whom left issue. In illustration of this entry, we may refer to the diary of June 12, 1667, where it is written that Roger Pepys told Samuel that we did certainly come out of Scotland with the abbot of Crowlin. The references to various members of the family settled in Cottenham and elsewhere, at an early date already alluded to, seem to show that there is little foundation for this very positive statement. With regard to the standing of the family, Mr. Walter Pepys writes, The first of the name in 1273 were evidently but small copyholders. Within a hundred and fifty years, 1420, three or four of the name had entered the priesthood, and others had become connected with the monastery of Croyland, as bailiffs, etc. In two hundred and fifty years, 1520, there were certainly two families, one at Cottenham, Cambridge, and another at Braintree, Essex, in comfortable circumstances as yeomen farmers. Within fifty years more, 1563, one of the family, Thomas of South Creek, Norfolk, had entered the ranks of the gentry sufficiently to have his coat of arms recognised by the herald Cook, who conducted the visitation of Norfolk in that year. From that date the majority of the family have been in good circumstances, with perhaps more than the average of its members taking up public positions. There is a very general notion that Samuel Pepys was of plebeian birth, because his father followed the trade of a tailor, and his own remark, but I believe indeed our family were never considerable, February 10th, 1661-62, has been brought forward in corroboration of this view. But nothing can possibly be more erroneous, and there can be no doubt that the diarist was really proud of his descent. This may be seen from the inscription on one of his book-plates, where he is stated to be Samuel Pepys of Brampton in Huntingdonshire, Esquire, Secretary of the Admiralty to his master, King Charles II, descended from the ancient family of Pepys of Cottenham in Cambridgeshire. Many members of the family have greatly distinguished themselves since the diarist's day, and of them Mr. Foss wrote, Judges of England, Volume 6, In the family of Pepys is illustrated every gradation of legal rank, from reader of an inn of court to Lord High Chancellor of England. The William Pepys of Cottenham, who commences the pedigree, had three sons and three daughters. From the eldest son, Thomas, descended the first Norfolk branch, from the second son, John Pepys of South Creek, descended the second Norfolk branch, and from the third son, William, descended the Impington branch. The latter William had four sons and two daughters. Two of these sons were named Thomas, and as they were both living at the same time, one was distinguished as the Black, and the other as the Red. Thomas the Red had four sons and four daughters. John, born 1601, was the third son, and he became the father of Samuel the diarist. Little is known of John Pepys, but we learn when the diary opens that he was settled in London as a tailor. He does not appear to have been a successful man, and his son, on August 26, 1661, found that there was only forty-five pounds owing to him, and that he owed about the same sum. He was a citizen of London in 1650, when his son Samuel was admitted to Magdalen College but at an earlier period he appears to have had business relations with Holland. In August 1661 John Pepys retired to a small property at Brampton, worth about eighty pounds per annum, which had been left to him by his eldest brother Robert Pepys, where he died in 1680. The following is a copy of John Pepys's will. My father's will. Endorsement by Samuel Pepys. Memorandum. That I, John Pepys of Ellington, in the county of Huntingdon, gentlemen, do declare my mind in the disposal of my worldly goods as followeth. First I desire that my lands and goods left me by my brother Robert Pepys, deceased, be delivered up to my eldest son Samuel Pepys of London, Esquire, according as is expressed in the last will of my brother Robert aforesaid. Secondly, as for what goods I have brought from London, or procured since, and what monies I shall leave behind me or due to me, I desire may be disposed of as followeth. In primis, I give to the stock of the poor of the parish of Brampton, in which church I desire to be interred, five pounds. Item. I give to the poor of Ellington forty shillings. Item. I desire that my two grandsons, Samuel and John Jackson, have ten pounds apiece. Item. I desire that my daughter, Paulina Jackson, may have my largest silver tankard. Item. I desire that my son, John Pepys, may have my gold seal ring. Lastly. I desire that the remainder of what I shall leave 
be equally distributed between my son Samuel and John Pepys, and my daughter Paulina Jackson, all which I leave to the care of my eldest son Samuel Pepys, to see performed, if he shall think fit. In witness hereunto, I set my hand. His wife Margaret, whose maiden name has not been discovered, died on the 25th March, 1667, also at Brampton. The family of these two consisted of six sons and five daughters. John, born 1632, died 1640. Samuel, born 1633, died 1703. Thomas, born 1634, died 1664. Jacob, born 1637, died young. Robert, born 1638, died young. And John, born 1641, died 1677. Mary, born 1627. Paulina, born 1628. Esther, born 1630. Sarah, born 1635. These four girls all died young. Anne Paulina, born 1640, died 1680, who married John Jackson of Brampton, and had two sons, Samuel and John. The latter was made his heir by Samuel Pepys. Samuel Pepys was born on the 23rd February, 1632-3, but the place of birth is not known with certainty. Samuel Knight, D.D., author of The Life of Collard, who was a connection of the family, having married Hannah Pepys, daughter of Talbot Pepys of Impington, says positively that it was at Brampton, his statement cannot be corroborated by the registers of Brampton Church, as these records do not commence until the year 1654. Samuel's early youth appears to have been spent pretty equally between town and country. When he and his brother Tom were children, they lived with a nurse, Goody Lawrence, at Kingsland, and in after life Samuel refers to his habit of shooting with bow and arrow in the fields around that place. He then went to school at Huntingdon, from which he was transferred to St. Paul's School in London. He remained at the latter place until 1650, early in which year his name was entered as a sizar on the boards of Trinity Hall, Cambridge. He was admitted on the 21st June, but subsequently he transferred his allegiance to Magdalen College, where he was admitted a sizar on the 1st October of this same year. He did not enter into residence until March 5, 1650-51, but in the following month he was elected to one of Mr. Spendluff's scholarships, and two years later, October 14, 1653, he was preferred to one on Dr. John Smith's foundation. Little or nothing is known of Pepys's career at college, but soon after obtaining the Smith scholarship he got into trouble, and with a companion was admonished for being drunk. October 21st, 1653, Memorandum, that Pepys and Hind were solemnly admonished by myself and Mr. Hill, for having been scandalously overserved with drink the night before. This was done in the presence of all the fellows then resident in Mr. Hill's chamber. John Wood, Registrar from the Registrar's Book of Magdalen College. His time, however, was not wasted, and there is evidence that he carried into his busy life a fair stock of classical learning and a true love of letters. Throughout his life he looked back with pleasure to the time he spent at the university, and his college was remembered in his will when he bequeathed his valuable library. In this same year, 1653, he graduated B.A. On the 1st of December, 1655, when he was still without any settled means of support, he married Elizabeth St. Michelle, a beautiful and portionless girl of fifteen. Her father, Alexander Margent, Sir de Saint Michel, was of a good family in Anjou, and son of the High Sheriff of Bauges in Anjou. Having turned Huguenot at the age of twenty-one, when in the German service, his father disinherited him, and he also lost the reversion of some twenty thousand pounds sterling, which his uncle, a rich French canon, intended to bequeath to him before he left the Roman Catholic Church. He came over to England in the retinue of Henrietta Maria, on her marriage with Charles I, but the Queen dismissed him on finding that he was a Protestant, and did not attend Mass. Being a handsome man with courtly manners, he found favour in the sight of the widow of an Irish squire, daughter of Sir Francis Kingsmill, who married him against the wishes of her family. After the marriage, Alexander St. Michel and his wife, having raised some fifteen hundred pounds, started for France, in the hope of recovering some part of the family property. They were unfortunate in all their movements, and on their journey to France were taken prisoners by the Dunkirkers, who stripped them of all their property. They now settled at Bidford in Devonshire, and here or near by were born Elizabeth and the rest of the family. At a later period, St. Michel served against the Spaniards at the taking of Dunkirk and Arras, and settled at Paris. He was an unfortunate man throughout life, and his son Balthazar says of him, my father at last grew full of whimsies and propositions of perpetual motion, etc., to kings, princes, and others, which soaked his pocket, and brought all our family so low, by his not minding anything else, spending all he had got, 
and getting no other employment to bring in more. While he was away from Paris, some deluding papists, and pretended devouts, persuaded Madame St. Michel to place her daughter in the nunnery of the Ursulines. When the father heard of this, he hurried back, and managed to get Elizabeth out of the nunnery, after she had been there twelve days. Thinking that France was a dangerous place to live in, he removed his family to England, where soon afterwards his daughter was married, although, as Lord Braybrook remarks, we are not told how she became acquainted with Pepys. St. Michel was greatly pleased that his daughter had become the wife of a true Protestant, and she herself said to him, kissing his eyes, Dear father, though in my tender years I was by my low fortune in this world deluded to popery, by the fond dictates thereof I have now, joined with my riper years, which give me some understanding, a man to my husband too wise, and one too religious to the Protestant religion, to suffer my thoughts to bend that way any more. Alexander St. Michel kept up his character for fecklessness through life, and took up patents for curing smoking chimneys, purifying water, and moulding bricks. In 1667 he petitioned the king, asserting that he had discovered King Solomon's gold and silver mines, and the diary of the same date contains a curious commentary upon these visions of wealth. March 29, 1667. Four shillings a week, which is, Baltus Michel's father, receives of the French church, is all the subsistence his father and mother have, and about twenty pounds a year maintains them. As already noted, Pepys was married on December the 1st, 1655. This date is given on the authority of the registers of St. Margaret's Church, Westminster. The late Mr. T. C. Noble kindly communicated to me a copy of the original marriage certificate, which is as follows. Samuel Pepys of this parish gentleman, and Elizabeth de St. Michel of Martins in the Fields, Spinster. Published October 19th, 22nd, 29th, 1655, and were married by Richard Sherwin, Esquire, one of the Justices of the Peace of the City and Liberties of Westminster, December 1st, signed Richard Sherwin. But strangely enough, Pepys himself supposed his wedding day to have been October the 10th. Lord Braybrook remarks on this. It is notorious that the registers in those times were very ill-kept, of which we have here a striking instance. Surely a man who kept a diary could not have made such a blunder. What is even more strange than Pepys's conviction that he was married on October the 10th is Mrs. Pepys's agreement with him. On October 10th, 1666, we read, So home to supper and to bed, it being my wedding night, but how many years I cannot tell, but my wife says ten. Here Miss Pepys was wrong, as it was eleven years, so she may have been wrong in the day also. In spite of the high authority of Mr. and Mrs. Pepys on a question so interesting to them both, we must accept the register as conclusive on this point, until further evidence of its incorrectness is forthcoming. Sir Edward Montague, afterwards Earl of Sandwich, who was Pepys's first cousin one remove, Pepys's grandfather and Montague's mother being brother and sister, was a true friend to his poor kinsman, and he at once held out a helping hand to the imprudent couple, allowing them to live in his house. John Pepys does not appear to have been in sufficiently good circumstances to pay for the education of his son, and it seems probable that Samuel went to the university under his influential cousin's patronage. At all events he owed his success in life primarily to Montague, to whom he appears to have acted as a sort of agent. On March 26, 1658, he underwent a successful operation for the stone, and we find him celebrating each anniversary of this important event of his life with thanksgiving. He went through life with little trouble on this score, but when he died at the age of seventy, a nest of seven stones was found in his left kidney. June 10, 1669. I went this evening to London to carry Mr. Pepys to my brother Richard, now exceedingly afflicted with the stone, who had been successfully cut, and carried the stone as big as a tennis ball to show him and encourage his resolution to go through the operation. Evelyn's Diary. In June 1659, Pepys accompanied Sir Edward Montague in the Naseby, when the Admiral of the Baltic Fleet and Algernon and Sydney went to the Sound as joint commissioners. It was then that Montague corresponded with Charles II, but he had to be very secret in his movements on account of the suspicions of Sydney. Pepys knew nothing of what was going on, as he confesses in the diary. I do from this raise an opinion of him to be one of the most secret men in the world, which I was not so convinced of before. On Pepys's return to England he obtained an appointment in the office of Mr. Afterwards Sir George Downing, who was one of the foretellers of the receipt of the Exchequer. He was clerk to Downing when he commenced his diary on January 1st, 1660, and then lived in Axe Yard, close by King Street, Westminster, a place on the site of which was built Floodier Street. This too was swept away for the government officers in 1864-65. to 65. His salary was fifty pounds a year. Downing invited Pepys to accompany him to Holland, 
but he does not appear to have been very pressing, and a few days later in this same January he got him appointed one of the clerks of the council. But the recipient of the favour does not appear to have been very grateful. A great change was now about to take place in Pepys's fortunes, for in the following March he was made secretary to Sir Edward Montague, in his expedition to bring about the restoration of Charles II, and on the 23rd he went on board the Swiftsure with Montague. On the 30th they transferred themselves to the Naseby. Owing to this appointment of Pepys, we have in the diary a very full account of the daily movements of the fleet, until, events having followed their natural course, Montague had the honour of bringing Charles II to Dover, where the King was received with great rejoicing. Several of the ships in the fleet had names which were obnoxious to royalists, and on the 23rd May the King came aboard the Naseby and altered there, the Naseby to the Charles, the Richard to the Royal James, the Speaker to the Mary, the Winsby to the Happy Return, the Wakefield to the Richmond, the Lambert to the Henrietta, the Cheriton to the Speedwell, and the Bradford to the Success. This portion of the diary is of particular interest, and the various excursions in Holland, which the diarist made, are described in a very amusing manner. When Montague and Pepys had both returned to London, the former told the latter that he had obtained the promise of the office of clerk of the Axe for him. Many difficulties occurred before Pepys actually secured the place, so that at times he was inclined to accept the offers which were made to him to give it up. General Monk was anxious to get the office for Mr. Turner, who was chief clerk in the Navy office but in the end Montague's influence secured it for Pepys. Then Thomas Barlow, who had been appointed clerk of the Axe in 1638, turned up, and appeared likely to become disagreeable. Pepys bought him off with an annuity of a hundred pounds, which he did not have to pay for any length of time, as Barlow died in February 1664-65. to 65. It is not in human nature to be greatly grieved at the death of one to whom you have to pay an annuity, and Pepys expresses his feelings in a very naive manner, for which God knows my heart, I could be as sorry as is possible, for one to be for a stranger by whose death he gets a hundred pounds per annum, he being a worthy honest man. But when I come to consider the providence of God by this means unexpectedly to give me a hundred pounds a year more in my estate, I have cause to bless God, and do it from the bottom of my heart. This office was one of considerable importance, for not only was the holder the secretary or registrar of the Navy Board, but he was also one of the principal officers of the Navy and as member of the board of equal rank with the other commissioners. This office Pepys held during the whole period of the diary, and we find him constantly fighting for his position, as some of the other members wished to reduce his rank merely to that of secretary. In his contention Pepys appears to have been in the right, and a valuable manuscript volume in the Pepysian library contains an extract from the old instructions of about 1649, in which this very point is argued out. The volume appears to have been made up by William Penn the Quaker, from a collection of manuscripts on the affairs of the Navy, found in his father's Sir William Penn's closet. It was presented to Charles II with a dedication ending thus. I hope enough to justify so much freedom with a prince that is so easy to excuse things well intended as this is, by great prince, thy faithful subject, William Penn. London, the 22nd of the month, called June, 1680. It does not appear how the volume came into Pepys's possession. It may have been given him by the king, or he may have taken it as a perquisite of his office. The book has an index which was evidently added by Pepys. In this are these entries which show his appreciation of the contents of the manuscript. Clerk of the Acts, his duty, his necessity, and usefulness. The following description of the duty of the clerk of the Acts shows the importance of the office, and the statement that if the clerk is not fitted to act as a commissioner, he is a blockhead and unfit for his employment, is particularly racy and not quite the form of expression one would expect to find in an official document. Clerk of the Acts The clerk of the Navy's duty depends principally upon rating by the Board's approbation of all bills and recording of them, and all orders, contracts, and warrants, making up and casting of accounts, framing and writing answers to letters, orders, and commands from the Council, Lord High Admiral, or Commissioners of the Admiralty, and he ought to be a very able accountant, well versed in naval affairs and all inferior officers' duties. It hath been objected by some that the clerk of the Acts ought to be subordinate to the rest of the commissioners, and not to be joined in equal power with them, although he was so constituted from the first institution, which hath been an opinion only of some to keep him at a distance, unless he might be thought too forward if he had joint power, in discovering or arguing against that which peradventure private interests would have concealed. It is certain no man sees more of the Navy's transactions than himself, and possibly may speak as much to the project if required, 
or else he is a blockhead and not fit for that employment. But why he should not make as able a commissioner as a shipwright, let wise men judge. In Pepys's patent the salary is stated to be thirty-three pounds six shillings eight pence, but this was only the ancient fee out of the exchequer, which had been attached to the office for more than a century. Pepys's salary had been previously fixed at three hundred and fifty pounds a year. Neither of the two qualifications upon which particular stress is laid in the above instructions was possessed by Pepys. He knew nothing about the Navy, and so little of accounts, that apparently he learned the multiplication table for the first time in July 1661. We see from the particulars given in the diary how hard he worked to obtain the knowledge required in his office, and in consequence of his assiduity he soon became a model official. When Pepys became clerk of the Acts he took up his residence at the Navy office, a large building situated between Crutch Friars and Seething Lane, with an entrance in each of those places. On July 4th, 1660, he went with Commissioner Pett to view the houses, and was very pleased with them, but he feared that the more influential officers would jockey him out of his rights. His fears were not well grounded, and on July 18th he records the fact that he dined in his own apartments, which were situated in the Seething Lane front. On July 24th, 1660, Pepys was sworn in as Lord Savage's deputy, for a clerkship of the Privy Seal. This office, which he did not think much of at first, brought him in for a time three pounds a day. In June 1660 he was made Master of Arts by proxy, and soon afterwards he was sworn in as a Justice of the Peace for Middlesex, Essex, Kent, and Hampshire, the counties in which the chief dockyards were situated. Pepys's life is written large in the diary, and it is not necessary here to do more than catalogue the chief incidents of it in chronological order. In February 1661-62, he was chosen a younger brother of the Trinity House, and in April 1662, when on an official visit to Portsmouth Dockyard, he was made a burgess of the town. In August of the same year, he was appointed one of the commissioners for the affairs of Tangier. Soon afterwards, Thomas Povey, the treasurer, got his accounts into a muddle, and showed himself incompetent for the place, so that Pepys replaced him as treasurer to the commission. In March 1663-64, the corporation of the royal fishery was appointed, with the Duke of York as governor, and thirty-two assistants, mostly very great persons. Through Lord Savage's influence, Pepys was made one of these. The time was now arriving when Pepys's general ability and devotion to business brought him prominently into notice. During the Dutch war, the unreadiness of the ships, more particularly in respect to victualling, was the cause of great trouble. The clerk of the Acts did his utmost to set things right and he was appointed surveyor-general of the victualling office. The kind way in which Mr. Coventry proposed him as the fittest man in England for the office, and the Duke of York's expressed approval, greatly pleased him. During the fearful period when the plague was raging, Pepys stuck to his business, and the chief management of naval affairs devolved upon him, for the meetings at the Navy office were but thinly attended. In a letter to Coventry he wrote, The sickness in general thickens round us, and particularly upon our neighbourhood, you, sir, took your turn of the sword. I must not therefore grudge to take mine of the pestilence. At this time his wife was living at Woolwich, and he himself with his clerks at Greenwich. One maid only remained in the house in London. Pepys rendered special service at the time of the fire of London. He communicated the King's wishes to the Lord Mayor, and he saved the Navy office by having up workmen from Woolwich and Deptford dockyards to pull down the houses around, and so prevent the spread of the flames. When peace was at length concluded with the Dutch, and people had time to think over the disgrace which the country had suffered by the presence of de Reuter's fleet in the Medway, it was natural that a public inquiry into the management of the war should be undertaken. A parliamentary committee was appointed in October 1667 to inquire into the matter. Pepys made a statement which satisfied the committee, but for months afterwards he was continually being summoned to answer some charge, so that he confesses himself as mad to become the hackney of his office in perpetual trouble and vexation that need at least. At last a storm broke out in the House of Commons against the principal officers of the Navy, and some members demanded that they should be put out of their places. In the end they were ordered to be heard in their own defence at the bar of the House. The whole labour of the defence fell upon Pepys, but having made out his case with great skill, he was rewarded by a most unexpected success. On the 5th March, 1667-68, he made the great speech of his life, and spoke for three hours, with the effect that he so far removed the prejudice against the officers of the Navy Board, that no further proceedings were taken in Parliament on the subject. He was highly praised for his speech, and he was naturally much elated at his brilliant success. 
About the year 1664 we first hear of a defect in Pepys's eyesight. He consulted the celebrated Cocker, and began to wear green spectacles, but gradually this defect became more pronounced, and on the 31st of May 1669 he wrote the last words in his diary, and thus ends all that I doubt I shall ever be able to do with my own eyes in the keeping of my journal, I being not able to do it any longer, having done now as long as to undo my eyes almost every time that I take a pen in my hand. He feared blindness, and was forced to desist, to his lasting regret and our great loss. At this time he obtained leave of absence from the duties of his office, and he set out on a tour through France and Holland, accompanied by his wife. In his travels he was true to the occupation of his life, and made collections respecting the French and Dutch navies. Some months after his return he spoke of his journey as having been full of health and content, but no sooner had he and his wife returned to London than the latter became seriously ill with a fever. The disease took a fatal turn, and on the 10th of November, 1669, Elizabeth Pepys died at the early age of twenty-nine years, to the great grief of her husband. She died at their house in Crutch Friars, and was buried at St. Olaf's Church, Hart Street, where Pepys erected a monument to her memory. Pepys's successful speech at the bar of the House of Commons made him anxious to become a member, and the Duke of York and Sir William Coventry heartily supported him in his resolution. An opening occurred in due course at Alborough, in Suffolk, owing to the death of Sir Robert Brooke in 1669, but in consequence of the death of his wife, Pepys was unable to take part in the election. His cause was warmly espoused by the Duke of York and by Lord Henry Howard, afterwards Earl of Norwich and sixth Duke of Norfolk, but the efforts of his supporters failed, and the contest ended in favour of John Bruce, who represented the popular party. In November 1673, Pepys was more successful, and was elected for Castle Rising, on the elevation of the member Sir Robert Paston to the peerage as Viscount Yarmouth. His unsuccessful opponent, Mr. Offley, petitioned against the return, and the election was determined to be void by the Committee of Privileges. Parliament, however, being prorogued the following month without the Houses coming to any vote on the subject, Pepys was permitted to retain his seat. A most irrelevant matter was introduced into the inquiry, and Pepys was charged with having a crucifix in his house, from which it was inferred that he was a papist, or popishly inclined. The charge was grounded upon repeated assertions of Sir John Banks and the Earl of Shaftesbury, which they did not stand to when examined on the subject, and the charge was not proved to be good. The House then proceeding upon the debate touching the election for Castle Rising, between Mr. Pepys and Mr. Offley, did in the first place take into consideration what related personally to Mr. Pepys. Information being given to the House that they had received an account from a person of quality, that he saw an altar with a crucifix upon it in the house of Mr. Pepys. Mr. Pepys, standing up in his place, did heartily and flatly deny that he ever had any altar or crucifix, or the image or picture of any saint whatsoever in his house, from the top to the bottom of it, and the members being called upon to name the person that gave them the information, they were unwilling to declare it without the order of the house, which being made, they named the Earl of Shaftesbury, and the house being also informed that Sir J. Banks did likewise see the altar, he was ordered to attend the bar of the house, to declare what he knew of this matter ordered that Sir William Coventry, Sir Thomas Mears, and Mr. Garraway, to attend Lord Shaftesbury on the like occasion, and receive what information his lordship can give on this matter. Journals of the House of Commons, Volume 9, page 306. 13th February, Sir William Coventry reports that they attended the Earl of Shaftesbury, and received from him the account which they had put in writing. The Earl of Shaftesbury denied that he ever saw an altar in Mr. Pepys's house or lodgings. As to the crucifix, he saith he hath some imperfect memory, of seeing somewhat which he conceived to be a crucifix. When his lordship was asked the time, he said it was before the burning of the office of the navy. Being asked concerning the manner, he said he could not remember whether it were painted or carved, or in what manner the thing was, and that his memory was so very imperfect in it, that if he were upon his oath he could give no testimony. Ibid, volume 9, page 309. 16th February, Sir John Banks was called in. The speaker desired him to answer what acquaintance he had, with Mr. Pepys, and whether he used to have recourse to him to his house, and had ever seen there any altar or crucifix, or whether he knew of his being a papist, or popishly inclined. Sir J. Banks said that he had known and had been acquainted with Mr. Pepys several years, and had often visited him and conversed with him at the Navy office, and at his house there upon several occasions, and that he never saw in his house there any altar or crucifix, and that he does not believe him to be a papist, or that way inclined in the least, nor had any reason or ground to think or believe it. Ibid, volume 9, page 310. It will be seen from the extracts from the journals of the House of Commons given in the note, that Pepys denied ever having had an altar or crucifix in his house. 
In the diary there is a distinct statement of his possession of a crucifix, but it is not clear from the following extracts whether it was not merely a varnished engraving of the crucifixion which he possessed. July twentieth, 1666 So I away to Lovett's, there to see how my picture goes on to be varnished, a fine crucifix which will be very fine. August 2nd At home find Lovett, who showed me my crucifix, which will be very fine when done. November 3rd This morning comes Mr. Lovett, and brings me my print of the passion varnished by him, and the frame which is indeed very fine, though not so fine as I expected, but pleases me exceedingly. Whether he had or had not a crucifix in his house was a matter for himself alone, and the interference of the House of Commons was a gross violation of the liberty of the subject. In connection with Lord Shaftesbury's part in this matter, the late Mr. W. D. Christie found the following letter to Sir Thomas Mears among the papers at St. Giles House, Dorsetshire. Exeter House, February 10, 1674 Sir, that there might be no mistake, I thought best to put my answer in writing to those questions that yourself, Sir William Coventry, and Mr. Garraway, were pleased to propose to me this morning from the House of Commons, which is that I never designed to be a witness against any man for what I either heard or saw, and therefore did not take so exact notice of things inquired of, as to be able to remember them so clearly as is requisite to do in a testimony upon honour or oath, or to so great and honourable a body, as the House of Commons it being some years distant since I was at Mr. Pepys's lodging. Only that particular of an altar is so signal that I must needs have remembered it, had I seen any such thing, which I am sure I do not. This I desire you to communicate with Sir William Coventry and Mr. Garraway, to be delivered as my answer to the House of Commons, it being the same I gave you this morning. I am, sir, your most humble servant, Shaftesbury. After reading this letter, Sir William Coventry very justly remarked, There are a great many more Catholics than think themselves so, if having a crucifix will make one. Mr. Christie resented the remarks on Lord Shaftesbury's part in this persecution of Pepys made by Lord Braybrook, who said, Painful indeed is it to reflect to what length the bad passions which party violence inflames could in those days carry a man of Shaftesbury's rank, station, and abilities. Mr. Christie observes, it is clear from the letter to Mears, that Shaftesbury showed no malice and much scrupulousness when a formal charge involving important results was founded on his loose private conversations. This would be a fair vindication if the above attack upon Pepys stood alone, but we shall see later on that Shaftesbury was the moving spirit in a still more unjustifiable attack. Lord Sandwich died heroically in the naval action in Southwall Bay, and on June 24, 1672, his remains were buried with some pomp in Westminster Abbey. There were eleven earls among the mourners, and Pepys, as the first among the six bannerols, walked in the procession. About this time Pepys was called from his old post of Clerk of the Axe, to the higher office of Secretary of the Admiralty. His first appointment was a piece of favouritism, but it was due to his merits alone that he obtained the secretaryship. In the summer of 1673, the Duke of York having resigned all his appointments on the passing of the Test Act, the King put the Admiralty into commission, and Pepys was appointed Secretary for the Affairs of the Navy. The office generally known as Secretary of the Admiralty dates back many years, but the officer who filled it was sometimes Secretary to the Lord High Admiral, and sometimes to the commission for that office. His Majesty's letters patent for the erecting the office of Secretary of the Admiralty of England, and creating Samuel Pepys, Esquire, First Secretary therein, is dated June 10, 1684. He was thus brought into more intimate connection with Charles II, who took the deepest interest in shipbuilding and all naval affairs. The Duke of Buckingham said of the King, the great, almost the only pleasure of his mind to which he seemed addicted, was shipping and sea affairs, which seemed to be so much his talent for knowledge as well as inclination, that a war of that kind was rather an entertainment than any disturbance to his thoughts. When Pepys ceased to be clerk of the Acts, he was able to obtain the appointment for his clerk Thomas Hayter, and his brother John Pepys, who held it jointly. The latter does not appear to have done much credit to Samuel. He was appointed clerk to the Trinity House in 1670 on his brother's recommendation, and when he died in 1677, he was in debt three hundred pounds to his employers, and this sum Samuel had to pay. In 1676 Pepys was master of the Trinity House, and in the following year master of the Cloth Workers' Company, when he presented a richly chased silver cup, which is still used at the banquets of the company. On Tuesday, 2nd September 1677, the Feast of the Honourable Artillery Company was held at Merchant Taylor's Hall, when the Duke of York, the Duke of Somerset, the Lord Chancellor, and other distinguished persons were present. On this occasion, Viscount Newport, Sir Joseph Williamson, and Samuel Pepys officiated as stewards. About this time it is evident 
that the secretary carried himself with some haughtiness as a ruler of the navy and that this was resented by some an amusing instance will be found in the parliamentary debates on may eleventh sixteen seventy eight the king's verbal message to quicken the supply was brought in by mr secretary williamson when pepys spoke to this effect when i promised that the ships should be ready by the thirtieth of may it was upon the supposition of the money for ninety ships proposed by the king and voted by you their sizes and rates and i doubt not by that time to have ninety ships and if they fall short it will be only from the failing of the straight ships coming home and those but two sir robert hard then rose and said pepys here speaks rather like an admiral than a secretary i and we i wish he knows half as much of the navy as he pretends pepys was chosen by the electors of harwich as their member in the short parliament that sat from march to july sixteen seventy nine his colleague being sad needeen but both members were sent to the tower in may on a baseless charge and they were superseded in the next parliament that met on the seventeenth october sixteen seventy nine the high-handed treatment which pepys underwent at this time exhibits a marked instance of the disgraceful persecution connected with the so-called popish plot he was totally unconnected with the roman catholic party but his association with the duke of york was sufficient to mark him as a prey for the men who initiated this terror of the seventeenth century sir edmund berry godfrey came to his death in october sixteen seventy eight and in december samuel atkins pepys's clerk was brought to trial as an accessory to his murder shaftesbury and the others not having succeeded in getting at pepys through his clerk soon afterwards attacked him more directly using the infamous evidence of colonel scott much light has lately been thrown upon the underhand dealings of this miscreant by mr g d skull who printed privately in eighteen eighty three a valuable work entitled dorothy scott otherwise gotherson and hogburn of egerton house kent sixteen eleven to sixteen eighty john scott calling himself colonel scott ingratiated himself into acquaintance with major gotherson and sold to the latter large tracts of land in long island to which he had no right whatever dorothy gotherson after her husband's death took steps to ascertain the exact state of her property and obtained the assistance of colonel francis lovelace governor of new york scott's fraud was discovered and a petition for redress was presented to the king the result of this was that the duke of york commanded pepys to collect evidence against scott and he accordingly brought together a great number of depositions and information as to his dishonest proceedings in new england long island barbados france holland and england and these papers are preserved among the rawlinson manuscripts in the bodleian scott had his revenge and accused pepys of betraying the navy by sending secret particulars to the french government and of a design to dethrone the king and extirpate the protestant religion pepys and sir anthony dean were committed to the tower under the speaker's warrant on may twenty second sixteen seventy nine and pepys's place at the admiralty was filled by the appointment of thomas hayter when the two prisoners were brought to the bar of the king's bench on the second of june the attorney-general refused bail but subsequently they were allowed to find security for thirty thousand pounds pepys was put to great expense in collecting evidence against scott and obtaining witnesses to clear himself of the charges brought against him he employed his brother-in-law balthazar st michel to collect evidence in france as he himself explains in a letter to the commissioners of the navy his majesty of his gracious regard to me and the justification of my innocence was then pleased at my humble request to dispense with my said brother going with the ship about that time designed for tangier and to give leave to his going into france the scene of the villainies then in practice against me he being the only person whom from his relation to me together with his knowledge in the place and language his known diligence and particular affection towards me i could at that time and in so great a cause pitch on for committing the care of this affair of detecting the practice of my enemies there in the end scott refused to acknowledge to the truth of his original deposition and the prisoners were relieved from their bail on february twelfth sixteen seventy nine to eighty john james a butler previously in pepys's service confessed on his deathbed in sixteen eighty that he had trumped up the whole story relating to his former master's change of religion at the instigation of mr william harbour m p for thetford pepys wrote on july first sixteen eighty to mrs skinner i would not omit giving you the knowledge of my having at last obtained what with as much reason i might have expected a year ago my full discharge from the bondage i have from one villain's practice so long lain under william harbord of cadbury somerset second son of sir charles harbord whom he succeeded in sixteen eighty two as surveyor-general of the land revenues of the crown was pepys's most persistent enemy several papers referring to harbord's conduct were found at scott's lodging after his flight and are now preserved among the rawlinson manuscripts in the bodleian one of these was the following memorandum which shows pretty plainly pepys's opinion of harbord 
at about the time of Mr. Pepys's surrender of his employment as Secretary of the Admiralty. Captain Russell and myself being in discourse about Mr. Pepys, Mr. Russell delivered himself in these other words to this purport, that he thought it might be of advantage to both, if a good understanding were had between his brother Harbord and Mr. Pepys, asking me to propose it to Mr. Pepys, and he would to his brother, which I agreed to, and went immediately from him to Mr. Pepys, and telling him of this discourse, he gave me readily this answer in these very words, that he knew of no service Mr. Harbord could do him, or if he could, he should be the last man in England he would receive any from. William Harbord sat as MP for Thetford in several parliaments. In 1689 he was chosen on the Privy Council, and in 1690 became Vice-Treasurer for Ireland. He was appointed Ambassador to Turkey in 1692, and died at Belgrade in July of that year. Besides Scott's dishonesty in his dealings with Major Gotherson, it came out that he had cheated the States of Holland out of seven thousand pounds, in consequence of which he was hanged in effigy at the Hague in 1672. In 1682 he fled from England to escape from the law, as he had been guilty of wilful murder by killing George Butler, a hackney coachman, and he reached Norway in safety, where he remained till 1696. In that year some of his influential friends obtained a pardon for him from William the Third, and he returned to England. In October 1680 Pepys attended on Charles II at Newmarket, and there he took down from the King's own mouth the narrative of His Majesty's escape from Worcester, which was first published in 1766 by Sir David Dalrymple, Lord Hales, from the manuscript, which now remains in the Pepysian library both in shorthand and in longhand. It is creditable to Charles II and the Duke of York that both brothers highly appreciated the abilities of Pepys, and availed themselves of his knowledge of naval affairs. In the following year there was some chance that Pepys might retire from public affairs, and take upon himself the headship of one of the chief Cambridge colleges. On the death of Sir Thomas Page, the provost of King's College, in August 1681, Mr. S. Marion, a fellow of Clare Hall, recommended Pepys to apply to the King for the appointment, being assured that the royal mandate, if obtained, would secure his election. He liked the idea, but replied that he believed Colonel Legg, afterwards Lord Dartmouth, wanted to get the office for an old tutor. Nothing further seems to have been done by Pepys, except that he promised, if he were chosen, to give the whole profit of the first year, and at least half of that of each succeeding year, to be dedicated to the general and public use of the college. In the end Dr. John Copleston was appointed to the post. On May twenty second, 1681, the Reverend Dr. Mills, rector of St. Olaf's, who is so often mentioned in the diary, gave Pepys a certificate as to his attention to the services of the church. It is not quite clear what was the occasion of the certificate, but probably the diarist wished to have it ready, in case of another attack upon him, in respect to his tendency towards the Church of Rome. Early in 1682, Pepys accompanied the Duke of York to Scotland, and narrowly escaped shipwreck by the way. Before letters could arrive in London to tell of his safety, the news came of the wreck of the Gloucester, the Duke's ship, and of the loss of many lives. His friend's anxiety was relieved by the arrival of a letter, which Pepys wrote from Edinburgh to Hewer, on May 8th, in which he detailed the particulars of the adventure. The Duke invited him to go on board the Gloucester frigate, but he preferred his own yacht, the Catherine, in which he had more room, and in consequence of his resolution he saved himself from the risk of drowning. On May 5th the frigate struck upon the sand, called the Lemon and Oar, about sixteen leagues from the mouth of the Humber. This was caused by the carelessness of the pilot, to whom Pepys imputed an obstinate overweening in opposition to the contrary opinions of Sir I. Berry, his master, mates, Colonel Legg, the Duke himself, and several others, concurring unanimously in not being yet clear of the sands. The Duke and his party escaped, but numbers were drowned in the sinking ship, and it is said that had the wreck occurred two hours earlier, and the accompanying yachts been at the distance they had previously been, not a soul would have escaped. Pepys stayed in Edinburgh for a short time, and the Duke of York allowed him to be present at two councils. He then visited, with Colonel George Legg, some of the principal places in the neighbourhood, such as Stirling, Linlithgow, Hamilton, and Glasgow. The latter place he describes as a very extraordinary town indeed for beauty and trade, much superior to any in Scotland. Pepys had now been out of office for some time, but he was soon to have employment again. Tangier, which was acquired at the marriage of the king to Catherine of Braganza, had long been an encumbrance, and it was resolved at last to destroy the place. Colonel Legg, now Lord Dartmouth, was in August 1683, constituted captain-general of his majesty's forces in africa and governor of tangier and sent with a fleet of about twenty sail to demolish and blow up the works 
destroy the harbour, and bring home the garrison. Pepys received the king's commands to accompany Lord Dartmouth on his expedition, but the latter's instructions were secret, and Pepys therefore did not know what had been decided upon. He saw quite enough, however, to form a strong opinion of the uselessness of the place to England. Lord Dartmouth carried out his instructions thoroughly, and on March 29, 1684, he and his party, including Pepys, arrived in the English Channel. The King himself now resumed the office of Lord High Admiral, and appointed Pepys Secretary of the Admiralty, with a salary of five hundred pounds per annum. In the Pepysian Library is the original patent, dated June tenth, 1684. His Majesty's Letters Patent, for the erecting the office of Secretary of the Admiralty of England, and creating Samuel Pepys, Esquire, First Secretary therein. In this office the diarist remained until the period of the Revolution, when his official career was concluded. A very special honour was conferred upon Pepys in this year, when he was elected President of the Royal Society, in succession to Sir Cyril Rich, and he held the office for two years. Pepys had been admitted a Fellow of the Society on February 15, 1664-65, and from Birch's history we find that in the following month he made a statement to the Society. Mr. Pepys gave an account of what information he had received from the master of the Jersey ship which had been in company with Major Holmes in the Guinea voyage concerning the pendulum watches. March 15, 1664-5. The records of the Society show that he frequently made himself useful by obtaining such information as might be required in his department. After he retired from the Presidency, he continued to entertain some of the most distinguished members of the Society on Saturday evenings at his house in York Buildings. Evelyn expressed the strongest regret when it was necessary to discontinue these meetings on account of the infirmities of the host. In 1685 Charles II died, and was succeeded by James, Duke of York. From his intimate association with James, it might have been supposed that a long period of official life was still before Pepys, but the new king's bigotry and incapacity soon made this a practical impossibility. At the coronation of James II, Pepys marched in the procession immediately behind the king's canopy, as one of the sixteen barons of the Sink Ports. In the year 1685 a new charter was granted to the Trinity Company, and Pepys was named in it the first master, this being the second time that he had held the office of master. Evelyn specially refers to the event in his diary, and mentions the distinguished persons present at the dinner on July 20th. It is evident that at this time Pepys was looked upon as a specially influential man, and when a Parliament was summoned to meet on May 19th, 1685, he was elected both for Harwich and for Sandwich. He chose to serve for Harwich, as Sir Philip Parker was elected to fill his place at Sandwich. This Parliament was dissolved by proclamation July 2nd, 1687, and on August 24th the King declared in council that another Parliament should be summoned for November 27th, 1688. But great changes took place before that date, and when the Convention Parliament was called together in January and February, 1689-90, Pepys found no place in it. The right-hand man of the exiled monarch was not likely to find favour in the eyes of those who were now in possession. When the election for Harwich came on, the electors refused to return him, and the streets echoed to the cry of, No tower men, no men out of the tower. They did not wish to be represented in Parliament by a disgraced official. We have little or no information to guide us as to Pepys' proceedings at the period of the Revolution. We know that James II, just before his flight, was sitting to Nello for a portrait intended for the secretary to the Admiralty, and that Pepys acted in that office for the last time on 20th February, 1688-89. But between those dates we know nothing of the anxieties and troubles that he must have suffered. On the ninth March an order was issued from the Commissioners of the Admiralty for him to deliver up his books, etc., to Phineas Bowes, who superseded him as secretary. Pepys had many firm friends upon whom he could rely, but he had also enemies who lost no opportunity of wearing him, on June 10, 1690, Evelyn has this entry in his diary, which throws some light upon the events of the time. Mr. Pepys read to me his remonstrance, skewing with what malice and injustice he was suspected with Sir Anthony Dean about the timber of which the thirty ships were built by a late Act of Parliament, with the exceeding danger which the fleet would shortly be in, by reason of the tyranny and incompetency of those who now managed the Admiralty and affairs of the Navy, of which he gave an accurate state and shewed his great ability. On the 25th of this same month, Pepys was committed to the gatehouse at Westminster, on a charge of having sent information to the French court of the state of the English navy. There was no evidence of any kind against him, and at the end of July he was allowed to return to his own house, on account of ill health. 
Nothing further was done in respect to the charge, but he was not free till some time after, and he was long kept in anxiety, for even in 1692 he still apprehended some fresh persecution. Sir Peter Pallavicini, Mr. James Hublon, Mr. Blackburn, and Mr. Martin bailed him, and he sent them the following circular letter. October 15, 1690. Being this day become once again a free man in every respect, I mean but that of my obligation to you and the rest of my friends, to whom I stand indebted for my being so, I think it but a reasonable part of my duty to pay you and them my thanks for it in a body, but know not how otherwise to compass it, than by begging you, which I hereby do, to take your share with them and me here, to-morrow, of a piece of mutton, which is all I dare promise you, besides that of being ever, your most bounden and faithful humble servant, S. P. He employed the enforced idleness caused by being thrust out of his employment, in the collection of the materials for the valuable work which he published in 1690, under the title of Memoirs of the Navy. Little more was left for him to do in life, but as the government became more firmly established, and the absolute absurdity of the idea of his disloyalty was proved, Pepys held up his head again as a man to be respected and consulted, and for the remainder of his life he was looked upon as the Nestor of the Navy. There is little more to be told of Pepys's life. He continued to keep up an extended correspondence with his many friends, and as treasurer of Christ's Hospital, he took very great interest in the welfare of that institution. He succeeded in preserving from impending ruin the mathematical foundation which had been originally designed by him, and through his anxious solicitations, endowed and cherished by Charles II and James II. One of the last public acts of his life was the presentation of the portrait of the eminent Dr. John Wallace, Sir William Professor of Geometry, to the University of Oxford. In 1701 he sent Sir Godfrey Kneller to Oxford to paint the portrait, and the university rewarded him with a Latin diploma, containing in gorgeous language the expression of thanks for his munificence. On the 26th May, 1703, Samuel Pepys, after long continued suffering, breathed his last, in the presence of the learned Dr. George Hicks, the non-juring Dean of Worcester. And the following letter from John Jackson to his uncle's lifelong friend Evelyn contains particulars as to the cause of death. Mr. Jackson to Mr. Evelyn, Clapham, May 28, 1703, Friday night, honoured sir. Tis no small addition to my grief to be obliged to interrupt the quiet of your happy recess, with the afflicting tidings of my uncle Pepys's death, knowing how sensibly you will partake with me herein. But I should not be faithful to his desires, if I did not beg your doing the honour to his memory, of accepting mourning from him, as a small instance of his most affectionate respect and honour for you. I have thought myself extremely unfortunate to be out of the way at that only time when you were pleased lately to touch here, and expressed so great a desire of taking your leave of my uncle, which could not but have been admitted by him as a most welcome exception to his general orders against being interrupted, and I could most heartily wish that the circumstances of your health and distance did not forbid me to ask the favour of your assisting in the holding up of the pall at his interment, which is intended to be on Thursday next, for if the manes are affected with what passes below, I am sure this would have been very grateful to his. I must not omit acquainting you, sir, that upon opening his body, which the uncommonness of his case required of us, for our own satisfaction as well as public good, there was found in his left kidney a nest of no less than seven stones, of the most irregular figures your imagination can frame, and weighing together four ounces and a half, but all fast linked together and adhering to his back, whereby they solve his having felt no greater pains upon motion, nor other of the ordinary symptoms of the stone. Some other lesser defects there also were in his body, proceeding from the same cause, but his stamina in general were marvellously strong, and not only supported him, under the most exquisite pains, weeks beyond all expectations, but in the conclusion contended for nearly forty hours, unassisted by any nourishment, with the very agonies of death, some few minutes excepted before his expiring, which were very calm. There remains only for me, under this affliction, to beg the consolation and honour of succeeding to your patronage for my uncle's sake, and leave to number myself with the same sincerity he ever did, among your greatest honourers, which I shall esteem as one of the most valuable parts of my inheritances from him, being also with the faithfulest wishes of health, and a happy long life to you. Honoured sir, your most obedient and most humble servant, J. Jackson. Mr. Hugh, as my uncle's executor, and equally your faithful servant, joins with me in every part hereof. The time of my uncle's departure was about three-quarters past three, on Wednesday morning last. Evelyn alludes in his diary to Pepys's death, and the present to him of a suit of mourning. He speaks in very high terms of his friend. 
1703, May 26, this day died Mr. Sam Pepys, a very worthy, industrious, and curious person, none in England exceeding him in knowledge of the Navy, in which he had passed through all the most considerable offices, clerk of the Acts and secretary of the Admiralty, all which he performed with great integrity. When King James the Second went out of England, he laid down his office and would serve no more, but withdrawing himself from all public affairs, he lived at Clapham with his partner Mr. Hewer, formerly his clerk, in a very noble and sweet place, where he enjoyed the fruits of his labours in great prosperity. He was universally beloved, hospitable, generous, learned in many things, skilled in music, a very great cherisher of learned men, of whom he had the conversation. Mr. Pepys had been for near forty years so much my particular friend, that Mr. Jackson sent me complete mourning, desiring me to be one to hold up the pole at his magnificent obsequies, but my indisposition hindered me from doing him this last office. The body was brought from Clapham and buried in St. Olive's Church, Hart Street, on the 5th June at nine o'clock at night, in a vault just beneath the monument to the memory of Mrs. Pepys. Dr. Hicks performed the last sad offices for his friend. Pepys's faithful friend Hewer was his executor, and his nephew, John Jackson, his heir. Mourning was presented to forty persons, and a large number of rings to relations, godchildren, servants, and friends, also to representatives of the Royal Society, of the Universities of Cambridge and Oxford, of the Admiralty, and of the Navy Office. The bulk of the property was bequeathed to Jackson, but the money which was left was much less than might have been expected, for at the time of Pepys's death there was a balance of twenty-eight thousand seven pounds, two shillings, one pence, due to him from the Crown, and none of this was ever paid. The books and other collections were left to Magdalen College, Cambridge, but Jackson was to have possession of them during his lifetime. These were the most important portion of Pepys's effects, for with them was the manuscript of the immortal diary. The following are the directions for the disposition of the library, taken from Hall Manuscript, number 7301. For the further settlement and preservation of my said library, after the death of my nephew, John Jackson, I do hereby declare that could I be sure of a constant succession of heirs from my said nephew, qualified like himself for the use of such a library, I should not entertain a thought of its ever being alienated from them. But this uncertainty considered, with the infinite pains and time, and cost employed in my collecting, methodizing, and reducing the same to the state it now is, I cannot but be greatly solicitous that all possible provision should be made for its unalterable preservation and perpetual security against the ordinary fate of such collections falling into the hands of an incompetent heir, and thereby being sold, dissipated, or embezzled. And since it has pleased God to visit me, in a manner that leaves little appearance of being myself restored to a condition of concerting the necessary measures for attaining these ends, I must and do with great confidence rely upon the sincerity and direction of my executor and said nephew, for putting in execution the powers given them by my forementioned will relating hereto, requiring that the same be brought to a determination in twelve months after my decease, and that special regard be had therein to the following particulars, which I declare to be my present thoughts and prevailing inclinations in this matter, viz. 1. That after the death of my said nephew, my said library be placed and forever settled in one of our universities, and rather in that of Cambridge than Oxford. 2. And rather in a private college there than in the public library. 3. And in the colleges of Trinity or Magdalen, preferably to all others. 4. And of these two, Ceteris Paribus, rather in the latter, for the sake of my own and my nephew's education therein. 5. That in which server of the two it is, a fair room be provided therein. 6. And if in Trinity, that the said room be contiguous to, and have communication with the new library there. 7. And if in Magdalen, that it be in the new building there, and any part thereof at my nephew's election. 8. That my said library be continued in its present form, and no other books mixed therein, save what my nephew may add to theirs of his own collecting, in distinct presses. 9. That the said room and books so placed and adjusted be called by the name of Bibliotheca Pepsiana. 10. That this Bibliotheca Pepsiana be under the sole power and custody of the master of the college for the time being, who shall neither himself convey nor suffer to be conveyed by others any of the said books from thence to any other place, except to his own lodge in the said college, nor there have more than ten of them at a time, and that of those also a strict entry be made and account kept, at the time of their having been taken out and returned, in a book to be provided and remain in the said library for that purpose only. 11. That before my said library be put into the possession of either of the said colleges, that college for which it shall be designed, first enter into covenants for performance of the foregoing articles. 12. 
and that for yet further security herein the said two colleges of trinity and magdalen have a reciprocal check upon one another and that college which shall be in present possession of the said library be subject to an annual visitation from the other and to the forfeiture thereof to the life possession and use of the other upon conviction of any breach of their said covenants s peeps the library and the original bookcases were not transferred to magdalen college until seventeen twenty four and there they have been preserved in safety ever since a large number of Pepys's manuscripts appear to have remained unnoticed in York buildings for some years. They never came into Jackson's hands, and were thus lost to Magdalen College. Dr. Rawlinson afterwards obtained them, and they were included in the bequest of his books to the Bodleian Library. Pepys was partial to having his portrait taken, and he sat to Saville, Hales, Lilly, and Nella. Hales's portrait, painted in 1666, is now in the National Portrait Gallery, and an etching from the original forms the frontispiece to this volume. The portrait by Lilly is in the Pepysian Library. Of the three portraits by Nello, one is in the Hall of Magdalen College, another at the Royal Society, and the third was lent to the first special exhibition of National Portraits, 1866, by the late Mr. Andrew Pepys Cockrell. Several of the portraits have been engraved, but the most interesting of these are those used by Pepys himself as bookplates. These were both engraved by Robert White, and taken from paintings by Nello. The church of St. Olaf, Hart Street, is intimately associated with Pepys, both in his life and in his death, and for many years the question had been constantly asked by visitors, where is Pepys's monument? On Wednesday, July 5, 1882, a meeting was held in the vestry of the church, when an influential committee was appointed, upon which all the great institutions with which Pepys was connected were represented by their masters, presidents, or other officers, with the object of taking steps to obtain an adequate memorial of the diarist. Mr. now Sir Alfred Blomfield, architect of the church, presented an appropriate design for a monument, and sufficient subscriptions having been obtained for the purpose, he superintended its erection. On Tuesday afternoon, March 18, 1884, the monument, which was affixed to the wall of the church where the gallery containing Pepys's pew formerly stood, was unveiled in the presence of a large concourse of visitors. The Earl of Northbrook, First Lord of the Admiralty, consented to unveil the monument, but he was at the last moment prevented by public business from attending. The late Mr. Russell Lowell, then the American minister, took Lord Northbrook's place, and made a very charming and appreciative speech on the occasion, from which the following passages are extracted. It was proper, His Excellency said, that he should read a note he had received from Lord Northbrook. This was dated that day from the Admiralty, and was as follows. My dear Mr. Lowell, I am very much annoyed that I am prevented from assisting at the ceremony to-day. It would be very good if you would say that nothing but very urgent business would have kept me away. I was anxious to give my testimony to the merits of Pepys as an admiralty official, leaving his literary merits to you. He was concerned with the administration of the Navy from the Restoration to the Revolution, and from 1673 as Secretary. I believe his merits to be fairly stated in a contemporary account which I send. Yours very truly, Northbrook. The contemporary account which Lord Northbrook was good enough to send him said, Pepys was, without exception, the greatest and most useful minister that ever filled the same situations in England, the Acts and Registers of the Admiralty proving this beyond contradiction. The principal rules and establishments, in present use in these offices, are well known to have been of his introducing, and most of the officers serving therein since the Restoration, of his bringing up. He was the most studious promoter and strenuous asserter of order and discipline. Sobriety, diligence, capacity, loyalty, and subjection to command— were essentials required in all whom he advanced. Where any of these were found wanting, no interest or authority was capable of moving him in favour of the highest pretender. Discharging his duty to his prince and country with a religious application and perfect integrity, he feared no one, courted no one, and neglected his own fortune. That was a character drawn, it was true, by a friendly hand, but to those who were familiar with the life of Pepys the praise hardly seemed exaggerated. As regarded his official life, it was unnecessary to dilate upon his peculiar merits, for they all knew how faithful he was in his duties, and they all knew, too, how many faithful officials there were working on in obscurity, who were not only never honoured with a monument, but who never expected one. The few words Mr. Lowell went on to remark, which he was expected to say upon that occasion, therefore, referred rather to what he believed was the true motive which had brought that assembly together, and that was by no means the character of Pepys, either as clerk of the acts or as secretary to the admiralty. This was not the place in which one could go into a very close examination of the character of Pepys as a private man. He would begin by admitting that Pepys was a type, perhaps, of what was now called a Philistine. We had no word in England which was equivalent to the French adjective bourgeois, 
but at all events Samuel Pepys was the most perfect type that ever existed of the class of people whom this word described. He had all its merits as well as many of its defects. With all those defects, however, perhaps in consequence of them, Pepys had written one of the most delightful books that it was man's privilege to read in the English language or in any other. Whether Pepys intended this diary to be afterwards read by the general public or not, and this was a doubtful question when it was considered that he had left, possibly by inadvertence, a key to his cipher behind him, it was certain that he had left with us a most delightful picture, or rather he had left the power in our hands of drawing for ourselves some of the most delightful pictures of the time in which he lived. There was hardly any book which was analogous to it. If one were asked what were the reasons for liking Pepys, it would be found that they were as numerous as the days upon which he made an entry in his diary, and surely that was sufficient argument in his favour. There was no book, Mr. Lowell said, that he knew of, or that occurred to his memory, with which Pepys's diary could fairly be compared, except the journal of L'Estoile, who had the same anxious curiosity and the same commonness, not to say vulgarity of interest, and the book was certainly unique in one respect, and that was the absolute sincerity of the author with himself. Montaigne is conscious that we are looking over his shoulder, and we so secretive in comparison with him. The very fact of that sincerity of the author with himself argued a certain greatness of character. Dr. Hicks, who attended Pepys at his deathbed, spoke of him as this great man, and said he knew no one who died so greatly. And yet there was something almost of the ridiculous in the statement, when the greatness was compared with the garrulous frankness which Pepys showed towards himself. There was no parallel to the character of Pepys, he believed, in respect of naivete, unless it were found in that of Falstaff, and Pepys showed himself too, like Falstaff, on terms of unbuttoned familiarity with himself. Falstaff had just the same naivete, but in Falstaff it was the naivete of conscious humour. In Pepys it was quite different, for Pepys's naivete was the inoffensive vanity of a man who loved to see himself in the glass. Falstaff had a sense, too, of inadvertent humour, but it was questionable whether Pepys could have had any sense of humour at all, and yet permitted himself to be so delightful. There was probably, however, more involuntary humour in Pepys's diary than there was in any other book extant. When he told his readers of the landing of Charles the Second at Dover, for instance, it would be remembered how Pepys chronicled the fact that the mayor of Dover presented the prince with a Bible, for which he returned his thanks and said it was the most precious book to him in the world. Then again it would be remembered how, when he received a letter addressed Samuel Pepys, Esquire, he confesses in the diary that this pleased him mightily. When, too, he kicked his cookmaid, he admits that he was not sorry for it, but was sorry that the footboy of a worthy knight with whom he was acquainted saw him do it. And the last instance he would mention of poor Pepys's naivete was when he said in the diary that he could not help having a certain pleasant and satisfied feeling when Barlow died. Barlow, it must be remembered, received during his life the yearly sum from Pepys of a hundred pounds. The value of Pepys's book was simply priceless, and while there was nothing in it approaching that single page in Saint-Simon, where he described that thunder of courtly red heels passing from one wing of the palace to another, as the prince was lying on his deathbed, and favour was to flow from another source, still Pepys's diary was unequalled in its peculiar quality of amusement. The lightest part of the diary was of value historically, for it enabled one to see London of two hundred years ago, and what was more to see it with the eager eyes of Pepys. It was not Pepys the official who had brought that large gathering together that day, in honour of his memory. It was Pepys the diarist. In concluding this account of the chief particulars of Pepys's life, it may be well to add a few words upon the pronunciation of his name. Various attempts appear to have been made to represent this phonetically. Lord Braybrook, in quoting the entry of death from St. Olaf's registers, where the spelling is Papes, wrote, This is decisive as to the proper pronunciation of the name. This spelling may show that the name was pronounced as a monosyllable, but it is scarcely conclusive as to anything else, and Lord Braybrook does not say what he supposes the sound of the vowels to have been. At present there are three pronunciations in use, Peps, which is the most usual, Peeps, which is the received one at Magdalen College, and Peppis, which I learned from Mr. Walter C. Peppis, is the one used by other branches of the family. Mr. Peppis has paid particular attention to this point, and in his valuable genealogy of the Peeps family, he has collected seventeen varieties of spelling of the name, which are as follows, the dates of the documents in which the form appears being attached. 1. Pepys, 1273. 2. Pepe, 1439. 3. Pepys, 1511. 4. Pipes, 1511. 5. Pepys, 1518. 6. Peps, 1519. 7. Peeps, 1520. 8. Pepys, 1552. 9. Peeps, 1636. 10. Pepys, 1639. 11. Peepies, 1653, 12, Peps, 1655, 
thirteen pipes sixteen fifty six fourteen papes sixteen fifty six fifteen peeps sixteen seventy nine sixteen peeps sixteen eighty three seventeen papes seventeen o three Mr. Walter Pepys adds, The accepted spelling of the name Pepys was adopted generally about the end of the seventeenth century, though it occurs many years before that time. There have been numerous ways of pronouncing the name as Peps, Pepys, and Pepys. The Darius undoubtedly pronounced it Pepys, and the lineal descendants of his sister Paulina, the family of Pepys Cockerell, pronounce it so to this day. The other branches of the family all pronounce it as Pepys, and I am led to be satisfied that the latter pronunciation is correct by the two facts that in the earliest known writing it is spelt Pepys, and that the French form of the name is Pepi. The most probable explanation is that the name in the seventeenth century was either pronounced Pips or Papes, for both the forms of A and E would represent the latter pronunciation. The general change in the pronunciation of the spelling A from AI to EE -E took place in a large number of words at the end of the seventeenth and beginning of the eighteenth century, and three words at least, yea, break and great, keep this old pronunciation still. The present Irish pronunciation of English is really the same as the English pronunciation of the seventeenth century, when the most extensive settlement of Englishmen in Ireland took place, and the Irish always pronounce E-A like A-I as he gave him a nate baiting, neat beating. Again, the E-Y of papes would rhyme with they and obey. English literature is full of illustrations of the old pronunciation of E-A as in Hudibras. Doubtless the pleasure is as great in being chated as to chate which was then a perfect rhyme. In the rape of the lock, T, T, rhymes with obey, and in Cooper's verses on Alexander Selkirk, C, rhymes with survey. It is not likely that the pronunciation of the name was fixed, but there is every reason to suppose that the spellings of papes and papes were intended to represent the sound peps rather than peeps. In spite of all the research which has brought to light so many incidents of interest in the life of Samuel Pepys, we cannot but feel how dry these facts are, when placed by the side of the living details of the diary. It is in its pages that the true man is displayed, and it has therefore not been thought necessary here to do more than set down in chronological order such facts as are known of the life outside the diary. A full appreciation of the man must be left for some future occasion. H. P. W. End of Particulars Chapter One of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1660. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1660, by Samuel Pepys. January, 1659-1660. Bless be God, at the end of the last year I was in very good health, without any sense of my old pain but upon taking of cold. I lived in Axe-Yard, having my wife and servant Jane, and no more in family than us three. My wife gave me hopes of her being with child, but on the last day of the year the hope was belied. The condition of the state was thus, viz. the rump, after being disturbed by my Lord Lambert, was lately returned to sit again. The officers of the army all forced to yield. Lawson lies still in the river, and Monk is with his army in Scotland. Only my Lord Lambert is not yet come into the Parliament, nor is it expected that he will without being forced to it. The new common council of the city do speak very high, and had sent to Monk their sword-bearer, to acquaint him with their desires for a free and full Parliament, which is at present the desires and the hopes and expectation of all. Twenty-two of the old secluded members, having been at the house-door the last week to demand entrance, but it was denied them, and it is believed that neither they nor the people will be satisfied till the house be filled my own private condition very handsome, and esteemed rich, but indeed very poor. Besides my goods of my house and my office, which at present is somewhat uncertain, Mr. Downing, master of my office. January 1st, Lord's Day. This morning, we living lately in the garret, I rose, put on my suit with great skirts, having not lately worn any other clothes but them, went to Mr. Gunning's chapel at Exeter House, where he made a very good sermon upon these words, that in the fullness of time God sent his son made of a woman, etc., showing that by made under the law is meant his circumcision, which is solemnized this day. Dined at home in the garret, where my wife dressed the remains of a turkey, and in the doing of it she burnt her hand. I stayed at home all the afternoon, looking over my accounts, then went with my wife to my father's, and in going observed the great posts which the city have set up at the conduit in Fleet Street. 
supped at my father's where in came mrs theophila turner and madam morris and supped with us after that my wife and i went home with them and so to our own home second in the morning before i went forth old east brought me a dozen of bottles of sack and i gave him a shilling for his pains then i went to mr shepley who was drawing of sack in the wine cellar to send to other places as a gift from my lord and told me that my lord had given him order to give me the dozen of bottles thence i went to the temple to speak with mr calthrop about the sixty pounds due to my lord but missed of him he being abroad then i went to mr crews and borrowed ten pounds of mr andrews for my own use and so went to my office where there was nothing to do then i walked a great while in westminster hall where i heard that lambert was coming up to london that my lord fairfax was in the head of the irish brigade but it was not certain what he would declare for the house was to-day upon finishing the act for the council of state which they did and for the indemnity to the soldiers and were to sit again thereupon in the afternoon great talk that many places have declared for a free parliament and it is believed that they will be forced to fill up the house with the old members from the hall i called at home and so went to mr crews my wife she was to go to her father's thinking to have dined but i came too late so mr moore and i and another gentleman went out and drank a cup of ale together in the new market and there i eat some bread and cheese for my dinner after that mr moore and i went as far as fleet street together and parted he going into the city i to find mr calthrop but failed again of finding him so returned to mr crews again and from thence went along with mrs jemima home and there she told me how to play at cribbage then i went home and finding my wife gone to see mrs hunt i went to wills and there sat with mr ashwell talking and singing till nine o'clock and so home there having not eaten anything but bread and cheese my wife cut me a slice of brawn which i received from my lady which proves as good as ever i had any so to bed and my wife had a very bad night of it through wind and cold third i went out in the morning it being a great frost and walked to mrs turner's to stop her from coming to see me to-day because of mrs jem's coming thence i went to the temple to speak with mr calthrop and walked in his chamber an hour but could not see him so went to westminster where i found soldiers in my office to receive money and paid it them at noon went home where mrs jem her maid mr shepley hawley and moore dined with me on a piece of beef and cabbage and a collar of brawn we then fell to cards till dark and then i went home with mrs jem and meeting mr hawley got him to bear me company to chancery lane where i spoke with mr calthrop he told me that sir james calthrop was lately dead but that he would write to his lady that the money may be speedily paid thence back to whitehall where i understood that the parliament had passed the act for indemnity to the soldiers and officers that would come in in so many days and that my lord lambert should have benefit of the said act they had also voted that all vacancies in the house by the death of any of the old members shall be filled up but those that are living shall not be called in thence i went home and there found mr hunt and his wife and mr hawley who sat with me till ten at night at cards and so broke up and to bed fourth early came mr vanley to me for his half year's rent which i had not in the house but took his man to the office and there paid him then i went down into the hall and to wills where hawley brought a piece of his cheshire cheese and we were merry with it then into the hall again where i met with the clerk and quartermaster of my lord's troop and took them to the swan and gave them their morning's draught they being just come to town mr jenkins shewed me two bills of exchange for money to receive upon my lord's and my pay it snowed hard all this morning and was very cold and my nose was much swelled with cold strange the difference of men's talk some say that lambert must of necessity yield up others that he is very strong and that the fifth monarchy men will stick to him if he declares for a free parliament chillington was sent yesterday to him with a vote of pardon and indemnity from the parliament from the hall i came home where i found letters from hinchinbrook and news of mr chepley's going thither the next week i dined at home and from thence went to wills to shore who promised me to go along with me to atkinson's about some money but i found him at cards with spicer and d vines and could not get him along with me i was vexed at this and went and walked in the hall where i heard that the parliament spent this day in fasting and prayer and in the afternoon came letters from the north that brought certain news that my lord lambert his forces were all forsaking him and that he was left with only fifty horse and that he did now declare for the parliament himself and that my lord fairfax did also rest satisfied and had laid down his arms and that what he had done was only to secure the country against my lord lambert his raising of money and free quarter i went to wills again where i found them still at cards and spicer had won fourteen shillings of shaw and vines 
Then I spent a little time with G. Vines and Maylard at Vines's at our vials. So home, and from thence to Mr. Hunt's, and sat with them and Mr. Hawley at cards, till ten at night, and was much made of by them. Home, and so to bed, but much troubled with my nose, which was much swelled. Fifth. I went to my office, where the money was again expected from the excise office, but none brought, but was promised to be sent this afternoon. I dined with Mr. Shepley at my lord's lodgings, upon his turkey pie, and so to my office again, where the excise money was brought, and some of it told to soldiers till it was dark. Then I went home, and after writing a letter to my lord, and told him the news that the Parliament hath this night voted, that the members that were discharged from sitting in the years 1648 and 49 were duly discharged, and that there should be writs issued presently for the calling of others in their places, and that Monk and Fairfax were commanded up to town, and that the Prince's lodgings were to be provided for Monk at Whitehall. Then my wife and I, it being a great frost, went to Mrs. Jem's, in expectation to eat a sack posset, but Mr. Edward, not coming, it was put off, and so I left my wife playing at cards with her, and went myself with my lantern to Mr. Fage, to consult concerning my nose, who told me it was nothing but cold, and after that we did discourse concerning public business, and he told me it is true the city had not time enough to do much, but they are resolved to shake off the soldiers, and that unless there be a free Parliament chosen, he did believe there half the common council will not levy any money by order of this Parliament. From thence I went to my father's, where I found Mrs. Ramsay and her grandchild, a pretty girl, and stayed a while and talked with them and my mother, and then took my leave, only heard of an invitation to go to dinner to-morrow to my cousin Thomas Pepys. I went back to Mrs. Jem, and took my wife and Mrs. Shepley, and went home. Sixth. This morning Mr. Shepley and I did eat our breakfast at Mrs. Harper's, my brother John being with me, upon a cold turkey pie and a goose. From thence I went to my office, where we paid money to the soldiers till one o'clock, at which time we made an end, and I went home and took my wife and went to my cousin Thomas Pepys, and found them just sat down to dinner, which was very good, only the venison pasty was palpable beef, which was not handsome. After dinner I took my leave, leaving my wife with my cousin Stradwick, and went to Westminster to Mr. Vines, where George and I fiddled a good while, Dick and his wife, who was lately brought to bed, and her sister being there. But Mr. Hudson not coming according to his promise, I went away, and calling at my house on the wench, I took her and the lantern with me to my cousin Stradwick, where after a good supper, there being there my father, mother, brothers, and sister, my cousin Scott, and his wife, Mr. Drawwater, and his wife, and her brother, Mr. Stradwick, we had a brave cake brought us, and in the choosing Paul was queen, and Mr. Stradwick was king. After that my wife and I bid adieu, and came home, it being still a great frost. 7th. At my office, as I was receiving money of the probate of wills, in came Mrs. Turner, Theophila, Madam Morris and Joyce, and after I had done I took them home to my house, and Mr. Hawley came after, and I got a dish of steaks and a rabbit for them, while they were playing a game or two at cards. In the middle of our dinner a messenger from Mr. Downing came to fetch me to him, so leaving Mr. Hawley there, I went and was forced to stay till night in expectation of the French ambassador, who at last came, and I had a great deal of good discourse with one of his gentlemen, concerning the reason of the difference between the zeal of the French and the Spaniard. After he was gone I went home, and found my friends still at cards, and after that I went along with them to Dr. Hawes, sending my wife to Mrs. Jem's to a sack posset, where I heard some symphony and songs of his own making, performed by Mr. May, Harding, and Mallard. Afterwards I put my friends into a coach and went to Mrs. Jem's, where I wrote a letter to my lord by the post, and had my part of the posset which was saved for me, and so we went home and put in at my lord's lodgings, where we stayed late eating of part of his turkey pie, and reading of Quarles's emblems. So home and to bed." Eighth Sunday. In the morning I went to Mr. Gunning's, where a good sermon, wherein he showed the life of Christ, and told us good authority for us to believe that Christ did follow his father's trade, and was a carpenter till thirty years of age. From thence to my father's to dinner, where I found my wife, who was forced to dine there, we not having one coal of fire in the house, and it being very hard frosty weather. In the afternoon my father, he going to a man's to demand some money due to my aunt Bell's, my wife and I went to Mr. Mossum's where a strange doctor made a very good sermon. From then, sending my wife to my father's, I went to Mrs. Turner's and stayed a little while, and then to my father's, where I found Mr. Shepley, and after supper went home together. Here I heard of the death of Mr. Palmer, and that he is to be buried at Westminster to-morrow. Ninth. For these two or three days I have been much troubled with thoughts how to get money to pay them that I have borrowed money of, by reason of my money being in my uncle's hands. I rose early this morning, and looked over and corrected my brother John's speech, which he is to make the next apposition. And after that I went towards my office, 
and in my way met with W. Simons, Muddyman, and Jack Price, and went with them to Harper's, and in many sorts of talk I stayed till two of the clock in the afternoon. I found Muddyman a good scholar, an arch-rogue, and owns that though he writes new books for the Parliament, yet he did declare that he did it only to get money, and did talk very basely of many of them. Among other things, W. Simons told me how his uncle Scoble was on Saturday last called to the bar, for entering in the journal of the house, for the year 1653, these words, This day his Excellence the Lord General Cromwell dissolved this house, which words the Parliament voted a forgery, and demanded of him how they came to be entered. He answered that they were his own handwriting, and that he did it by virtue of his office, and the practice of his predecessor, and that the intent of the practice was to let posterity know how such and such a Parliament was dissolved, whether by the command of the King, or by their own neglect, as the last House of Lords was, and that to this end he had said and writ that it was dissolved by His Excellence the Lord General, and that for the word dissolved he never at the time did hear of any other term, and desired pardon if he would not dare to make a word himself, when it was six years after, before they came themselves to call it an interruption. But they were so little satisfied with this answer, that they did choose a committee to report to the House, whether this crime of Mr. Scoble's did come within the act of indemnity, or no. Thence I went with Muddyman to the coffee-house, and gave eighteen pence to be entered of the club. Thence into the hall, where I heard for certain that Monk was coming to London, and that Bradshaw's two lodgings were preparing for him. Thence to Mrs. Jem's, and found her in bed, and she was afraid that it would prove the smallpox. Thence back to Westminster Hall, where I heard how Sir H. Vane was this day voted out of the house, and to sit no more there, and that he would retire himself to his house at Raby, as also all the rest of the nine officers that had their commissions formally taken away from them, were commanded to their furthest houses from London, during the pleasure of the Parliament. Here I met with the quartermaster of my lord's troop, and his clerk Mr. Jennings, and took them home, and gave them a bottle of wine, and the remainder of my collar of brawn, and so good night. After that came in Mr. Hawley, who told me that I was missed this day at my office, and that to-morrow I must pay all the money that I have, at which I was put to a great loss how I should get money to make up my cash, and so went to bed in great trouble. Tenth went out early, and in my way met with Greatorex, and at an alehouse he showed me the first sphere of wire that ever he made, and indeed it was very pleasant. Thence to Mr. Cruz, and borrowed ten pounds, and so to my office, and was able to pay my money. Thence into the hall, and meeting the quartermaster, Jennings, and Captain Ryder, we four went to a cook's to dinner. Thence Jennings and I into London, it being through heat of the sun a great thaw and dirty, to show our bills of return and coming back drank a pint of wine at the Star in Cheapside. So to Westminster, overtaking Captain Oakshot in his silk cloak, whose sword got hold of many people in walking. Thence to the coffee-house, where were a great confluence of gentlemen, viz. Mr. Harrington, Pulteney, Chairman, Gold, Dr. Petty, etc., where admirable discourse till at night. Thence with doling to Mother Lambs, who told me how this day Scott was made intelligencer, and that the rest of the members that were objected against last night their business was to be heard this day senight. Thence I went home, and wrote a letter, and went to Harper's, and stayed there, till Tom carried it to the post-boy at Whitehall. So home to bed. 11th. Being at Will's with Captain Barker, who hath paid me three hundred pounds this morning at my office, in comes my father, and with him I walked, and leave him at W. Joyce's, and went myself to Mr. Crewe's, but came too late to dine, and therefore after a game at Shuttlecock's, with Mr. Walgrave and Mr. Edward, I returned to my father, and taking him from W. Joyce's, who was not abroad himself, we inquired of a porter, and by his direction went to an alehouse, where after a cup or two we parted. I went towards London, and in my way went in to see Crowley, who was now grown a very great loon, and very tame. Thence to Mr. Stevens, with a pair of silver snuffers, and bought a pair of shears to cut silver, and so homeward again. From home I went to see Mrs. Jem, who was in bed, and now granted to have the smallpox back again, and went to the coffee-house, but tarried not, and so home. Twelfth. I drink my morning at Harper's with Mr. Shepley and a seaman, and so to my office, where Captain Holling came to see me, and appointed a meeting in the afternoon. Then wrote letters to Hinchinbrook, and sealed them at Will's, and after that went home, and thence to the half-moon, where I found the captain and Mr. Billingsley, and Newman, a barber, where we were very merry, and had the young man that plays so well on the Welsh harp. Billingsley paid for all. Thence home, and finding my letters this day not gone by the carrier, I knew sealed them. But my brother Tom, coming, we fell into discourse about my intention to feast the Joyces. I sent for a bit of meat for him from the cook's, and forgot to send my letters this night. 
So I went to bed, and in discourse broke to my wife what my thoughts were, concerning my design of getting money by, etc. 13th. Coming in the morning to my office, I met with Mr. Fage and took him to the Swan. He told me how High Hazelrig and Morley, the last night began at my Lord Mayor's, to exclaim against the City of London, saying that they had forfeited their charter, and how the Chamberlain of the City did take them down, letting them know how much they were formerly beholding to the City, etc. He also told me that Monks's letter that came to them by the sword-bearer was a cunning piece, and that which they did not much trust to, but they were resolved to make no more applications to the Parliament, nor to pay any money, unless the secluded members be brought in, or a free Parliament chosen. Thence to my office, where nothing to do. So to Will's with Mr. Pinkney, who invited me to their feast at his hall the next Monday. Thence I went home and took my wife and dined at Mr. Wade's, and after that we went and visited Caton. From thence home again, and my wife was very unwilling to let me go forth, but with some discontent would go out if I did. And I going forth towards Whitehall, I saw she followed me, and so I stayed and took her round through Whitehall, and so carried her home angry. Thence I went to Mrs. Gemma and found her up and merry, and that it did not prove the smallpox, but only the swinepox. So I played a game or two at cards with her. And so to Mr. Vines, where he and I and Mr. Hudson played half a dozen things, there being there Dick's wife and her sister. After that I went home and found my wife gone abroad to Mr. Hunt's, and came in a little after me. So to bed. Fourteenth. Nothing to do at our office. Thence into the hall, and just as I was going to dinner from Westminster Hall with Mr. Moore, with whom I had been in the lobby to hear news, and had spoke with Sir Anthony Ashley Cooper about my lord's lodgings, to his house. I met with Captain Holland, who told me that he hath brought his wife to my house, so I posted home and got a dish of meat for them. They stayed with me all the afternoon, and went hence in the evening. Then I went with my wife, and left her at market, and went myself to the coffee-house, and heard exceeding good argument against Mr. Harrington's assertion that overbalance of propriety was the foundation of government home, and wrote to Hinchinbrook, and sent that and my other letter that missed of going on Thursday last. So to bed. Fifteenth. Having been exceedingly disturbed in the night with the barking of a dog of one of our neighbours, that I could not sleep for an hour or two, I slept late, and then in the morning took physic, and so stayed within all day. At noon my brother John came to me, and I corrected as well as I could his Greek speech to say the apposition, though I believe he himself was as well able to do it as myself. After that we went to read in the great official about the blessing of bells in the church of Rome. After that my wife and I in pleasant discourse till night, then I went to supper, and after that to make an end of this week's notes in this book, and so to bed. It being a cold day and a great snow, my physic did not work so well as it should have done. Sixteenth. In the morning I went up to Mr. Crewe's, and at his bedside he gave me direction to go to-morrow with Mr. Edward to Twickenham, and likewise did talk to me concerning things of state and expressed his mind how just it was that the secluded members should come to sit again. I went from thence, and in my way went into an alehouse, and drank my morning draught with Matthew Andrews, and two or three more of his friends, coachmen, and of one of them I did hire a coach to carry us to-morrow to Twickenham. From thence to my office, where nothing to do, but Mr. Downing he came, and found me all alone, and did mention to me his going back into Holland, and did ask me whether I would go or no, but gave me little encouragement, but bid me consider of it, and asked me whether I did not think that Mr. Hawley could perform the work of my office alone or no. I confess I was at a great loss all the day after, to bethink myself how to carry this business. At noon Harry Ettall came to me, and went along with Mr. Maylard, by coach, as far as Salisbury Court, and there we set him down, and we went to the clerks, where we came a little too late, but in a closet we had a very good dinner by Mr. Pinkney's courtesy, and after dinner we had pretty good singing, and one, Hazard, sung alone after the old fashion, which was very much cried up, but I did not like it. Thence we went to the Green Dragon on Lambeth Hill, both the Mr. Pinkneys, Smith, Harrison, Morris, that sang the bass, Shepley and I, and there we sang of all sorts of things. And I ventured with good success upon things at first sight, and after that I played on my flageolet, and stayed there till nine o'clock, very merry, and drawn on with one song after another till it came to be so late. After that, Shepley, Harrison, and myself, we went towards Westminster on foot, and at the Golden Lion near Charing Cross we went in and drank a pint of wine, and so parted and thence home, where I found my wife and maid a-washing. I stayed up till the bell-man came by with his bell just under my window, as I was writing off this very line, and cried, "'Past one of the clock, and a cold, frosty, windy morning!' I then went to bed, and left my wife and the maid a-washing still. Seventeenth. 
Earlier I went to Mr. Crews, and having given Mr. Edward money to give the servants, I took him into the coach that waited for us, and carried him to my house, where the coach waited for me while I and the child went to Westminster Hall, and bought him some pictures. In the hall I met Mr. Woodfine, and took him to Will's, and drank with him. Thence the child and I to the coach, where my wife was ready, and so we went towards Twickenham. In our way, at Kensington, we understood how that my Lord Chesterfield had killed another gentleman about half an hour before, and was fled. We went forward, and came about one of the clock to Mr. Fuller's, but he was out of town. So we had a dinner there, and I gave the child forty shillings to give to the two ushers. After that we parted and went homewards, it being market-day at Brainford. I set my wife down and went with the coach to Mr. Crewe's, thinking to have spoke with Mr. Moore and Mrs. Jem. He having told me the reason of his melancholy was some unkindness from her, after so great expressions of love, and how he had spoke to her friends and had their consent, and that he would desire me to take an occasion of speaking with her, but by no means not to heighten her discontent or distaste, whatever it be, but to make it up if I can. But he being out of doors, I went away and went to see Mrs. Jem, who was now very well again, and after a game or two at cards I left her. So I went to the coffee-club and heard very good discourse. It was an answer to Mr. Harrington's answer, who said that the state of the Roman government was not a settled government, and so it was no wonder that the balance of propriety was in one hand, and the command in another, it being therefore always in a posture of war, but it was carried by ballot that it was a steady government, though it is true by the voices it had been carried before, that it was an unsteady government. So to-morrow it is to be proved by the opponents that the balance lay in one hand, and the government in another. Thence I went to Westminster, and met Shaw and Washington, who told me how this day Sydenham was voted out of the House for sitting any more this Parliament, and that Salloway was voted out likewise and sent to the Tower, during the pleasure of the House. Home, and wrote by the post, and carried to Whitehall, and coming back turned in at Harper's, where Jack Price was, and I drank with him, and he told me, among other things, how much the protector is altered, though he would seem to bear out his trouble very well, yet he is scarce able to talk sense with a man, and how he will say that, who should a man trust if he may not trust to a brother and an uncle, and how much those men have to answer before God Almighty, for their playing the knave with him as they did. He told me also that there was a hundred thousand pounds offered, and would have been taken for his restitution, had not the Parliament come in as they did again, and that he do believe that the Protector will live to give a testimony of his valour and revenge yet before he dies, and that the Protector will say so himself sometimes. Thence I went home, it being late, and my wife in bed. 18th. To my office, and from thence to Will's, and there Mr. Shepley brought me letters from the carrier, and so I went home. After that to Wilkinson's, where we had a dinner for Mr. Talbot, Adams, Pinkney, and his son, but his son did not come. Here we were very merry, and while I was here Mr. Fuller came thither, and stayed a little while. After that we all went to my lord's, whither came afterwards Mr. Harrison, and by chance seeing Mr. Butler coming by, I called him in, and so we sat drinking a bottle of wine till night. At which time Mistress Anne came with the key of my lord's study for some things, and so we all broke up, and after I had gone to my house and interpreted my lord's letter by his character, I came to her again and went with her to her lodging, and from thence to Mr. Crewe's, where I advised with him what to do about my lord's lodgings, and what answer to give to Sir Anthony Cooper, and so I came home and to bed. All the world is at a loss to think what Monk will do, the city saying that he will be for them, and the Parliament saying he will be for them. 19th. This morning I was sent for to Mr. Downing, and at his bedside he told me that he had a kindness for me, and that he thought that he had done me one, and that was, that he had got me to be one of the clerks of the council, at which I was a little stumbled, and could not tell what to do, whether to thank him or no, but by and by I did, but not very heartily, for I fear that his doing of it was but only to ease himself of the salary which he gives me. After that Mr. Shepley, staying below all this time for me, we went thence and met Mr. Pierce. So at the Harp and Ball, drank our morning draught, and so to Whitehall, where I met with Sir Anthony Cooper, and did give him some answer from my lord, and he did give us leave to keep the lodging still. And so we did determine thereupon that Mr. Shepley might now go into the country, and would do so to-morrow. Back I went by Mr. Downing's order, and stayed there till twelve o'clock, in expectation of one to come to read some writings, but he came not. So I stayed all alone, reading the answer of the Dutch ambassador to our state, in answer to the reasons of my lord's coming home, which he gave for his coming, and did labour herein to contradict my lord's arguments for his coming home thence to my office, and so with Mr. Shepley and Moore, to dine upon a turkey with Mrs. Jem, and after that Mr. Moore and I went to the French ordinary, 
where mr downing this day feasted sir arthur haselrig and a great many more of the parliament and did stay to put him in mind of me here he gave me a note to go and invite some other members to dinner to-morrow so i went to whitehall and did stay at marshes with simons Llewellyn, and all the rest of the clerks of the council who i hear are all turned out only the two lees and they do all tell me that my name was mentioned the last night but that nothing was done in it hence i went and did leave some of my notes at the lodgings of the members and so home to bed twentieth in the morning i went to mr downing's bedside and gave him an account what i had done as to his guests and i went thence to my lord widrington who i met in the street going to seal the patents for the judges to-day and so could not come to dinner i called upon mr calthrop about the money due to my lord here i met with mr woodfine and drank with him at the sun in chancery lane and so to westminster hall where at the lobby i spoke with the rest of my guests and so to my office at noon went by water with mr maylard and hales to the swan in fish street at our gold feast where we were very merry at our joel of ling and from thence after a great and good dinner mr falkenberg would go drink a cup of ale at a place where i had liked to have shot at a scholar that lay over the house of office thence calling on mr stevens and wotton with whom i drank about business of my lord's i went to the coffee club where there was nothing done but choosing of a committee for orders thence to westminster hall where mrs lane and the rest of the maids had their white scarfs all having been at the burial of a young bookseller in the hall thence to mr shepley's and took him to my house and drank with him in order to his going to-morrow so parted and i sat up late making up my accounts before he go this day three citizens of london went to meet monk from the common council twenty first up early in finishing my accounts and writing to my lord and from thence to my lord's and took leave of mr shepley and possession of all the keys in the house thence to my office for some money to pay mr shepley and sent it him by the old man i then went to mr downing who chid me because i did not give him notice of some of his guests failed him but i told him that i sent up order to tell him and he was not within but he told me that he was within till past twelve o'clock so the porter or he lied thence to my office where nothing to do then with mr hawley he and i went to mr crew's and dined there thence into london to mr vernon's and i received my twenty five pounds due by bill for my trooper's pay then back again to stedman's at the mitre in fleet street in our way calling on mr fage who told me how the city have some hopes of monk thence to the mitre where i drank a pint of wine the house being in fitting for bannister to come hither from paget's thence to mrs jem and gave her five pounds so home and left my money and to whitehall where llewellyn and i drank and talked together an hour at marsh's and so up to the clerk's room where poor mr cook a black man that is like to be put out of his clerk's place came and railed at me for endeavouring to put him out and get myself in when i was already in a good condition but i satisfied him and after i had wrote a letter there to my lord wherein i gave him an account how this day lenthall took his chair again and the house resolved a declaration to be brought in on monday next to satisfy the world what they intend to do so home and to bed twenty second i went in the morning to mr messam's where i met with w thurban and sat with him in his pew a very eloquent sermon about the duty of all to give good example in our lives and conversation which i fear he himself was most guilty of not doing after sermon at the door by appointment my wife met me and so to my father's to dinner where we had not been to my shame in a fortnight before after dinner my father shewed me a letter from mr widrington of christ college in cambridge wherein he do express very great kindness for my brother and my father intends that my brother shall go to him to church in the afternoon to mr herring where a lazy poor sermon and so home with mrs turner and sitting with her a while we went to my father's where we supped very merry and so home this day i began to put on buckles to my shoes which i have bought yesterday of mr wotton twenty third in the morning called out to carry twenty pounds to mr downing which i did and came back and finding mr pierce the surgeon i took him to the axe and gave him his morning draught thence to my office and there did nothing but make up my balance came home and found my wife dressing of the girl's head by which she was made to look very pretty i went out and paid wilkinson what i did owe him and brought a piece of beef home for dinner thence i went out and paid waters the vintner and went to see mrs jem where i found my lady right but scott was so drunk that he could not be seen here i stayed and made up mrs anne's bills and played a game or two at cards 
and thence to Westminster Hall, it being very dark. I paid Mrs. Mitchell my bookseller, and back to Whitehall, and in the garden, going through to the stone gallery, I fell into a ditch, it being very dark. At the clerk's chamber I met with Simons and Llewellyn, and went with them to Mr. Mount's chamber at the cockpit, where we had some rare pot venison, and ale to abundance till almost twelve at night, and after a song round we went home. This day the Parliament sat late, and resolved of the declaration to be printed for the people's satisfaction, promising them a great many good things. 24th. In the morning to my office, where, after I had drank my morning draught at Wills, with Ethel and Mr. Stevens, I went and told part of the excise money till twelve o'clock, and then called on my wife, and took her to Mr. Pierce's, she in the way being exceedingly troubled with a pair of new patterns, and I vexed to go so slow, it being late. There when we came we found Mrs. Carrick very fine, and one Mr. Lucy, who called one another husband and wife, and after dinner a great deal of mad stir. There was pulling off Mrs. Bride's and Mr. Bridegroom's ribbons, with a great deal of fooling among them, that I and my wife did not like. Mr. Lucy and several other gentlemen coming in after dinner, swearing and singing as if they were mad, only he singing very handsomely. There came in afterwards Mr. Southern, clerk to Mr. Blackburn, and with him Lambert, lieutenant of my lord's ship, and brought with them the declaration that came out to-day from the Parliament, wherein they declare for law and gospel, and for tithes, but I do not find people apt to believe them. After this taking leave I went to my father's, and my wife staying there, he and I went to speak with Mr. Crumlin. In the meantime, while it was five o'clock, he being in the school, we went to my cousin Tom Pepys's shop, the turner in Paul's churchyard, and drank with him a pot of ale. He gave my father directions what to do about getting my brother an exhibition, and spoke very well of my brother. Thence back with my father home, where he and I spoke privately in the little room to my sister Paul, about stealing of things as my wife's scissors and my maid's book, at which my father was much troubled. Hence home with my wife, and so to Whitehall, where I met with Mr. Hunt and Llewellyn, and drank with them at Marshes, and afterwards went up and wrote to my lord by the post. This day the Parliament gave order, that the late Committee of Safety should come before them this day sir night, and all their papers, and their model of government that they had made, to be brought in with them. So home, and talked with my wife about our dinner on Thursday. 25th. Called up early to Mr. Downing. He gave me a character, as such a one as my Lord's, to make perfect, and likewise gave me his order for five hundred pounds, to carry to Mr. Frost, which I did, and so to my office, where I did do something about the character till twelve o'clock. Then home, and found my wife and the maid at my lord's, getting things ready against to-morrow. I went by water to my uncle White's to dinner, where I met my father, where we alone had a fine jole of ling to dinner. After dinner I took leave, and coming home, heard that in Cheapside there had been but a little before a gibbet set up, and the picture of Hewson hung upon it in the middle of the street. I called at Paul's churchyard, where I bought Buxtorf's Hebrew grammar, and read a declaration of the gentleman of Northampton, which came out this afternoon. Thence to my father's, where I stayed with my mother a while, and then to Mr. Crewe's, about a picture to be sent into the country, of Mr. Thomas Crewe, to my lord. So to my lady Wright to speak with her, but she was abroad. So Mr. Evans, her butler, had me into his buttery, and gave me sack and a lesson on his lute, which he played very well. Thence I went to my lord's, and got most things ready against to-morrow, as fires and laying the cloth, and my wife was making off her tarts and larding off her pullets till eleven o'clock. This evening Mr. Downing sent for me, and gave me order to go to Mr. Jessop for his papers, concerning his dispatch to Holland, which were not ready, only his order for a ship to transport him he gave me. To my lord's again, and so home with my wife, tired with this day's work. 26th. To my office for twenty pounds to carry to Mr. Downing, which I did, and back again. Then came Mr. Frost to pay Mr. Downing his five hundred pounds, and I went to him for the warrant, and brought it Mr. Frost called for some papers at Whitehall for Mr. Downing, one of which was an order of the council for eighteen hundred pounds per annum, to be paid monthly, and the other two, orders to the commissioners of customs, to let his goods pass free. Home from my office to my lord's lodgings, where my wife had got ready a very fine dinner, viz. a dish of marrow-bones, a leg of mutton, a loin of veal, a dish of fowl, three pullets, and two dozen of larks all in a dish, a great tart, a neat's tongue, a dish of anchovies, a dish of prawns and cheese. My company was my father, my uncle Fenner, his two sons, Mr. Pierce and all their wives, and my brother Tom. We were as merry as I could frame myself to be in the company, 
W. Joyce talking after the old rate, and drinking hard, vexed his father and mother and wife. And I did perceive that Mrs. Pierce her coming so gallant, that it put the two young women quite out of courage. When it became dark, they all went away, but Mr. Pierce and W. Joyce, and their wives and Tom, and drank a bottle of wine afterwards, so that Will did heartily vex his father and mother by staying, at which I and my wife were much pleased. Then they all went, and I fell to writing of two characters for Mr. Downing, and carried them to him at nine o'clock at night, and he did not like them, but corrected them, so that to-morrow I am to do them anew. To my lord's lodging again, and sat by the great log, it being now a very good fire, with my wife, and ate a bit, and so home. The news this day is a letter that speaks absolutely Monk's concurrence with this Parliament, and nothing else, which yet I hardly believe. After dinner to-day my father showed me a letter from my uncle Robert, in answer to my last, concerning my money which I would have out of my cousin Beck's hand, wherein Beck desires it four months longer, which I know not how to spare. 27th. Going to my office I met with Tom Newton, my old comrade, and took him to the crown in the palace, and gave him his morning draught. And as he always did, did talk very high what he would do with the Parliament, that he would have what place he would, and that he might be one of the clerks to the council if he would. Here I stayed talking with him, till the offices were all shut, and then I looked in the hall, and was told by my bookseller, Mrs. Mitchell, that Mr. G. Montague had inquired there for me. So I went to his house, and was forced by him to dine with him, and had a plenteous brave dinner, and the greatest civility that ever I had from any man. Thence home, and so to Mrs. Jem, and played with her at cards, and coming home again my wife told me that Mr. Hawley had been there to speak with me, and seemed angry that I had not been at the office that day, and she told me she was afraid that Mr. Downing may have a mind to pick some hole in my coat. So I made haste to him, but found no such thing from him, but he sent me to Mr. Sherwin's, about getting Mr. Squibb to come to him to-morrow, and I carried him an answer. So home, and fell a-writing the characters for Mr. Downing, and about nine at night Mr. Hawley came, and after he was gone I sat up till almost twelve writing, and wrote two of them. In the morning up early, and wrote another, my wife lying in bed and reading to me. 28. I went to Mr. Downing, and carried him three characters, and then to my office and wrote another, while Mr. Frost stayed telling money. And after I had done it, Mr. Hawley came into the office, and I left him, and carried it to Mr. Downing, who then told me that he was resolved to be gone for Holland this morning. So I to my office again, and dispatched my business there, and came with Mr. Hawley to Mr. Downing's lodging, and took Mr. Squibb from Whitehall in a coach thither with me, and there we waited in his chamber a great while till he came in, and in the meantime sent all his things to the barge that lay at Charing Cross stairs, then came he in, and took a very civil leave of me, beyond my expectation, for I was afraid that he would have told me something of removing me from my office. But he did not, but that he would do me any service that lay in his power. So I went down, and sent a porter to my house for my best fur cap, but he coming too late with it, I did not present it to him. Thence I went to Westminster Hall, and bound up my cap at Mrs. Mitchell's, who was much taken with my cap, and endeavoured to overtake the coach at the exchange, and to give it him there. But I met with one that told me that he was gone. And so I returned, and went to heaven, where Llewellyn and I dined on a breast of mutton all alone, discoursing of the changes that we have seen, and the happiness of them that have estates of their own, and so parted, and I went by appointment to my office, and paid young Mr. Walton five hundred pounds. It being very dark, he took three hundred pounds by content. He gave me half a piece, and carried me in his coach to St. Clement's, from whence I went to Mr. Crewe's, and made even with Mr. Andrews and took in all my notes, and gave him one for all. Then to my lady Wright, and gave her my lord's letter, which he bade me give her privately. So home, and then to Will's, for little news, then came home again, and wrote to my lord, and so to Whitehall, and gave them to the postboy. Back again home, and to bed. Twenty ninth, In the morning I went to Mr. Gunning's, where he made an excellent sermon upon the second of the Galatians, about the difference that fell between St. Paul and St. Peter, the feast day of St. Paul being a day or two ago, whereby he did prove that, contrary to the doctrine of the Roman Church, St. Paul did never own any dependence, or that he was inferior to St. Peter, but that they were equal, only one a particular charge of preaching to the Jews, and the other to the Gentiles. Here I met with Mr. Moore, and went home with him to dinner to Mr. Cruz, where Mr. Spurrier, being in town, did dine with us. From thence I went home, and spent the afternoon in casting up my accounts, and do find myself to be worth forty pounds and more, which I did not think but I am afraid that I have forgot something. To my father's to supper, where I heard by my brother Tom how W. Joyce 
would the other day have Mr. Pierce and his wife to the tavern, after they were gone from my house, and that he had so little manners as to make Tom pay his share, notwithstanding that he went upon his account. And by my father I understand that my uncle Fenner and my aunt were much pleased with our entertaining them. After supper, home, without going to see Mrs. Turner. 30th. This morning, before I was up, I fell a-singing of my song, Great, Good, and Just, etc., and put myself thereby in mind, that this was the fatal day, now ten years since, His Majesty died. Skull the waterman came, and brought me a note from the Hope, from Mr. Hawley, with direction about his money, he tarrying there till his master be gone. To my office, where I received money of the excise of Mr. Rudyer, and after we had done went to Will's, and stayed there till three o'clock, and then, I taking my twelve pounds ten shillings, due to me for my last quarter's salary, I went with them by water to London, to the house where Signor Torriano used to be, and stayed there a while with Mr. Ashwell, Spicer, and Rudyer. Then I went and paid twelve pounds seventeen shillings sixpence, due from me to Captain Dick Matthews, according to his direction the last week in a letter. After that I came back by water, playing on my flagellet, and not finding my wife come home again from her father's, I went and sat a while and played at cards with Mrs. Jem, whose maid had newly got an egg and was ill thereupon. So homewards again, having great need to do my business, and so pretending to meet Mr. Shot the woodmonger of Whitehall, I went and eased myself at the harp and ball, and thence home, where I sat writing till bedtime, and so to bed. There seems now to be a general cease of talk, it being taken for granted that Monk do resolve to stand to the Parliament, and nothing else. Spent a little time this night in knocking up nails for my hat and cloaks in my chamber. 31st. In the morning I fell to my lute till nine o'clock, then to my lord's lodgings, and set out a barrel of soap to be carried to Mrs. Anne. Here I met with Nick Bartlett, one that had been a servant of my lord's at sea, and at Harper's gave him his morning draught. So to my office, where I paid twelve hundred pounds to Mr. Frost, and at noon went to Will's, to give one of the excise office a pot of ale, that came to-day to tell over a bag of his that wanted seven pounds in it, which he found over in another bag. Then home, and dined with my wife, when in came Mr. Hawley, newly come from shipboard from his master, and brought me a letter of direction what to do in his lawsuit with Squib about his house and office. After dinner to Westminster Hall, where all we clerks had orders to wait upon the committee, at the Star Chamber that is to try Colonel Jones, and were to give an account what money we had paid him. But the committee did not sit to-day. Hence to Will's, where I sat an hour or two with Mr. Godfrey Austin, a scrivener in King Street. Here I met, and afterwards brought the answer to General Monk's letter, which is a very good one, and I keep it by me. Thence to Mrs. Jem, where I found her maid in bed in a fit of the ache, and Mrs. Jem among the people below at work, and by and by she came up hot and merry, as if they had given her wine, at which I was troubled, but said nothing. After a game at cards, I went home and wrote by the post, and coming back, called in at Harper's, and drank with Mr. Pulford, servant to Mr. Waterhouse, who tells me that, whereas my Lord Fleetwood should have answered to the Parliament to-day, he wrote a letter and desired a little more time, he being a great way out of time, and how that he is quite ashamed of himself, and confesses how he had deserved this for his baseness to his brother, and that he is like to pay part of the money, paid out of the exchequer during the Committee of Safety, out of his own purse again, which I am glad of. Home and to bed, leaving my wife reading in Polexandra. I could find nothing in Mr. Downing's letter which Hawley brought me concerning my office, but I could discern that Hawley had a mind that I would get to be clerk of the council. I suppose that he might have the greater salary, but I think it not safe yet to change this for a public employment. End of January Chapter 2 of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1660. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1660, by Samuel Pepys. February, 1659, 1660. February 1st. In the morning, went to my office, where afterwards, the old man brought me my letters from the carrier. At noon I went home, and dined with my wife on peas porridge, and nothing else. After that I went to the hall, and there met with Mr. Swan, and went with him to Mr. Downing's counsellor, who did put me in very little hopes about the business between Mr. Downing and Squib, and told me that Squib would carry it against him, at which I was much troubled. 
and with him went to Lincoln's Inn, and there spoke with his attorney, who told me the day that was appointed for the trial. From thence I went to Sir Harry Wright's, and got him to give me his hand for the sixty pounds, which I am to-morrow to receive from Mr. Calthrop, and from thence to Mrs. Jem, and spoke with Madam Scott and her husband, who did promise to have the thing for her neck done this week. Thence home, and took Gamma East, and James the Porter, a soldier, to my Lord's lodgings who told me how they were drawn into the field to-day, and that they were ordered to march away to-morrow, to make room for General Monk. But they did shut their Colonel Fitch, and the rest of the officers, out of the field, and swore they would not go without their money, and if they would not give it them, they would go where they might have it, and that was the city. So the Colonel went to the Parliament, and commanded what money could be got, to be got against to-morrow for them, and all the rest of the soldiers in town, who in all places made a mutiny this day, and do agree together. Here I took some bedding to send to Mrs. Anne, for her to lie in, now she hath her fits of the ague. Thence I went to Will's, and stayed like a fool there, and played at cards till nine o'clock, and so came home, where I found Mr. Hunt and his wife, who stayed, and sat with me till ten o'clock, and so good night. Second. Drank at Harper's with Doling, and so to my office, where I found all the officers of the regiments in town, waiting to receive money, that their soldiers might go out of town, and what was in the exchequer they had. At noon, after dining at home, I called at Harper's for Doling, and he and I met with Llewellyn, and drank with him at the exchequer at Charing Cross, and thence he and I went to the temple, to Mr. Calthrop's chamber, and from thence had his man by water to London Bridge, to Mr. Calthrop, a grocer, and received sixty pounds for my lord. In our way we talked with our waterman, White, who told us how the watermen had lately been abused by some that had a desire to get in to be watermen to the state, and had lately presented an address of nine or ten thousand hands, to stand by this Parliament, when it was only told them that it was to a petition against Hackney Coaches, and that to-day they had put out another, to undeceive the world and to clear themselves, and that among the rest Crop, my waterman, and one of great practice, was one that did cheat them thus. After I had received the money, we went to the bridge tavern, and drank a quart of wine, and so back by water, landing Mr. Calthrop's man at the temple, and we went homewards. But over against Somerset House, hearing the noise of guns, we landed, and found the strand full of soldiers. So I took my money, and went to Mrs. Johnson, my lord's sempstress, and giving her my money to lay up, Doling and I went upstairs to a window, and looked out, and see the foot face the horse, and beat them back, and stood bawling and calling in the street for a free parliament, and money. By and by a drum was heard to beat a march, coming towards them, and they got all ready again, and faced them, and they proved to be of the same mind with them, and so they made a great deal of joy to see one another. After all this I took my money, and went home on foot, and laying up my money, and changing my stockings and shoes, I this day having left off my great skirt suit, and put on my white suit with silver lace coat, and went over to Harper's, where I met with W. Simons, Doling, Llewellyn, and three merchants, one of which had occasion to use a porter. So they sent for one, and James the soldier came, who told us how they had been all day and night upon their guard at St. James's, and that through the whole town they did resolve to stand to what they had began, and that to-morrow he did believe they would go into the city, and be received there. After all this we went to a sport called Selling of a Horse for a Dish of Eggs and Herrings, and sat talking there till almost twelve o'clock, and then parted. They were to go as far as Aldgate, home and to bed. Third. Drank my morning draught at Harper's, and was told there that the soldiers were all quiet upon promise of pay. Thence to St. James's Park, and walked there to my place for my flagellet, and then played a little, it being a most pleasant morning, and sunshine. Back to Whitehall, where in the guard chamber I saw about thirty or forty prentices of the city, who were taken at twelve o'clock last night, and brought prisoners hither. Thence to my office, where I paid a little more money to some of the soldiers, under Lieutenant Colonel Miller, who held out the tower against the Parliament, after it was taken away from Fitch by the Committee of Safety, and yet he continued in his office. About noon Mrs. Turner came to speak with me, and Joyce, and I took them, and shewed them the manner of the houses sitting, the doorkeeper very civilly opening the door for us thence with my cousin Roger Pepys, it being term-time, 
we took him out of the hall to Priors, the Rhenish wine-house, and there had a pint or two of wine and a dish of anchovies, and bespoke three or four dozen bottles of wine for him against his wedding. After this done he went away, and left me order to call and pay for all that Mrs. Turner would have. So we called for nothing more there, but went and bespoke a shoulder of mutton at Wilkinson's, to be roasted as well as it could be done, and sent a bottle of wine home to my house. In the meantime she and I and Joyce went walking all over Whitehall, where the general monk was newly come, and we saw all his forces march by, in very good plight, and stout officers. Thence to my house where we dined, but with a great deal of patience, for the mutton came in raw, and so we were fain to stay the stewing of it. In the meantime we sat studying a posy, for a ring for her which she is to have at Roger Pepys's his wedding. After dinner I left them and went to hear news, but only found that the Parliament House was most of them with Monk at Whitehall, and that in his passing through the town he had many calls to him for a free Parliament, but little other welcome. I saw in the palace yard how unwilling some of the old soldiers were yet to go out of town without their money, and swore if they had it not in three days, as they were promised, they would do them more mischief in the country than if they had stayed here, and that is very likely, the country being all discontented. The town and guards are already full of monks' soldiers. I return, and it growing dark. I and they went to take a turn in the park, where Theophila, who was sent for us to dinner, outran my wife and another poor woman, that laid a pot of ale with me that she would outrun her. After that I set them as far as Charing Cross, and there left them and my wife, and I went to see Mrs. Anne, who began very high about a flock bed I sent her, but I took her down. Here I played at cards till nine o'clock, so home and to bed. Fourth. In the morning at my lute an hour, and so to my office, where I stayed expecting to have Mr. Squibb come to me, but he did not. At noon, walking in the hall, I found Mr. Swan, and got him and Captain Stone together, and there advised about Mr. Downing's business. So to Will's, and sat there till three o'clock, and then to Mr. Swan's, where I found his wife in very genteel mourning for her father, and took him out by water to the counsellor at the temple, Mr. Stevens, and from thence to Gray's Inn, thinking to speak with Southerton Ellis, but found him not. So we met with an acquaintance of his in the walks, and went and drank, where I ate some bread and butter, having ate nothing all day, while they were by chance discoursing of Marriott, the great eater, so that I was, I remember, ashamed to eat what I would have done. Here Swan shewed us a ballad to the tune of Mardyke, which was most incomparably wrote in a printed hand, which I borrowed of him, but the song proved but silly, and so I did not write it out. Thence we went, and leaving Swan at his master's, my lord Widrington, I met with Spicer, Washington, and D. Vines, in Lincoln's Inn Court, and they were buying of a hanging-jack to roast birds on, of a fellow that was there selling of some. I was fain to slip from there, and went to Mrs. Cruz to her, and advised about a maid to come and be with Mrs. Jem, while her maid is sick, but she could spare none. Thence to Sir Harry Wright's, but my lady not being within, I spoke to Mrs. Carter about it, who will get one against Monday. So with a link-boy to Scott's, where Mrs. Anne was in a heat, but I spoke not to her, but told Mrs. Jem what I had done, and after that went home and wrote letters into the country by the post, and then played a while on my lute, and so done, to supper and then to bed. All the news to-day is that the Parliament this morning voted the house to be made up of four hundred forthwith. This day my wife killed her turkeys that Mr. Shepley gave her, that came out of Zealand with my lord, and could not get her maid Jane by no means at any time to kill anything. Fifth, Lord's Day. In the morning before church time, Mr. Hawley, who had for this day or two looked something sadly, which methinks did speak something in his breast concerning me, came to me telling me that he was out twenty-four pounds, which he could not tell what was become of, and that he do remember that he had such a sum in a bag the other day, and could not tell what he did with it, at which I was very sorry, but could not help him. In the morning to Mr. Gunning, where a stranger, an old man, preached a good honest sermon, upon what manner of love is this that we should be called the sons of God. After sermon I could not find my wife, who promised to be at the gate against my coming out, and waited there a great while, then went to my house, and finding her gone, I returned and called at the checkers, thinking to dine at the ordinary with Mr. Chetwin and Mr. Thomas, but they not being there, I went to my father, and found her there, and there I dined. To their church in the afternoon, and in Mrs. Turner's pew, my wife took up a good black hood, and kept it. A stranger preached a poor sermon, and so read over the whole book of the story of Tobit. After sermon, home with Mrs. Turner, stayed with her a little while, then she went into the court to a christening, and we to my father's, 
where I wrote some notes for my brother John, to give to the Mercers to-morrow, it being the day of their apposition. After supper, home, and before going to bed I stayed writing of this day's passages, while a drum came by, beating of a strange manner of beat, now and then a single stroke, which my wife and I wondered at, what the meaning of it should be. This afternoon at church I saw Dick Cumberland newly come out of the country from his living, but did not speak to him. Sixth. Before I went to my office I went to Mr. Crews, and paid Mr. Andrews the same sixty pounds that he had received of Mr. Calthrop the last week. So back to Westminster, and walked with him thither, where we found the soldiers all set in the palace yard, to make way for General Monk to come to the house. At the hall we parted, a meeting swan, he and I to the swan, and drank our morning draught. So back again to the hall, where I stood upon the steps, and saw Monk go by, he making observance to the judges as he went along. At noon my father dined with me upon my turkey, that was brought from Denmark, and after dinner he and I to the Bullhead Tavern, where we drank half a pint of wine, and so parted. I to Mrs. Anne, and Mrs. Jem being gone out of the chamber, she and I had a very high bout. I rattled her up, she being in her bed, but she becoming more cool, we parted pretty good friends. Thence I went to Will's, where I stayed at cards till ten o'clock, losing half a crown, and so home to bed. 7th. In the morning I went early to give Mr. Hawley notice of my being forced to go into London. But he having also business, we left our office business to Mr. Spicer, and he and I walked as far as the temple, where I halted a little, and then went to Paul's school. But it being too soon, went and drank my morning draught with my cousin Tom Pepys, the turner, and saw his house and shop, thence to school, where he that made the speech for the seventh form in praise of the founder, did show a book which Mr. Crumlin had lately got, which is believed to be of the founder's own writing. After all the speeches, in which my brother John came off as well as any of the rest, I went straight home and dined, then to the hall, where in the palace I saw monk soldiers abuse Billing and all the Quakers, that were at a meeting-place there, and indeed the soldiers did use them very roughly, and were to blame. So after drinking with Mr. Spicer, who had received six hundred pounds for me this morning, I went to Captain Stone, and with him by coach to the Temple Gardens, all the way talking of the disease of the stone, where we met Mr. Squibb, but would do nothing till to-morrow morning. Thence back on foot home, where I found a letter from my lord in character, which I construed, and after my wife had shewn me some ribbon and shoes, that she had taken out of a box of Mr. Montague's, which formerly Mr. Kipps had left here, when his master was at sea, I went to Mr. Crew and advised with him about it, it being concerning my lord's coming up to town, which he desires upon my advice the last week in my letter. Thence calling upon Mrs. Anne, I went home, and wrote in character to my lord in answer to his letter. This day Mr. Crew told me that my lord St. John is for a free Parliament, and that he is very great with Monk, who hath now the absolute command and power, to do anything that he hath a mind to do. Mr. Moore told me of a picture hung up at the exchange, of a great pair of buttocks, shooting of a turd into Lawson's mouth, and over it was wrote, The thanks of the house. Boys do now cry, Kiss my Parliament, instead of kiss my rump, so great and general a contempt is the rump come to, among all the good and bad. Eighth. A little practice on my flagellate, and afterwards walking in my yard, to see my stock of pigeons, which begin now with the spring to breed very fast. I was called on by Mr. Fosson, my fellow-pupil at Cambridge, and I took him to the swan in the palace yard, and drank together our morning draught. Thence to my office, where I received money, and afterwards Mr. Carter, my old friend at Cambridge, meeting me as I was going out of my office, I took him to the swan, and in the way I met with Captain Lidcote, and so we three went together and drank there, the captain talking as high as ever he did, and more because of the fall of his brother Thurlow. Hence I went to Captain Stone, who told me how Squibb had been with him, and that he could do nothing with him, so I returned to Mr. Carter and with him to Will's, where I spent upon him and Monsieur Lampertinon, alias Mr. Butler, who I took thither with me, and thence to a Rhenish wine-house and in our way met with Mr. Hool, where I paid for my cousin Roger Pepys his wine, and after drinking we parted. So I home, in my way delivering a letter which among the rest I had from my lord to-day, to Sir N. Wheeler. At home my wife's brother brought her a pretty black dog, which I liked very well, and went away again. Hence, sending a porter with a hamper of bottles to the temple, I called in my way upon Mrs. Jem, who was much frighted, till I came to tell her that her mother was well. So to the temple, where I delivered the wine, and received the money of my cousin Roger that I laid out, 
and thence to my father's, where he shewed me a base angry letter that he had newly received from my uncle Robert, about my brother John, at which my father was very sad, but I comforted him, and wrote an answer. My brother John has an exhibition granted him from the school. My father and I went down to his kitchen, and there we eat and drank, and about nine o'clock I went away homewards, and in Fleet Street received a great jostle from a man that had a mind to take the wall, which I could not help. I came home and to bed, went to bed with my head not well by my too much drinking to-day, and I had a boil under my chin, which troubled me cruelly. Ninth. Soon as out of my bed I wrote letters into the country to go by carrier to-day. Before I was out of my bed I heard the soldiers very busy in the morning, getting their horses ready, where they lay at Hilton's, but I knew not then their meaning in so doing. After I had wrote my letters, I went to Westminster up and down the hall, and with Mr. Swan walked a good deal talking about Mr. Downing's business. I went with him to Mr. Phelps's house, where he had some business to solicit, where we met Mr. Rogers, my neighbour, who did solicit against him, and talked very high, saying that he would not for a thousand pounds appear in a business that Swan did, at which Swan was very angry. But I believe he might be guilty enough. In the hall I understand how Monk is this morning gone into London with his army, and met with Mr. Fage, who told me that he do believe that Monk is gone, to secure some of the common council of the city, who were very high yesterday there, and did vote that they would not pay any taxes, till the house was filled up. I went to my office, where I wrote to my lord after I had been at the upper bench, where Sir Robert Pye this morning came, to desire his discharge from the tower, but it could not be granted. After that I went to Mrs. Jem, who I had promised to go along with to her aunt Wright's, but she was gone, so I went thither, and after drinking a glass of sack, I went back to Westminster Hall, and meeting with Mr. Pierce the surgeon, who would needs take me home, where Mr. Lucy, Burrell, and others dined, and after dinner I went home, and to Westminster Hall, where meeting Swan, I went with him by water to the temple to our council, and did give him a fee to make a motion to-morrow in the exchequer for Mr. Downing, thence to Westminster Hall, where I heard an action very finely pleaded between my Lord Dorset and some other noble persons, his lady and other ladies of quality being here, and it was about three hundred and thirty pounds per annum, that was to be paid to a poor spittle, which was given by some of his predecessors, and given on his side. Thence Swan and I to a drinking-house near Temple Bar, where while he wrote I played on my flagellate, till a dish of poached eggs was got ready for us, which we eat, and so by coach home. I called at Mr. Harper's, who told me how Monk had this day clapped up many of the common council, and that the Parliament had voted that he should pull down their gates and portcullises, their posts and their chains, which he do intend to do, and do lie in the city all night. I went home, and got some alum to my mouth, where I have the beginnings of a cancer, and had also a plaster to my boil underneath my chin. 10th. In the morning I went to Mr. Swan, who took me to the court of wards, where I saw the three Lords Commissioners sitting upon some cause where Mr. Scoble was concerned, and my Lord Fountain took him up very roughly, about some things that he said. After that we went to the Exchequer, where the barons were hearing of causes, and there I made affidavit that Mr. Downing was gone into Holland by order of the Council of State, and this affidavit I gave to Mr. Stevens, our lawyer. Thence to my office, where I got money of Mr. Hawley to pay the lawyer, and there found Mr. Leonard, one of the clerks of the Council, and took him to the Swan and gave him his morning draught, then home to dinner, and after that to the Exchequer, where I heard all the afternoon a great many causes before the barons. In the end came ours, and Scribb proved clearly by his patent, that the house and office did now belong to him. Our lawyer made some kind of opposition, but to no purpose, and so the cause was found against us, and the foreman of the jury brought in ten pounds damages, which the whole court cried shame of, and so he cried twelve pence. Thence I went home, vexed about this business, and there I found Mr. Moore, and with him went into London, to Mr. Fage, about the cancer in my mouth, which begins to grow dangerous, who gave me something for it, and also told me what Monk had done in the city, how he had pulled down the most part of the gates and chains, that they could break down, and that he was now gone back to Whitehall. The city looked mighty blank, and cannot tell what in the world to do, the Parliament having this day ordered that the Common Council sit no more, but that new ones be chosen, according to what qualifications they shall give them. Thence I went and drank with Mr. Moore at the Sugar Loaf by Temple Bar, where Swan and I were last night, and so we parted. At home I found Mr. Hunt, who sat talking with me a while, and so to bed. 11th. 
This morning I lay long abed, and then to my office, where I read all the morning my Spanish book of Rome. At noon I walked in the hall, where I heard the news of a letter from Monk, who was now gone into the city again, and did resolve to stand for the sudden filling up of the house. And it was very strange how the countenance of men in the hall was all changed with joy in half an hour's time. So I went up to the lobby, where I saw the speaker reading of the letter, and after it was read, Sir A. Hazelrig came out very angry, and Billing, standing at the door, took him by the arm, and cried, "'Thou man, will thy beast carry thee no longer? Thou must fall!' The house presently after rose, and appointed to meet again at three o'clock. I went then down into the hall, where I met with Mr. Chetwin, who had not dined no more than myself, and so we went toward London, in our way calling at two or three shops, but could have no dinner. At last, within Temple Bar, we found a pullet ready roasted, and there we dined. After that he went to his office in Chancery Lane, calling at the rolls, where I saw the lawyers pleading, then to his office, where I sat in his study singing, while he was with his man, Mr. Powell's son, looking after his business. Thence we took coach for the city to Guildhall, where the hall was full of people expecting Monk and Lord Mayor to come thither, and all very joyful. Here we stayed a great while, and at last meeting with a friend of his, we went to the three-ton tavern, and drank half a pint of wine, and not liking the wine we went to an alehouse, where we met with company of this third man's acquaintance, and there we drank a little. Hence I went alone to Guildhall to see whether Monk was come again or no, and met with him coming out of the chamber, where he had been with the mayor and alderman, but such a shout I never heard in all my life, crying out, God bless your excellence! Here I met with Mr. Locke, and took him to an alehouse, and left him there to fetch Chetwin. When we were come together, Locke told us the substance of the letter that went from Monk to the Parliament, wherein, after complaints that he and his officers were put upon such officers against the city, as they could not do with any content or honour, that there are many members now in the house that were of the late tyrannical committee of safety, that Lambert and Vane are now in town, contrary to the vote of Parliament, that there were many in the house that do press for new oaths to be put upon men, whereas we have more cause to be sorry for the many oaths that we have already taken and broken, that the late petition of the fanatic people presented by Barebone, for the imposing of an oath upon all sorts of people, was received by the house with thanks, that therefore he do desire that all writs for filling up of the house be issued by Friday next, and that, in the meantime, he would retire into the city, and only leave them guards for the security of the house and council. The occasion of this was the order that he had last night to go into the city and disarm them, and take away their charter, whereby he and his officers say, that the house had a mind to put them upon things that should make them odious, and so it would be in their power to do what they would with them. He told us that they had sent Scott and Robinson to him this afternoon, but he would not hear them, and that the mayor and aldermen had offered him their own houses for himself and his officers, and that his soldiers would lack for nothing. And indeed I saw many people give the soldiers drink and money, and all along in the streets cried, God bless them, and extraordinary good words. Hence we went to a merchant's house hard by, where Locke wrote a note and left, where I saw Sir Nicholas Crisp, and so we went to the Star Tavern, Monk being then at Benson's, where we dined, and I wrote a letter to my lord from thence. In Cheapside there was a great many bonfires, and bow bells, and all the bells in all the churches as we went home, were ringing. Hence we went homewards, it being about ten o'clock. But the common joy that was everywhere to be seen, the number of bonfires, there being fourteen between St. Dunstan's and Temple Bar, and at Strand Bridge I could at one view tell thirty-one fires, in King Street seven or eight, and all along burning and roasting and drinking for rumps, there being rumps tied upon sticks and carried up and down. The butchers at the Maypole in the Strand rang a peal with their knives, when they were going to sacrifice their rump. On Ludgate Hill there was one turning of the spit that had a rump tied upon it, and another basting of it. Indeed it was past imagination, both the greatness and the suddenness of it. At one end of the street you would think there was a whole lane of fire, and so hot that we were fain to keep still on the further side merely for heat. We came to the trekkers at Charing Cross, where Chetwin wrote a letter, and I gave him an account of what I had wrote for him to write. Thence home and sent my letters to the post-house in London, and my wife and I, after Mr. Hunt was gone, whom I found waiting at my house, went out again to show her the fires, and after walking as far as the exchange, we returned and to bed. Twelfth. In the morning, it being Lord's Day, Mr. Pierce came to me to inquire how things go. We drank our morning draught together, and thence to Whitehall, where Dr. Holmes preached, 
but I stayed not to hear. But walking in the court I heard that Sir Arthur Hazelrig was newly gone into the city to Monk, and that Monk's wife removed from Whitehall last night. Home again, where at noon came according to my invitation my cousin Thomas Pepys and his partner, and dined with me. But before dinner we went and took a walk round the park, it being a most pleasant day as ever I saw. After dinner we three went into London together, where I heard that Monk had been at Paul's in the morning, and the people had shouted much at his coming out of the church. In the afternoon he was at a church in Broad Street, where about he do lodge. But not knowing how to see him, we went and walked half an hour in Moorfields, which were full of people, it being so fine a day. Here I took leave of them, and so to Paul's, where I met with Mr. Curtin's apprentice, the crooked fellow, and walked up and down with him two hours, sometimes in the street, looking for a tavern to drink in. But not finding any open, we durst not knock. Other times in the churchyard, where one told me that he had seen the letter printed. Thence to Mr. Turner's, where I found my wife, Mr. Edward Pepys, and Roger and Mr. Armiger being there, to whom I gave as good an account of things as I could. And so to my father's, where Charles Glasscock was overjoyed to see how things are now, who told me the boys had last night broke bare bones windows. Hence home, and being near home we missed our maid, and were at a great loss, and went back a great way to find her. But when we could not see her, we went homewards, and found her there, got before us, which we wondered at greatly. So to bed, where my wife and I had some high words upon my telling her that I would fling the dog which her brother gave her out of window, if he dirted the house any more. Thirteenth. To my office till noon, thence home to dinner, my mouth being very bad of the cancer, and my left leg beginning to be sore again. After dinner to see Mrs. Jem, and in the way met with Caton on foot in the street, and talked with her a little, so home and took my wife to my father's. In my way I went to Playford's, and for two books that I had, and six shillings sixpence to boot, I had my great book of songs, which he sells always, for four shillings. At my father's I stayed a while, while my mother sent her maid best to Cheapside, for some herbs to make a water for my mouth. Then I went to see Mr. Cumberland, and after a little stay with him I returned, and took my wife home, where after supper to bed. This day Monk was invited to Whitehall to dinner by my lords. Not seeming willing, he would not come. I went to Mr. Fage from my father's, who had been this afternoon with Monk, who do promise to live and die with the city, and for the honour of the city. And indeed the city is very open-handed to the soldiers, that they are most of them drunk all day, and have money given them. He did give me something for my mouth, which I did use this night. Fourteenth. Called out in the morning by Mr. Moore, whose voice my wife, hearing in my dressing-chamber with me, got herself ready, and came down and challenged him for her valentine, this being the day. To Westminster Hall, there being many new remonstrances and declarations from many counties to Monk and the city, and one coming from the north from Sir Thomas Fairfax. Hence I took him to the Swan, and gave him his morning draught. So to my office, where Mr. Hill of Worcestershire came to see me and my partner in our office, with whom we went to Wills to drink. At noon I went home, and so to Mr. Crewe's, but they had dined, and so I went to see Mrs. Jem, where I stayed a while, and home again, where I stayed an hour or two at my lute, and so forth to Westminster Hall, where I heard that the Parliament hath now changed the oath so much talked of to a promise, and that among other qualifications for the members that are to be chosen, one is, that no man, nor the son of any man that hath been in arms during the life of the father, shall be capable of being chosen to sit in Parliament. To Wills, where like a fool I stayed and lost sixpence at cards, so home and wrote a letter to my lord by the post. So after supper to bed. This day, by an order of the house, Sir H. Vane was sent out of town to his house in Lincolnshire. Fifteenth. Called up in the morning by Captain Holland and Captain Cuttons, and with them to Harpers, thence to my office, thence with Mr. Hill of Worcestershire to Wills, where I gave him a letter to Nan Pepys, and some merry pamphlets against the rump, to carry to her into the country. So to Mr. Crewe's, where the dining-room being full, Mr. Walgrave and I dined below in the buttery, by ourselves, upon a good dish of buttered salmon. Thence to Herring the Merchant, about my lord's Worcester money, and back to Paul's churchyard, where I stayed reading in fullest history of the Church of England, an hour or two, and so to my father's, where Mr. Hill came to me, and I gave him direction what to do at Worcester about the money. Thence to my lady Wright's, and gave her a letter from my lord privily. So to Mrs. Jem, and sat with her, who dined at Mr. Crewe's to-day, and told me that there was at her coming away at least forty gentlemen, I suppose members that were secluded, for Mr. Wargrave told me that there were about thirty met there the last night, came dropping in one after another thither. 
Thence home and wrote into the country against to-morrow, by the carrier, and so to bed. At my father's I heard how my cousin Kate Joyce had a fall yesterday from her horse, and had some hurt thereby. No news to-day, but all quiet, to see what the Parliament will do, about the issuing of the writs to-morrow for filling up of the house, according to Monk's desire. 16th. In the morning at my lute. Then came Shaw and Hawley, and I gave them their morning draught at my house. So to my office, where I wrote by the carrier to my lord, and sealed my letter at Wells, and gave it old East to carry it to the carriers, and to take up a box of china oranges, and two little barrels of scallops at my house, which Captain Cutton sent to me for my lord. Here I met with Osborne, and with Shaw and Spicer, and we went to the Sun Tavern, in expectation of a dinner, where we had sent us only two trenches full of meat, at which we were very merry, while in came Mr. Wade and his friend Captain Moyes, who told us of his hopes to get an estate merely for his namesake. And here we stayed till seven at night, I winning a quart of sack of shore, that one trencherful that was sent us was all lamb, and he that it was veal. I, by having but threepence in my pocket, made shift to spend no more, whereas if I had had more, I had spent more as the rest did, so that I see it is an advantage to a man to carry little in his pocket. Home, and after supper, and a little at my flute, I went to bed. 17th. In the morning, Tom that was my lord's footboy came to see me, and had ten shillings of me of the money which I have to keep of his, so that now I have but thirty-five shillings more of his. Then came Mr. Hills, the instrument-maker, and I consulted with him about the altering my lute and my viol. After that I went into my study and did up my accounts, and found that I am about forty pounds beforehand in the world, and that is all. So to my office, and from thence brought Mr. Hawley home with me to dinner and after dinner wrote a letter to Mr. Downing about his business, and gave it Hawley, and so went to Mr. Gunning's to his weekly fast. And after sermon, meeting there with Monsieur Lampertinon, we went and walked in the park, till it was dark. I played on my pipe at the Echo, and then drank a cup of ale at Jacob's. So to Westminster Hall, and he with me, where I heard that some of the members of the house were gone to meet with some of the secluded members, and General Monk, in the city. Hence we went to Whitehall, thinking to hear more news, where I met with Mr. Hunt, who told me how Monk had sent for all his goods that he had here into the city, and yet again he told me, that some of the members of the house had this day laid in firing into their lodgings at Whitehall for a good while, so that we are at a great stand to think what will become of things, whether Monk will stand to the Parliament or no. Hence Monsieur Lampertinant and I to Harper's, and there drank a cup or two to the King, and to his fair sister Frances, in good health, of whom we had much discourse, of her not being much the worse for the smallpox, which he had this last summer. So home and to bed. This day we are invited to my uncle Fenner's wedding feast, but went not, this being the twenty-seventh year. Eighteenth. A great while at my violin voice, learning to sing Flyboy, Flyboy, without book. So to my office, where little to do. In the hall I met with Mr. Eglin, and one Looker, a famous gardener, servant to my Lord Salisbury. And among other things the gardener told a strange passage in good earnest. Home to dinner, and then went to my lord's lodgings, to my turret there, and took away most of my books, and sent them home by my maid. Thither came Captain Holland to me, who took me to the Half Moon Tavern, and Mr. Southern, Blackburn's clerk. Thence he took me to the Mitre in Fleet Street, where we heard, in a room over the music-room, very plainly through the ceiling. Here we parted, and I to Mr. Watton's, and with him to an alehouse, and drank, while he told me a great many stories of comedies that he had formerly seen acted, and the names of the principal actors, and gave me a very good account of it. Thence to Whitehall, where I met with Llewellyn, and in the clerk's chamber wrote a letter to my lord, so home and to bed. This day two soldiers were hanged in the strand, for their late mutiny at Somerset House. 19th. Lord's Day. Early in the morning I set my books that I brought home yesterday up in order in my study. Thenceforth to Mr. Harps to drink a draught of pearl, whither by appointment Monsieur Lampertinot, who did intend too upon my desire to go along with me to St. Bartholomew's, to hear one Mr. Sparks. But it raining very hard, we went to Mr. Gunning's, and heard an excellent sermon, and speaking of the character that the Scripture gives of Anne, the mother of the Blessed Virgin, he did there speak largely in commendation of widowhood, and not as we do to marry two or three wives or husbands, one after another. Here I met with Mr. Moore, and went home with him to dinner, where he told me the discourse that happened between the secluded members and the members of the house, before Monk last Friday. How the secluded said, that they did not intend by coming in to express revenge upon these men, but only to meet and dissolve themselves, and only to issue writs for a free Parliament. 
He told me how Hazelrig was afraid to have the candle carried before him, for fear that the people seeing him would do him hurt, and that he is afraid to appear in the city. That there is great likelihood that the secluded members will come in. And so Mr. Crewe and my lord are likely to be great men, at which I was very glad. After dinner there was many secluded members come in to Mr. Crewe, which, it being the Lord's day, did make Mr. Moore believe that there was something extraordinary in the business. Hence home and brought my wife to Mr. Mossum's to hear him, and indeed he made a very good sermon, but only too eloquent for a pulpit. Here Mr. Lampertinod helped me to a seat. After sermon to my father's and fell in discourse concerning our going to Cambridge the next week with my brother John. To Mrs. Turner, where her brother, Mr. Edward Pepys, was there, and I sat a great while talking of public business of the times with him. So to supper to my father's, all supper talking of John's going to Cambridge. So home, and it raining, my wife got my mother's French mantle and my brother John's hat, and so we went all along home and to bed. Twentieth. In the morning at my lute, then to my office, where my partner and I made even our balance. Took him home to dinner with me, where my brother John came to dine with me. After dinner I took him to my study at home, and at my lord's, and gave him some books and other things against his going to Cambridge. After he was gone I went forth to Westminster Hall, where I met with Chetwin, Simons, and Gregory, and with them to Marshes at Whitehall to drink, and stayed there a pretty while reading a pamphlet well writ and directed to General Monk, in praise of the form of monarchy which was settled here before the wars. They told me how the Speaker learnt all to refuse to sign the writs for choice of new members in the place of the excluded, and by that means the writs could not go out to-day. In the evening Simons and I to the coffee-club, where nothing to do, only I heard Mr. Harrington, and my lord of Dorset, and another lord, talking of getting another place as the cockpit, and they did believe it would come to something. After a small debate upon the question whether learned or unlearned subjects are the best, the club broke up very poorly, and I do not think they will meet any more. Hence with vines, etc., to Will's, and after a pot or two home, and so to bed. 21st. In the morning going out I saw many soldiers going towards Westminster, and was told that they were going to admit the secluded members again. So I to Westminster Hall, and in Chancery Row, I saw about twenty of them who had been at Whitehall with General Monk, who came thither this morning, and made a speech to them, and recommended to them a commonwealth, and against Charles Stuart. They came to the house, and went in one after another, and at last the Speaker came. But it is very strange that this could be carried so private, that the other members of the house heard nothing of all this, till they found them in the house, insomuch that the soldiers that stood there to let in the secluded members, they took for such as they had ordered to stand there to hinder their coming in. Mr. Prynne came with an old basket-hilt sword on, and had a great many great shouts upon his going into the hall. They sat till noon, and at their coming out Mr. Crewe saw me, and bid me come to his house, which I did, and he would have me dine with him, which I did, and he very joyful told me that the house had made General Monk, general of all the forces in England, Scotland, and Ireland, and that upon Monk's desire, for the service that Lawson had lately done in pulling down the Committee of Safety, he had the command of the sea for the time being. He advised me to send for my lord forthwith, and told me that there is no question that, if he will, he may now be employed again, and that the House do intend to do nothing more than to issue writs, and to settle a foundation for a free Parliament. After dinner I back to Westminster Hall with him in his coach. Here I met with Mr. Locke and Purcell, masters of music, and with them to the coffee-house, in a room next the water, by ourselves, where we spent an hour or two till Captain Taylor came to us, who told us that the house had voted the gates of the city to be made up again, and the members of the city that are in prison to be set at liberty, and that Sir G. Booth's case be brought into the house to-morrow. Here we had variety of brave Italian and Spanish songs, and a cannon for eight voices, which Mr. Locke had lately made on these words, Domine Salvum Fac Regum an admirable thing. Here also Captain Taylor began a discourse of something that he had lately writ about Gablekind, in answer to one that had wrote a piece upon the same subject, and indeed discovered a great deal of study in antiquity in his discourse. Here out of the window it was a most pleasant sight to see the city from one end to the other, with a glory about it, so high was the light of the bonfires, and so thick round the city, and the bells rang everywhere. Hence home and wrote to my lord, afterwards came down and found Mr. Hunt, troubled at this change, and Mr. Spong, who stayed late with me, singing of a song or two, and so parted. My wife not very well, went to bed before. This morning I met in the hall with Mr. Fuller, of Christ, and told him of my design to go to Cambridge and whither. He told me very freely the temper of Mr. Widrington, how he did oppose all the fellows in the college, and that there was a great distance between him and the rest, 
at which I was very sorry, for that he told me he feared it would be little to my brother's advantage to be his pupil. 22nd. In the morning intended to have gone to Mr. Crewe's to borrow some money, but it raining I forbore, and went to my lord's lodging, and looked that all things were well there. Then home and sang a song to my viol, so to my office and to Will's, where Mr. Pierce found me out, and told me that he would go with me to Cambridge, where Colonel Eyre's regiment, to which he was surgeon, lieth. Walking in the hall I saw Major General Brown, who had a long time been banished by the rump, but now with his beard overgrown he comes abroad and sat in the house. To my father's to dinner were nothing but a small dish of powdered beef, and dish of carrots, they being all busy to get things ready for my brother John to go to-morrow. After dinner my wife staying there, I went to Mr. Crewe's and got five pounds of Mr. Andrews, and so to Mrs. Jemima, who now hath her instrument about her neck, and indeed is infinitely altered, and holds her head upright. I paid her maid forty shillings, of the money that I have received of Mr. Andrews. Hence home to my study, where I only wrote thus much of this day's passage, to this, and so out again. To Whitehall, where I met with Will Simons, and Mr. Mabbott at Marshes, who told me how the house had this day voted, that the gates of the city should be set up at the cost of the state, and that Major General Brown's being proclaimed a traitor be made void, and several other things of that nature. Home for my lantern, and so to my father's, where I directed John what books to be put for Cambridge. After that to supper, where my uncle Fenner and my aunt, Theophilo Turner, and Joyce, at a brave leg of veal roasted, and were very merry against John's going to Cambridge. I observed this day how abominably Barebone's windows are broke again last night. At past nine o'clock my wife and I went home. Twenty-third, Thursday. My birthday, now twenty-seven years. A pretty fair morning. I rose, and after writing a while in my study I went forth. To my office, where I told Mr. Hawley of my thoughts to go out of town to-morrow. Hither Mr. Fuller comes to me, and my uncle Thomas too. Thence I took them to drink, and so put off my uncle. So with Mr. Fuller home to my house, where he dined with me, and he told my wife and me a great many stories of his adversities since these troubles, in being forced to travel in the Catholic countries, etc. He shewed me his bills, but I had not money to pay him. We parted, and I to Whitehall, where I was to see my horse which Mr. Garthwaite lends me to-morrow. So home, where Mr. Pierce comes to me about appointing time and place where and when to meet to-morrow. So to Westminster Hall, where, after the house rose, I met with Mr. Crewe, who told me that my lord was chosen, by seventy-three voices, to be one of the Council of State. Mr. Pierpoint had the most, a hundred and one, and himself the next, too. He brought me in the coach home, here Mr. Onslow being in it. I back to the hall, and at Mrs. Mitchell's shop stayed talking a great while with her and my chaplain, Mr. Mumford, and drank a pot or two of ale on a wager that Mr. Prynne is not of the council. Home and wrote to my lord the news of the choice of the council by the post, and so to bed. 24th. I rose very early, and taking horse at Scotland Yard, at Mr. Garthwaite's stable, I rode to Mr. Pierce's, who rose, and in a quarter of an hour, leaving his wife in bed, with whom Mr. Lucy Methought was very free as she lay in bed, we both mounted, and so set forth about seven of the clock, the day and the way very foul. About where we overtook Mr. Blayton, brother-in-law to Dick Bynes, who went thenceforwards with us, and at Puckridge we baited, where we had a loin of mutton fried, and were very merry, but the way exceeding bad from where thither. Then up again, and as far as Fulmer, within six miles of Cambridge, my mare being almost tired. Here we lay at the checker, playing at cards till supper, which was a breast of veal roasted. I lay with Mr. Pierce, who we left here the next morning, upon his going to Hinchingbrook, to speak with my lord before his going to London, and we two come to Cambridge by eight o'clock in the morning, twenty-fifth, to the Falcon in the Petit Curie, where we found my father and brother very well. After dressing myself about ten o'clock, my father, brother, and I to Mr. Widrington at Christ College, who received us very civilly, and caused my brother to be admitted, while my father, he, and I sat talking. After that done, we take leave. My father and brother went to visit some friends, Pepys, scholars in Cambridge, while I went to Magdalen College to Mr. Hill, with whom I found Mr. Zanke, Burton, and Hollins, and was exceeding civilly received by them. I took leave and promised to sup with them, and to my inn again, where I dined with some others that were there at an ordinary. After dinner my brother to the college, and my father and I to my cousin Angius to see them, where Mr. Fairbrother came to us. Here we sat a while talking. My father he went to look after his things at the carrier's, and my brother's chamber, while Mr. Fairbrother, my cousin Andrea, and Mr. Zanke, whom I met at Mr. Merton's shop, where I bought Elenchus Motum, having given my former to Mr. Downing when he was here, to the three tons, 
where we drank pretty hard and many healths to the king, etc., till it began to be darkish. Then we broke up, and I and Mr. Zanke went to Magdalen College, where a very handsome supper at Mr. Hill's chambers, I suppose upon a club among them, where in their discourse I could find that there was nothing at all left of the old preciseness in their discourse, especially on Saturday nights. And Mr. Zanke told me that there was no such thing nowadays among them at any time. After supper and some discourse then, to my inn, where I found my father in his chamber, and after some discourse, and he well satisfied with this day's work, we went to bed, my brother lying with me, his things not being come by the carrier that he could not lie in the college. 26th Sunday. My brother went to the college to chapel. My father and I went out in the morning, and walked out in the fields behind King's College, and in King's College Chapel Yard, where we met with Mr. Fairbrother, who took us to Botolph's Church, where we heard Mr. Nicholas of Queen's College, who I knew in my time to be Tripos, with great applause upon this text, For thy commandments are broad. Thence my father and I to Mr. Woodrington's chamber to dinner, where he used us very courteously again, and had two fellow commoners at table with him, and Mr. Pepper, a fellow of the college. After dinner, while we sat talking by the fire, Mr. Pierce's man came to tell me that his master was come to town. So my father and I took leave, and found Mr. Pierce at our inn, who told us that he had lost his journey, for my lord was gone from Hinchingbrook to London, on Thursday last, at which I was a little put to a stand. So after a cup of drink I went to Magdalen College, to get the certificate of the college for my brother's entrance there, that he might save his ear. I met with Mr. Burton in the court, who took me to Mr. Petrell's chamber, where he was, and Mr. Zanke. By and by Mr. Petrell and Zanke and I went out, Petrell to church, Zanke and I to the Rose Tavern, where we sat and drank till sermon done, and then Mr. Petrell came to us, and we three sat drinking the King's and his whole family's health, till it began to be dark. Then we parted. Zanke and I went to my lodging, where we found my father and Mr. Pierce at the door, and I took them both and Mr. Blayton to the Rose Tavern, and there gave them a quart or two of wine, not telling them that we had been there before. After this we broke up, and my father, Mr. Zanke, and I to my cousin Anjo to supper, where I caused two bottles of wine to be carried from the Rose Tavern that was drunk up, and I had not the wit to let them know at table that it was I that paid for them, and so I lost my thanks for them. After supper Mr. Fairbrother, who supped there with us, took me into a room by himself, and shewed me a pitiful copy of verses upon Mr. Prynne, which he esteemed very good, and desired that I would get them given to Mr. Prynne, in hopes that he would get him some place for it, which I said I would do, but did laugh in my sleeve to think of his folly, though indeed a man that has always expressed great civility to me. After that we sat down and talked. I took leave of all my friends, and so to my inn, where after I had wrote a note and enclosed the certificate to Mr. Widrington, I bade good-night to my father, and John went to bed. But I stayed up a little while, playing the fool, with the lass of the house at the door of the chamber, and so to bed. 27th. Up by four o'clock, and after I was ready, took my leave of my father, whom I left in bed, and the same of my brother John, to whom I gave ten shillings. Mr. Blayton and I took horse, and straight to Saffron Walden, where at the White Hart we set up our horses, and took the master of the house to shew us Audley End House, who took us on foot through the park, and so to the house, where the housekeeper shewed us all the house, in which the stateliness of the ceilings, chimney-pieces, and form of the whole, was exceedingly worth seeing. He took us into the cellar, where we drank most admirable drink, a health to the king. Here I played on my flagellate, there being an excellent echo. He shewed us excellent pictures, two especially those of the four evangelists and Henry the Eighth. After that I gave the man two shillings for his trouble, and went back again. In our going my landlord carried us through a very old hospital or almshouse, where forty poor people was maintained, a very old foundation, and over the chimney in the mantelpiece was an inscription in brass, Orate pre anima tomai bird, etc., and the poor box also was on the same chimney-piece, with an iron door and locks to it, into which I put sixpence. They brought me a draught of their drink in a brown bowl tipped with silver, which I drank off, and at the bottom was a picture of the virgin and the child in her arms, done in silver. So we went to our inn, and after eating of something, and kissed the daughter of the house, she being very pretty, we took leave, and so that night the road pretty good, but the weather rainy to Epping, where we sat and played a game at cards, and after supper, and some merry talk with a plain bold maid of the house, we went to bed. 28th. Up in the morning, and had some red herrings to our breakfast, while my boot-heel was amending. By the same token the boy left the hole as big as it was before. Then to horse, and for London through the forest, where we found the way good, but only in one path, which we kept as if we had rode through a canal all the way. 
We found the shops all shut, and the militia of the Red Regiment in arms at the old exchange, among whom I found and spoke to Nick Osborne, who told me that it was a thanksgiving day through the city for the return of the Parliament. At Paul's I light, Mr. Blayton holding my horse, where I found Dr. Reynolds in the pulpit, and General Monk there, who was to have a great entertainment at Grocer's Hall. So home, where my wife and all well. Shifted myself, and so to Mr. Crewe's, and then to Sir Harry Wright's, where I found my lord at dinner, who called for me in, and was glad to see me. There was at dinner also Mr. John Wright and his lady, a very pretty lady, Alderman Allen's daughter. I dined here with Will Howe, and after dinner went out with him to buy a hat, calling in my way, and saw my mother, which we did at the plough in Fleet Street by my lord's direction, but not as for him. Here we met with Mr. Pierce a little before, and he took us to the Greyhound Tavern, and gave us a pint of wine, and as the rest of the seamen do, talked very high again of my lord. After we had done about the hat, we went homewards, he to Mr. Crewe, and I to Mrs. Jem, and sat with her a little. Then home, where I found Mr. Shepley, almost drunk, come to see me. Afterwards Mr. Spong comes, with whom I went up and played with him a duo or two, and so good night. I was indeed a little vexed with Mr. Shepley, but said nothing, about his breaking open of my study at my house, merely to give him the key of the stair door at my lord's, which lock he might better have broke than mine. Twenty-ninth, to my office, and drank at Will's with Mr. Moore, who told me how my lord is chosen general at sea by the council, and that it is thought that Monk will be joined with him therein. Home and dined, after dinner, my wife and I by water to London, and thence to Herring's, the merchant in Coleman Street, about fifty pounds which he promises I shall have on Saturday next. So to my mother's, and then to Mrs. Turner's, of whom I took leave, and her company, because she was to go out of town to-morrow with Mr. Pepys into Norfolk. Here my cousin Norton gave me a brave cup of methaglin, the first I ever drank, to my mother's, and supped there. She shewed me a letter to my father from my uncle, inviting him to come to Brampton, while he is in the country. So home and to bed. This day my lord came to the house, the first time since he came to town, but he had been at the council before. End of February Chapter three of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, sixteen sixty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, sixteen sixty, by Samuel Pepys. March, sixteen fifty nine, sixteen sixty. March first. In the morning went to my lord's lodgings, thinking to have spoke with Mr. Shepley having not been to visit him since my coming to town. But he being not within, I went up, and out of the box where my lord's pamphlets lay, I chose as many as I had a mind to have for my own use, and left the rest. Then to my office, where little to do. But Mr. Shepley comes to me, so at dinner-time he and I went to Mr. Crewe's, whither Mr. Thomas was newly come to town, being sent with Sir H. Yelverton, my old schoolfellow at Paul's school, to bring the thanks of the county to General Monk, for the return of the Parliament. But old Mr. Crewe and my lord, not coming home to dinner, we tarried late before we went to dinner, it being the day that John, Mr. John Crewe's coachman, was to be buried in the afternoon, he being a day or two before killed with a blow of one of his horses that struck his skull into his brain. From thence Mr. Shepley and I went into London to Mr. Laxton's, my lord's apothecary, and so by water to Westminster, where at the sun, he and I spent two or three hours in a pint or two of wine, discoursing of matters in the country, among other things telling me that my uncle did to him make a very kind mention of me, and what he would do for me. Thence I went home, and went to bed betimes. This day the Parliament did vote that they would not sit longer than the fifteenth day of this month. Second. This morning I went early to my lord at Mr. Crewe's, where I spoke to him. Here were a great many come to see him, as Secretary Thurlow, who is now by this Parliament chosen again Secretary of State. There were also General Monk's trumpeters to give my lord a sound of their trumpets this morning. Thence I went to my office, and wrote a letter to Mr. Downing about the business of his house. Then going home I met with Mr. Eglin, Chetwin, and Thomas, who took me to the leg in King Street, where we had two brave dishes of meat, one of fish, a carp, and some other fishes, as well done as ever I ate any. After that to the Swan Tavern, where we drank a quart or two of wine, and so parted. So I to Mrs. Jem, and took Mr. Moore with me, who I met in the street, and there I met W. Howe and Shepley. After that to Westminster Hall, 
where I saw Sir G. Booth at liberty. This day I hear the city militia is put into good posture, and it is thought that Monk will not be able to do any great matter against them now, if he have a mind. I understand that my Lord Lambert did yesterday send a letter to the council, and that to-night he is to come and appear to the council in person. Sir Arthur Hazelrig do not yet appear in the house. Great is the talk of a single person, and that it would now be Charles, George, or Richard again, for the last of which my Lord St. John is said to speak high. Great also is the dispute now in the house, in whose name the rich shall run for the next Parliament, and it is said that Mr. Prynne in open house said, In King Charles's. From Westminster Hall home, spent the evening in my study, and so, after some talk with my wife, then to bed. Third, to Westminster Hall, where I found that my lord was last night voted one of the generals at sea, and Monk the other. I met my lord in the hall, who bid me come to him at noon. I met with Mr. Pierce the purser, Lieutenant Lambert, Mr. Creed, and Will Howe, and went with them to the Swan Tavern, up to my office, but did nothing. At noon, home to dinner, to a sheep's head. My brother Tom came and dined with me, and told me that my mother was not very well, and that my aunt Fenner was very ill too. After dinner I to Warwick House in Holborn to my lord, where he dined with my lord of Manchester, Sir Dudley North, my lord Fiennes, and my lord Barclay. I stayed in the great hall, talking with some gentlemen there, till they all come out. Then I, by coach with my lord, to Mr. Crews, in our way talking of public things, and how I should look after getting of his commissioner's dispatch. He told me he feared there was new design hatching, as if Monk had a mind to get into the saddle. Here I left him and went by appointment to Herring, the merchant, but missed of my money, at which I was much troubled, but could not help myself. Returning met Mr. Gifford, who took me and gave me half a pint of wine, and told me, as I hear this day from many, that things are in a very doubtful posture, some of the Parliament being willing to keep the power in their hands. After I had left him I met with Tom Harper, who took me into a place in Drury Lane, where we drank a great deal of strong water, more than ever I did in my life at one time before. He talked huge high that my Lord Protector would come in place again, which indeed is much discoursed of again, though I do not see it possible. Hence home, and wrote to my father at Brampton by the post. So to bed. This day I was told that my Lord General Fleetwood told my Lord that he feared the King of Sweden is dead of a fever at Gothenburg. Fourth, Lord's Day. Before I went to church I sang off his hymn to my vial. After that to Mr. Gunning's, an excellent sermon upon charity. Then to my mother to dinner, where my wife and the maid were come. After dinner we three to Mr. Messam's, where we met Monsieur Lampertinot, who got us a seat and told me a ridiculous story, how that last week he had caused a simple citizen to spend eighty pounds in entertainments of him and some friends of his, upon pretence of some service that he would do him in his suit after a widow. Then to my mother again, and after supper she and I talked very high about religion, I in defence of the religion I was born in, then home. Fifth, early in the morning Mr. Hill comes to string my theorbo which we were about till past ten o'clock, with a great deal of pleasure. Then to Westminster, where I met with Mr. Shepley and Mr. Pinkney at Wills, who took me by water to Billingsgate at the Salutation Tavern, whither by and by Mr. Talbot and Adams came, and bring a great deal of good meat, a ham of bacon, etc. Here we stayed and drank till Mr. Adams began to be overcome. Then we parted, and so to Westminster by water, only seeing Mr. Pinkney at his own house, where he shewed me how he had always kept the lion and unicorn, in the back of his chimney, bright, in expectation of the King's coming again. At home I found Mr. Hunt, who told me how the Parliament had voted that the Covenant be printed and hung in churches again. Great hopes of the King's coming again. To bed. Sixth, Shrove Tuesday. I called Mr. Shepley, and we both went up to my Lord's lodgings at Mr. Crewe's, where he bade us to go home again, and get a fire against an hour after, which we did at Whitehall, whither he came, and after talking with him and me about his going to sea, he called me by myself to go along with him into the garden, where he asked me how things were with me, and what he had endeavoured to do with my uncle, to get him to do something for me, but he would say nothing to. He likewise bade me to look out now, at this turn, some good place, and he would use all his own and all the interest of his friends that he had in England to do me good, and asked me whether I could, without too much inconvenience, go to sea as his secretary, and bid me think of it. He also began to talk of things of state, and told me that he should want one in that capacity at sea, that he might trust in, and therefore he would have me to go. He told me also that he did believe the king would come in, and did discourse with me about it, and about the affection of the people and city, at which I was full glad. 
After he was gone, I waiting upon him through the garden till he came to the hall, where I left him and went up to my office, where Mr. Hawley brought one to me, a seaman, that had promised Rio to him if he get him a purser's place, which I think to endeavour to do. Here comes my uncle Tom, whom I took to Will's and drank with, poor man. He comes to inquire about the Knights of Windsor, of which he desires to get to be one. While we were drinking, in comes Mr. Day, a carpenter in Westminster, to tell me that it was Shrove Tuesday, and that I must go with him to their yearly club upon this day, which I confess I had quite forgot. So I went to the bell, where were Mr. Eglin, Beasy, Vincent, a butcher, one more, and Mr. Tanner, with whom I played upon a viol, and he a violin, after dinner, and were very merry, with a special good dinner, a leg of veal and bacon, two capons, and sausages and fritters, with abundance of wine. After that I went home, where I found Kate Sturpin, who had not been here a great while before. She gone, I went to see Mrs. Jem, at whose chamber door I found a couple of ladies, but she not being there, we hunted her out, and found that she and another had hid themselves behind a door. Well, they all went down into the dining-room, where it was full of tag, rag, and bobtail, dancing, singing, and drinking, of which I was ashamed, and after I had stayed a dance or two I went away. Going home, called at my lord's for Mr. Shepley, but found him at the lion with a pewterer, that he had bought pewter to-day of. With them I drank, and so home, and wrote by the post, by my lord's command, for J. Goods to come up presently. For my lord intends to go forthwith into the Swiftshire, till the Naseby be ready. This day I hear that the lords do intend to sit, and great store of them are now in town, and I see in the hall to-day. Overton at Hull do stand out, but can, it is thought, do nothing, and Lawson, it is said, is gone with some ships thither, but all that is nothing. My lord told me that there was great endeavours to bring in the protector again, but he told me, too, that he did believe it would not last long if he were brought in, no, nor the king neither, though he seems to think that he will come in, unless he carry himself very soberly and well. Everybody now drinks the king's health without any fear, whereas before it was very private that a man dare do it. Monk this day is feasted at Mercer's Hall, and is invited one after another to all the twelve halls in London. Many think that he is honest yet, and some or more think him to be a fool that would raise himself, but think that he will undo himself by endeavouring it. My mind, I must needs remember, has been very much eased and joyed at my lord's great expressions of kindness this day, and in discourse thereupon my wife and I lay awake an hour or two in our bed. 7th, Ash Wednesday. In the morning I went to my lord at Mr. Crewe's, in my way Washington overtook me, and told me upon my question whether he knew of any place now void that I might have, by power over friends, that this day Mr. G. Montague was to be made Custos Rotulorum for Westminster, and that by friends I might get to be named by him Clerk of the Peace, with which I was, as I am at all new things, very much joyed. So when I came to Mr. Crewe's, I spoke to my lord about it, who told me he believed Mr. Montague had already promised it, and that it was given him only that he might gratify one person with the place I look for. Here, among many that were here, I met with Mr. Lyons, a surgeon, who promised me some seeds of the sensitive plant. I spoke too with Mr. Pierce, a surgeon, who gave me great encouragement to go to sea with my lord. Thence going homewards, my lord overtook me in his coach, and called me in, and so I went with him to St. James, and G. Montague being gone to Whitehall, we walked over the part thither, all the way he discoursing of the times, and of the change of things since the last year, and wondering how he could bear with so great disappointment as he did. He did give me the best advice that he could what was best for me, whether to stay or go with him, and offered all the ways that could be how he might do me good, with the greatest liberty and love that could be. I left him at Whitehall, and myself went to Westminster to my office, with a nothing to do, but I did discourse with Mr. Falconbridge about Lesquire's place, and had his consent to get it if I could. I afterwards in the hall met with W. Simons, who put me in the best way how to get it done. Thence by appointment to the Angel in King Street, where Chetwin, Mr. Thomas, and Doling were at oysters, and beginning Lent this day with a fish dinner. After dinner Mr. Thomas and I by water to London, where I went to Herring's and received the fifty pounds of my lord's upon Frank's bill from Worcester. I gave him the bill, and set my hand to his bill. Thence I went to the Pope's Head Alley, and called on Adam Child, and bought a cat call there. It cost me two groats. Thence went and gave him a cup of ale. After that to the sun behind the exchange, where meeting my uncle White by the way, took him with me thither, and after drinking a health or two round at the cock, Mr. Thomas being gone thither, we parted, he and I homewards, parted at Fleet Street, where I found my father newly come home from Brampton very well. He left my uncle with his leg very dangerous, and do believe he cannot continue in that condition long. He tells me that my uncle did acquaint him very largely 
what he did intend to do with his estate, to make me his heir, and give my brother Tom something, and that my father and mother should have likewise something, to raise portions for John and Paul. I pray God he may be as good as his word. Here I stayed and supped, and so home, there being Joyce Norton there, and Charles Glasscock. Going home I called at Watton's, and took home a piece of cheese. At home Mr. Shepley sat with me a little while, and so we all to bed. This news and my Lord's great kindness makes me very cheerful within. I pray God make me thankful. This day, according to order, Sir Arthur appeared at the house. What was done I know not, but there was all the rumpus, almost, come to the house to-day. My Lord did seem to wonder much why Lambert was so willing to be put into the tower, and thinks he has some design in it. But I think that he is so poor that he cannot use his liberty for debts, if he were at liberty, and so it is as good and better for him to be there than anywhere else. 8th. To Whitehall, to bespeak some firing for my father at Shorts, and likewise to speak to Mr. Blackburn about Batters being gunner in the Wexford. Then to Westminster Hall, where there was a general damp over men's minds and faces upon some of the officers of the army, being about making a remonstrance against Charles Stuart or any single person. But at noon it was told that the general had put a stop to it, so all was well again. Here I met with Jasper, who was to look for me to bring me to my lord at the lobby. With a sending a note to my lord, he comes out to me, and gives me direction to look after getting some money for him from the admiralty, seeing that things are so unsafe that he would not lay out a farthing for the state, till he had received some money of theirs. Home about two o'clock, and took my wife by land to Peyton Oster Row, to buy some paragon for a petticoat, and so home again. In my way meeting Mr. Moore, who went home with me while I ate a bit, and so back to Whitehall again, both of us. He waited at the council for Mr. Crewe. I to the admiralty, where I got the order for the money, and have taken care for the getting of it assigned upon Mr. Hutchinson, treasure for the navy, against to-morrow. Hence going home I met with Mr. King, that belonged to the treasurers at war, and took him to Harper's, who told me that he and the rest of his fellows are cast out of office by the new treasurers. This afternoon some of the officers of the army and some of the Parliament had a conference at Whitehall to make all right again, but I know not what is done. This noon I met at the Dog Tavern Captain Philip Holland, with whom I advised how to make some advantage of my lord's going to sea, which he told me might be by having of five or six servants entered on board, and I to give them what wages I pleased, and so their pay to be mine. He was also very urgent to have me take the secretary's place that my lord did proffer me. At the same time in comes Mr. Wade and Mr. Sterry, secretary to the plenipotentiary in Denmark, who brought the news of the death of the King of Sweden at Gothenburg, the third of the last month, and he told me what a great change he found when he came in here, the secluded members being restored. He also spoke very freely of Mr. Wade's profit, which he made while he was in Zealand, how he did believe that he cheated Mr. Powell, and that he made above five hundred pounds on the voyage, which Mr. Wade did very angrily deny, but I believe he was guilty enough. Ninth to my lord at his lodging, and came to Westminster with him in the coach, with Mr. Dudley with him, and he in the painted chamber, walked a good while, and I telling him that I was willing and ready to go with him to see. He agreed that I should, and advised me what to write to Mr. Downing about it, which I did at my office, that by my lord's desire, I offered that my place might for a while be supplied by Mr. Moore, and that I and my security should be bound by the same bond for him. I went and dined at Mr. Crewe's, where Mr. Hawley comes to me, and I told him the business, and shewed him the letter promising him twenty pounds a year, which he liked very well of. I did the same to Mr. Moore, which he also took for a courtesy. In the afternoon by coach, taking Mr. Butler with me to the Navy office, about the five hundred pounds for my lord, which I am promised to have to-morrow morning. Then by coach back again, and at Whitehall, at the council chamber, spoke with my lord, and got him to sign the acquittance for the five hundred pounds, and he also told me that he had spoke to Mr. Blackburn to put off Mr. Creed, and that I should come to him for direction in the employment. After this Mr. Butler and I to Harper's, where we sat and drank for two hours till ten at night. The old woman she was drunk, and began to talk foolishly, in the commendation of her son James. Home and to bed. All night troubled in my thoughts how to order my business upon this great change with me, that I could not sleep, and being overheated with drink I made a promise the next morning to drink no strong drink this week, for I find that it makes me sweat and puts me quite out of order. This day it was resolved that the writs do go out in the name of the keepers of the liberty, and I hear that it is resolved privately that a treaty be offered with the king, and that Monk did check his soldiers highly for what they did yesterday. 10th. In the morning went to my father's, whom I took in his cutting-house, and there I told him my resolution to go to sea with my lord, and consulted with him how to dispose of my wife, and we resolved of letting her be at Mr. Bowyer's. 
thence to the treasurer of the navy where i received five hundred pounds for my lord and having left two hundred pounds of it with mr rawlinson at his house for shepley i went with the rest to the sun tavern on fish street hill where mr hill stevens and mr hater of the navy office had invited me where we had good discourse and a fine breakfast of mr hater then by coach home where i took occasion to tell my wife of my going to sea who was much troubled at it and was with some dispute at last willing to continue at mr bowyer's in my absence after this to see mrs jem and paid her maid seven pounds and then to mr blackburn who told me what mr creed did say upon the news of my coming into his place and that he did propose to my lord that there should be two secretaries which made me go to sir h wright's where my lord dined and spoke with him about it but he seemed not to agree to the motion hither w howe comes to me and so to westminster in the way he told me what i was to provide and so forth against my going he went with me to my office whither also mr madge comes half foxed and played the fool upon the violin that made me weary then to whitehall and so home and set many of my things in order against my going my wife was late making of caps for me and the wench making an end of a pair of stockings that she was knitting of so to bed eleventh sunday all the day busy without my band on putting up my books and things in order to my going to sea at night my wife and i went to my father's to supper where j norton and charles glasscock supped with us and after supper home where the wench had provided all things against to-morrow to wash and so to bed where i much troubled with my cold and coughing twelfth this day the wench rose at two in the morning to wash and my wife and i lay talking a great while i by reason of my cold could not tell how to sleep my wife and i to the exchange where we bought a great many things where i left her and went into london and at Bedells the booksellers at the temple gate i paid twelve pounds ten shillings sixpence for mr fuller by his direction so came back and at wilkinson's found mr shepley and some sea people as the cook of the naseby and others at dinner then to the white horse in king street where i got mr buddle's horse to ride to huntsmore to mr bowyer's where i found him and all well and willing to have my wife come and board with them while i was at sea which was the business i went about here i lay and took a thing for my cold namely a spoonful of honey and a nutmeg scraped into it by mr bowyer's direction and so took it into my mouth which i found did do me much good thirteenth it rained hard and i got up early and got to london by eight o'clock at my lord's lodgings who told me that i was to be secretary and creed to be deputy treasurer to the fleet at which i was troubled but i could not help it after that to my father's to look after things and so at my shoemaker's and others at night to whitehall where i met with simons and llewellyn at drink with them at roberts at whitehall then to the admiralty where i talked with mr creed till the brothers and they were very seemingly willing and glad that i have the place since my lord would dispose of it otherwise than to them home and to bed this day the parliament voted all that had been done by the former rump against the house of lords be void and to-night that the writs go out without any qualification things seem very doubtful what will be the end of all for the parliament seems to be strong for the king while the soldiers to all talk against fourteenth to my lord where infinity of applications to him and to me to my great trouble my lord gives me all the papers that was given to him to put in order and give him an account of them here i got half a piece of a person of mr wright's recommending to my lord to be preacher of the speaker frigate i went hence to st james's and mr pierce the surgeon with me to speak with mr clark monk's secretary about getting some soldiers removed out of huntingdon to Arundel, which my lord told me he did to do a courtesy to the town that he might have the greater interest in them in the choice of the next parliament not that he intends to be chosen himself but that he might have mr g montague and my lord mandeville chose there in spite of the bernards this done where i saw general monk and me thought he seemed a dull heavy man he and i to whitehall where with llewellyn we dined at marshes coming home telling my wife what we had to dinner she had a mind to some cabbage and i sent for some and she had it went to the admiralty where a strange thing how i am already courted by the people this morning among others that came to me i hired a boy of jenkins of westminster and burr to be my clerk this night i went to mr creed's chamber where he gave me the former book of the proceedings in the fleet and the seal then to harper's where old beard was and i took him by coach to my lord's but he was not at home but afterwards i found him out at sir h wright's thence by coach it raining hard to mrs jim where i stayed a while and so home and late in the night put up my things in a sea chest that mr shepley lent me and so to bed fifteenth early packing up my things to be sent by cart with the rest of my lord's so to wills where i took leave of some of my friends here i met tom alcock one that went to school with me at huntingdon but i had not seen him these sixteen years 
So in the hall paid and made even with Mrs. Mitchell. Afterwards met with Old Beale. And at the axe paid him this quarter to Lady Day next. In the afternoon Dick Matthews comes to dine, and I went and drank with him at Harper's. So into London by water, and in Fish Street my wife and I bought a bit of salmon for eightpence, and went to the Sun Tavern and ate it, where I did promise to give her all that I have in the world but my books, in case I should die at sea. From thence homewards, in the way my wife bought linen for three smocks and other things. I went to my lord's and spoke with him, so home with Mrs. Jem by coach, and then home to my own house. From thence to the Fox in King Street to supper on a brave turkey of Mr. Hawley's, with some friends of his there, Will Bower, etc. After supper I went to Westminster Hall, and the Parliament sat till ten at night, thinking and being expected to dissolve themselves to-day, but they did not. Great talk to-night that the discontented officers did think this night to make a stir, but prevented. To the Fox again, home with my wife, and to bed extraordinary sleepy. Sixteenth. No sooner out of bed, but troubled with abundance of clients, seamen. My landlord Banley's man came to me by my direction yesterday, for I was there at his house as I was going to London by water, and I paid him rent for my house for this quarter ending at Lady Day, and took an acquittance that he wrote me from his master. Then to Mr. Shepley, to the Rhenish Tavern House, where Mr. Pym the tailor was, and gave us a morning draught and a neat's tongue. Home and with my wife to London, we dined at my father's, where Joyce Norton and Mr. Armiger dined also. After dinner my wife took leave of them in order to her going to-morrow to Huntsmore. In my way home I went to the chapel in Chancery Lane to bespeak papers of all sorts, and other things belonging to writing against my voyage. So home, where I spent an hour or two about my business in my study. Thence to the Admiralty, and stayed a while, so home again, where Will Bowyer came to tell us that he would bear my wife company in the coach to-morrow. Then to Westminster Hall where I heard how the Parliament had this day dissolved themselves, and did pass very cheerfully through the hall, and the Speaker without his mace. The whole hall was joyful thereat, as well as themselves, and now they begin to talk loud of the King. To-night I am told that yesterday, about five o'clock in the afternoon, one came with a ladder to the great exchange, and wiped with a brush the inscription that was upon King Charles, and that there was a great bonfire made in the exchange, and people called out, God bless King Charles the Second. From the hall I went home to bed, very sad in mind to part with my wife, but God's will be done. Seventeenth. This morning bade adieu in bed to the company of my wife. We rose, and I gave my wife some money to serve her for a time, and what papers of consequence I had. Then I left her to get ready, and went to my lord's with my boy Eliezer, to my lord's lodging, and Mr. Cruz. Here I had much business with my lord, and papers, great store, given me by my lord to dispose of as of the rest. After that, with Mr. Moore, home to my house, and took my wife by coach, to the Chequer in Hoban, where, after we had drank, etc., she took coach, and so farewell. I stayed behind with Tom Alcock and Mr. Anderson, my old chamberfellow at Cambridge, his brother, and drank with them there, who were come to me thither, about one that would have a place at sea. Thence with Mr. Hawley to dinner at Mr. Crew's. After dinner to my own house, where all things were put up into the dining-room and locked up, and my wife took the keys along with her. This day, in the presence of Mr. Moore, who made it, and Mr. Hawley, I did, before I went out with my wife, seal my will to her, whereby I did give all that I have in the world but my books, which I give to my brother John, excepting only French books, which my wife is to have. In the evening at the Admiralty I met my lord there, and got a commission for Williamson, to be captain of the Harp Frigate, and afterwards went by coach, taking Mr. Cripps with me to my lord, and got him to sign it at table, as he was at supper, and so to Westminster, back again with him with me, who had a great desire to go to sea, and my lord told me that he would do him any favour. So I went home with him to his mother's house by me in Axe-yard, where I found Dr. Clodius' wife, and sat there talking and hearing of old Mrs. Crisp playing of her old lessons upon the harpsichord, till it was time to go to bed. After that to bed, and lord, her son, lay with me in the best chamber in her house, which indeed was finely furnished. Eighteenth. I rose early and went to the barber's, Jervis, in Palace-yard, and I was trimmed by him, and afterwards drank with him a cup or two of ale, and did begin to hire his man to go with me to sea. Then to my lord's lodging, where I found Captain Williamson, and gave him his commission to be captain of the harp, and he gave me a piece of gold and twenty shillings in silver. So to my own house, where I stayed a while, and then to dinner with Mr. Shepley at my lord's lodgings. After that to Mr. Mossum's, where he made a very gallant sermon upon Pray for the life of the king and the king's son. Ezra 6.10. From thence to Mr. Crewe's, but my lord not being within, I did not stay, but went away, and met with Mr. Woodfine, who took me to an alehouse in Drury Lane, and we sat and drank together, and ate toasted cakes, which were very good, 
and we had a great deal of mirth with the mistress of the house about them from thence homewards and called at mr blagrave's where i took up my note that he had of mine for forty shillings which he two years ago did give me as a pawn while he had my lute so that all things are even between him and i so to mrs crisp where she and her daughter and son and i sat talking till ten o'clock at night i giving them the best advice that i could concerning their son how he should go to sea and so to bed nineteenth early to my lord where infinity of business to do which makes my head full and indeed for these two or three days i have not been without a great many cares and thoughts concerning them after that to the admiralty where a good while with mr blackburn who told me that it was much to be feared that the king would come in for all good men and good things were now discouraged thence to wilkinson's where mr shepley and i dined and while we were at dinner my lord monk's life-guard come by with the sergeant at arms before them with two proclamations that all cavaliers do depart the town but the other that all officers that were lately disbanded should do the same the last of which mr r creed i remember said that he looked upon it as if they had said that all god's people should depart the town thence with some sea officers to the swan where we drank wine till one comes to pay me some money from worcester viz twenty five pounds his name is wilday i sat in another room and took my money and drank with him till the rest of my company were gone and so we parted going home the water was high and so i got crockford to carry me over it so home and left my money there all the discourse nowadays is that the king will come again and for all i see it is the wishes of all and all do believe that it will be so my mind is still much trouble for my poor wife but i hope that this undertaking will be worth my pains to whitehall in state about business at the admiralty late then to tony robbins where captain stokes mr luddington and others were and i did solicit the captain for lord crisp who gave me a promise that he would entertain him after that to mrs crisp where dr clodius and his wife were he very merry with drink we played at cards late and so to bed this day my lord dined at my lord mayor's and jasper was made drunk which my lord was very angry at twentieth this morning i rose early and went to my house to put things in a little order against my going which i conceive will be to-morrow the weather still very rainy after that to my lord where i found very great deal of business he giving me all letters and papers that come to him about business for me to give him account of when we come on shipboard hence with captain isham by coach to whitehall to the admiralty he and i and chetwin doling and llewellyn dined together at marshes at whitehall so to the bullhead whither w simons comes to us and i gave them my foy against my going to sea and so we took leave one of another they promising me to write to me to sea hither comes pym's boy by my direction with two montiers for me to take my choice of and i chose the saddest colour and left the other for mr shepley hence by coach to london and took a short melancholy leave of my father and mother without having them to drink or say anything of business one to another and indeed i had a fear upon me i should scarce ever see my mother again she having a great cold then upon her then to westminster where by reason of rain and an easterly wind the water was so high that there was boats rowed in king street and all our yard was drowned that one could not go to my house so as no man has seen the like almost most houses full of water then back by coach to my lord's where i met mr shepley who stayed with me waiting for my lord's coming in till very late then he and i and william howe went with our swords to bring my lord home from sir h wright's he resolved to go to-morrow if the wind ceased shepley and i home by coach i to mrs crisp's who had sat over a good supper long looking for me so we sat talking and laughing till it was very late and so lord and i to bed twenty first to my lord's but the wind very high against us and the weather bad we could not go to-day here i did very much business and then to my lord widdrington's from my lord with his desire that he might have the disposal of the writs of the sink ports my lord was very civil to me and called for wine and writ a long letter in answer thence i went to a tavern over against mr pierce's with judge advocate fowler and mr burr and sat and drank with them two or three pints of wine after that to mr crew's again and gave my lord an account of what i had done and so about my business to take leave of my father and mother which by a mistake i have put down yesterday thence to westminster to chris where we were very merry the old woman sent for supper for me and gave me a handkerchief with strawberry buttons on it and so to bed twenty second up very early and set things in order at my house and so took leave of mrs crisp and her daughter who was in bed and of mrs hunt then to my lord's lodging at the gate and did so there where mr hawley came to me and i gave him the key of my house to keep and he went with me to mr crew's and there i took my last leave of him but the weather continuing very bad my lord would not go to-day my lord spent this morning private in sealing of his last will and testament with mr w montague 
After that I went forth about my own business, to buy a pair of riding grey serge stockings, and sword and belt and hose, and after that took Watton and Brigden to the Pope's Head Tavern in Chancery Lane, where Gilbert Holland and Shelston were, and we dined and drank a great deal of wine, and they paid all. Strange how these people do now promise me anything, one a rapier, the other a vessel of wine or a gun, and one offered me his silver hat-band to do him a courtesy. I pray God to keep me from being proud or too much lifted up hereby. After that to Westminster, and took leave of Kate Sturpin, who was very sorry to part with me, and after that of Mr. George Montague, and received my warrant of Mr. Blackburn to be secretary to the two generals of the fleet, then to take my leave of the clerks of the council, and then Stoling and Llewellyn would have me go with them to Mount's chamber, where we sat and talked, and then I went away. So to my lord, in my way meeting Chetwin and Swan, and bade them farewell, where I lay all night with Mr. Andrews. This day Mr. Shepley went away on board, and I sent my boy with him. This day also Mrs. Jemima went to Marrowbone, so I could not see her. Mr. Moore being out of town to-night, I could not take leave of him, nor speak to him about business, which troubled me much. I left my small case, therefore, with Mr. Andrews for him. 23rd. Up early, carried my lord's will in a black box to Mr. William Montague for him to keep for him. Then to the barber's, and put on my cravat there. So to my lord again, who was almost ready to be gone, and had stayed for me. Hither came Gilbert Holland, and brought me a stick rapier, and Shelston a sugar-loaf, and had brought his wife, who he said was a very pretty woman, to the ship tavern, hard by for me to see, but I could not go. Young Reeve also brought me a little perspective glass, which I bought for my lord. It cost me eight shillings. So after that my lord in Sir H. Wright's coach with Captain Isham, Mr. Thomas, John Crew, W. Howe, and I in a hackney to the tower, where the barges stayed for us, my lord and the captain in one, and W. Howe and I, etc., in the other, to the long reach, where the swift shirt lay at anchor. In our way we saw the great breach which the late high water had made, to the loss of many thousand pounds to the people about Limehouse. Soon as my lord on board, the guns went off bravely from the ships, and a little while after comes the vice-admiral Lawson, and seemed very respectful to my lord, and so did the rest of the commanders of the frigates that were thereabouts. I to the cabin allotted for me, which was the best that any had that belonged to my lord. I got out some things out of my chest for writing, and to work presently, Mr. Burr and I both. I supped at the deck-table with Mr. Shepley. We were late writing of orders for the getting of ships ready, etc., and also making of others to all the seaports between Hastings and Yarmouth, to stop all dangerous persons that are going or coming between Flanders and there. After that to bed in my cabin, which was but short. However, I made shift with it, and slept very well, and the weather being good, I was not sick at all yet. I know not what I shall be. 24th. At work hard all the day, writing letters to the council, etc. This day Mr. Creed came on board, and dined very boldly with my lord, but he could not get a bed there. At night Captain Isham, who had been at Gravesend all last night and to-day, came and brought Mr. Lucy, one acquainted with Mrs. Pierce, with whom I had been at her house. I drank with him in the captain's cabin, but my business could not stay with him. I dispatched many letters to-day abroad, and it was late before we could get to bed. Mr. Shepley and Howe supped with me in my cabin. The boy Eliezer flung down a can of beer upon my papers, which made me give him a box of the ear, it having all spoiled my papers and cost me a great deal of work so to bed. 25th, Lord's Day. About two o'clock in the morning letters came from London by a coxswain, so they waked me, but I would not rise but bid him stay till morning, which he did, and then I rose and carried them in to my lord, who read them abed. Among the rest there was the written mandate for him to dispose to the sink ports for choice of Parliament men. There was also one for me from Mr. Blackburn, who with his own hand superscribes it to S. P. Esquire, of which God knows I was not a little proud. After that I wrote a letter to the clerk of Dover Castle, to come to my lord about issuing of those writs. About ten o'clock Mr. Ibbot, at the end of the long table, began to pray and preach, and indeed made a very good sermon, upon the duty of all Christians to be steadfast in faith. After that Captain Cuttance and I had oysters, my lord being in his cabin not intending to stir out to-day. After that up into the great cabin, above to dinner with the captain, where was Captain Isham, and all the officers of the ship. I took place of all but the captain's. After dinner I wrote a great many letters to my friends at London. After that, sermon again, at which I slept, God forgive me. After that, it being a fair day, I walked with the captain upon the deck, talking. At night I supped with him, and after that had orders from my lord, about some business to be done against to-morrow, which I sat up late, and did, and then to bed. 26th. This day it is two years since it pleased God that I was cut of the stone at Mrs. Turner's in Salisbury Court 
and did resolve while I lived to keep it a festival, as I did the last year at my house, and for ever to have Mrs. Turner and her company with me. But now it pleases God that I am where I am, and so prevented to do it openly. Only within my soul I can and do rejoice, and bless God, being at this time blessed be his holy name, in as good health as ever I was in my life. This morning I rose early, and went about making of an establishment of the whole fleet, and a list of all the ships with the number of men and guns. About an hour after that we had a meeting of the principal commanders and seamen, to proportion out the number of these things. After that to dinner, there being very many commanders on board. All the afternoon very many orders were made, till I was very weary. At night Mr. Shepley and W. Howe came, and brought some bottles of wine, and some things to eat in my cabin, where we were very merry, remembering the day of being cut for the stone. Captain Cuttons came afterwards, and sat drinking a bottle of wine till eleven, a kindness he do not usually do the greatest officer in the ship. After that to bed. 27th. Early in the morning, at making a fair new establishment of the fleet to send to the council. This morning the wind came about, and we fell into the hope, and in our passing by the vice-admiral, he and the rest of the frigates with him, did give us abundance of guns, and we them, so much that the report of them broke all the windows in my cabin, and broke off the iron bar that was upon it, to keep anybody from creeping in at the scuttle. This noon I sat the first time with my lord at table since my coming to sea. All the afternoon exceeding busy in writing of letters and orders. In the afternoon Sir Harry Wright came on board us, about his business of being chosen Parliament man. My lord brought him to see my cabin, when I was hard a writing. At night supped with my lord too, with the captain, and after that to work again till it be very late. So to bed. 28. This morning and the whole day busy, and that the more because Mr. Burr was about his own business all the day at Gravesend. At night there was a gentleman very well bred, his name was Baines, going for Flushing, who spoke French and Latin very well, brought by direction from Captain Clark hither, as a prisoner, because he called out of the vessel that he went in, Where is your king? We have done our business. Vive le roi. He confessed himself a cavalier in his heart, and that he and his whole family had fought for the king, but that he was then drunk, having been all night taking his leave at Gravesend the night before, and so could not remember what it was that he said, but in his words and carriage showed much of a gentleman. My lord had a great kindness for him, but did not think it safe to release him, but commanded him to be used civilly. So he has taken to the master's cabin, and had supper there. In the meantime I wrote a letter to the council about him, and an order for the vessel to be sent for back that he was taken out of. But a while after he sent a letter down to my lord, which my lord did like very well, and did advise with me what was best to be done. So I put in something to my lord, and then to the captain, that the gentleman was to be released, and the letter stopped, which was done. So I went up and sat and talked with him in Latin and French, and drank a bottle or two with him, and about eleven at night he took boat again, and so God bless him. Then sat in my cabin and to bed. This day we had news of the election at Huntingdon for Bernard and Pedley, at which my lord was much troubled for his friends missing of it. Twenty ninth, We lie still a little below Gravesend. At night Mr. Shepley returned from London, and told us of several elections for the next Parliament that the king's effigies was new-making to be set up in the exchange again. This evening was a great whispering of some of the vice-admiral's captains that they were dissatisfied, and did intend to fight themselves, to oppose the general. But it was soon hushed, and the vice-admiral did wholly deny any such thing, and protested to stand by the general. At night Mr. Shepley, W. Howe, and I supped in my cabin. So up to the master's cabin, where we sat talking, and then to bed. 30th. I was saluted in the morning with two letters, from some that I had done a favour to, which brought me in each a piece of gold. This day, while my lord and we were at dinner, the Naseby came in sight towards us, and at last came to anchor close by us. After dinner my lord and many others went on board her, where everything was out of order, and a new chimney made for my lord in his bedchamber, which he was much pleased with. My lord in his discourse discovered a great deal of love to this ship. 31st. This morning Captain Giles of the Wexford came on board, for whom I got commission from my lord to be commander of the ship. Upon the doing thereof he was to make the twenty shilling piece that he sent me yesterday up five pounds, wherefore he sent me a bill that he did owe me four pounds, which I sent my boy to Gravesend with him, and he did give the boy four pounds for me, and the boy gave him the bill under his hand. This morning Mr. Hill, that lives in Axeyard, was here on board with the vice-admiral. I did give him a bottle of wine, and was exceedingly satisfied of the power that I have to make my friends welcome. Many orders to make all the afternoon. At night Mr. Shepley, Howe, Ibbett, and I supped in my cabin together. End of March
Chapter Four of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, sixteen sixty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, sixteen sixty, by Samuel Pepys. April, sixteen sixty. April first, Lord's Day. Mr. Ibbert preached very well. After dinner, my lord did give me a private list of all the ships that were to be set out this summer, wherein I do discern that he hath made it his care to put by as much of the Anabaptists as he can. By reason of my lord and my being busy to send away the packet by Mr. Cook of the Naseby, it was four o'clock before we could begin sermon again. This day Captain Guy come on board from Dunkirk, who tells me that the king will come in, and that the soldiers at Dunkirk do drink the king's health in the streets. At night the captain, Sir R. Stainer, Mr. Shepley, and I did sup together in the captain's cabin. I made a commission for Captain Wilness of the Bear to-night, which got me thirty shillings. So after writing a while, I went to bed. Second. Up very early, and to get all my things and my boys packed up. Great concourse of commanders here this morning, to take leave of my lord, upon his going into the Naseby, so that the table was full, so there dined below many commanders, and Mr. Creed, who was much troubled to hear that he could not go along with my lord, for he had already got all his things thither, thinking to stay there, but W. Howe was very high against it, and he indeed did put him out, though everybody was glad of it. After dinner I went in one of the boats with my boy before my lord, and made shift before night to get my cabin in pretty good order. It is but little, but very convenient having one window to the sea, and another to the deck, and a good bed. This morning comes Mr. Ed Pickering, like a coxcomb, as he always was. He tells me that the king will come in, but that Monk did resolve to have the doing of it himself, or else to hinder it. Third. Late to bed. About three in the morning there was great knocking at my cabin, which with much difficulty, so they say, waked me, and I rose, but it was only for a packet, so went to my bed again, and in the morning gave it my lord. This morning Captain Isham comes on board to see my lord, and drunk his wine before he went into the Downs. There likewise come many merchants to get convoy to the Baltic, which a course was taken for. They dined with my lord, and one of them by name Alderman Wood talked much to my lord of the hopes that we have now to be settled, under the king he meant, but my lord took no notice of it. After dinner, which was late, my lord went on shore, and after him I and Captain Sparling went in his boat, but the water being almost at low water, we could not stay, for fear of not getting into our boat again, so back again. This day come the lieutenant of the Swiftshire, who was sent by my lord to Hastings, one of the Sink ports, to have got Mr. Edward Montague to have been one of their burgesses, but could not, for they were all promised before. After he had done his message, I took him and Mr. Pierce, the surgeon, who this day came on board, and not before, to my cabin, where we drank a bottle of wine. At night, busy a writing, and so to bed. My heart exceeding heavy for not hearing of my dear wife. And, indeed, I do not remember that ever my heart was so apprehensive of her absence as at this very time. Fourth. This morning I dispatch many letters of my own private business to London. There come Colonel Thompson with a wooden leg, and General Penn, and dined with my lord and Mr. Blackburn, who told me that it was certain now that the king must of necessity come in, and that one of the council told him there is something doing in order to a treaty already among them. And it was strange to hear how Mr. Blackburn did already begin to commend him for a sober man, and how quiet he would be under his government, etc. I dined all alone to prevent company, which was exceeding great to-day, in my cabin. After these two were gone, Sir W. Wheeler and Sir John Petters came on board, and stayed about two or three hours, and so went away. The commissioners came to-day, only to consult about a further reducement of the fleet, and to pay them as fast as they can. I did give Davis, their servant, five pounds ten shillings, to give to Mr. Moore from me, in part of the seven pounds that I borrowed of him, and he's to discount the rest out of the thirty-six shillings that he do owe me. At night my lord resolved to send the captain of our ship to Weymouth, and promote his being chosen there, which he did put himself into a readiness to do the next morning. Fifth. Infinity of business all the morning of orders to make, 
that I was very much perplexed that Mr. Burr had failed me of coming back last night, and we ready to set sail, which we did about noon, and came in the evening to Lee Roads, and anchored. At night Mr. Shepley overtook us, who had been at Gray's Market this morning. I spent all the afternoon upon the deck, it being very pleasant weather. This afternoon Sir Richard Stainer and Mr. Creed, after we were come to anchor, did come on board, and Creed brought me thirty pounds, which my lord had ordered him to pay me upon account, and Captain Clark brought me a noted caudal. At night very sleepy to bed. Sixth. This morning came my brother-in-law, Balty, to see me, and to desire to be here with me as reformado, which did much trouble me. But after dinner, my lord using him very civilly at table, I spoke to my lord, and he presented me a letter to Captain Stokes for him, that he should be there. All the day with him walking and talking, we under sail as far as the spits. In the afternoon, W. Howe and I to our violins, the first time since we came on board. This afternoon I made even with my lord to this day, and did give him all the money remaining in my hands. In the evening, it being fine moonshine, I stayed late walking upon the quarter-deck with Mr. Cuttons, learning of some sea terms, and so down to supper and to bed, having an hour before put Balty into Burr's cabin, he being out of the ship. 7th. This day, about nine o'clock in the morning, the wind grew high, and we being among the sands lay at anchor. I began to be dizzy and squeamish. Before dinner my lord sent for me down to eat some oysters, the best my lord said that ever he ate in his life, though I have ate as good at Bardsey. After dinner and all the afternoon I walked upon the deck, to keep myself from being sick, and at last about five o'clock went to bed, and got a caudle made me, and sleep upon it very well. This day Mr. Shepley went to Sheppey. Eighth, Lord's Day. Very calm again, and I pretty well, but my head ached all day. About noon set sail. In our way I see many vessels and masts, which are now the greatest guides for ships. We had a brave wind all the afternoon, and overtook two good merchantmen that overtook us yesterday, going to the East Indies. The lieutenant and I lay out of his window with his glass, looking at the women that were on board them, being pretty handsome. This evening Major Willoughby, who had been here three or four days on board with Mr. Pickering, went on board a catch for Dunkirk. We continued sailing when I went to bed, being somewhat ill again, and Will Howe, the surgeon, parson, and Balty, supped in the lieutenant's cabin, and afterwards sat disputing, the parson for, and I against, extemporary prayers, very hot. Ninth. We having sailed all night, were come in sight of the Nore and South Forelands in the morning, and so sailed all day. In the afternoon we had a very fresh gale, which I brooked better than I thought I should be able to do. This afternoon I first saw France and Calais, with which I was much pleased, though it was at a distance. About five o'clock we came to the Goodwin, so to the castles about Deal, where our fleet lay, among whom we anchored. Great was the shout of guns from the castles and ships, and our answers, that I never heard yet so great rattling of guns. Nor could we see one another on board for the smoke that was among us, nor one ship from another. Soon as we came to anchor, the captains came from on board their ships all to us on board. This afternoon I wrote letters for my lord to the council, etc., which Mr. Dickering was to carry, who took his leave this night of my lord, and Balty, after I had wrote two or three letters by him to my wife and Mr. Bowyer, and had drank a bottle of wine with him in my cabin, which J. Goods and W. Howe brought on purpose, he took leave of me too, to go away to-morrow morning with Mr. Dickering. I lent Balty fifteen shillings, which he was to pay to my wife. It was one in the morning before we parted. This evening Mr. Shepley came on board, having escaped a very great danger upon a sand coming from Chatham. Tenth. This morning many or most of the commanders in the fleet came on board, and dined here, so that some of them and I dined together in the round-house, where we were very merry. Hither came the vice-admiral to us, and sat and talked, and seemed a very good-natured man. At night, as I was all alone in my cabin, in a melancholy fit, playing on my violin, my lord and Sir R. Stainer came into the coach, and supped there, and called me out to supper with them. After that, up to the lieutenant's cabin, where he and I and Sir Richard sat till eleven o'clock talking, and so to bed. This day my lord Goring returned from France, and landed at Dover. Eleventh. A gentleman came this morning from my lord of Manchester to my lord, for a pass for Mr. Boyle, which was made him. I ate a good breakfast by my lord's orders with him in the great cabin below. The wind all this day was very high, so that a gentleman that was at dinner with my lord, that came along with Sir John Blois, who seemed a fine man, 
was forced to rise from table. This afternoon came a great packet of letters from London directed to me, among the rest two from my wife, the first that I have since coming away from London. All the news from London is that things go on further towards the King, that the Skinner's Company the other day, at their entertaining of General Monk, had took down the Parliament arms in their hall, and set up the King's. In the evening my Lord and I had a great deal of discourse about the several captains of the fleet, and his interest among them, and had his mind clear to bring in the King. He confessed to me that he was not sure of his own captain, to be true to him, and that he did not like Captain Stokes. At night W. Howe and I, at our violins in my cabin, where Mr. Ibbot and the Lieutenant were late. I stayed the Lieutenant late, shewing him my manner of keeping a journal. After that to bed. It comes now into my mind to observe that I am sensible that I have been a little too free to make mirth with the minister of our ship, he being a very sober and an upright man. Twelfth. This day, the weather being very bad, we had no strangers on board. In the afternoon came the Vice-Admiral on board, with whom my Lord consulted, and I sent a packet to London at night, with several letters to my friends, as to my wife about my getting of money for her, when she should need it, to Mr. Bowyer, that he tell me when the messieurs of the officers be paid, to Mr. Moore, about the business of my office, and making even with him as to matter of money. At night, after I had dispatched my letters, to bed. Thirteenth. This day very foul all day for rain and wind. In the afternoon set my own things in my cabin and chests in better order than hitherto, and set my papers in order. At night sent another packet to London by the post, and after that was done, I went up to the lieutenant's cabin, and there we broached a vessel of ale, that we had sent for among us from Deal to-day. There was the minister and doctor with us. After that, till one o'clock in the morning, writing letters to Mr. Downing, about my business of continuing my office to myself, only Mr. Moore to execute it for me. I had also a very serious and effectual letter from my lord to him to that purpose. After that done, then to bed, and it being very rainy, and the rain coming upon my bed, I went and lay with John Goods in the great cabin below, the wind being so high that we were fair to lower some of the masts. I to bed, and what with the goodness of the bed, and the rocking of the ship, I slept till almost ten o'clock, and then, fourteenth, rose and drank a good morning draught there with Mr. Shepley, which occasioned my thinking upon the happy life that I live now, had I nothing to care for but myself. The sea was this morning very high, and looking out of the window I saw our boat come with Mr. Pierce the surgeon in it in great danger, who endeavouring to come on board us had liked to have been drowned, had it not been for a rope. This day I was informed that my Lord Lambert is got out of the towers, and that there is a hundred pounds proffered to whoever shall bring him forth to the Council of State. My Lord is chosen at Weymouth this morning. My Lord had his freedom brought him by Captain Tiddyman of the port of Dover, by which he is capable of being elected for them. This day I heard that the army had in general declared to stand by what the next Parliament shall do. At night supped with my Lord. Fifteenth, Lord's Day. Up early and was trimmed by the barber in the great cabin below. After that to put my clothes on, and then to sermon, and then to dinner, where my Lord told us at the University of Cambridge, had a mind to choose him for their burgess, which he pleased himself to think that they do look upon him as a thriving man, and said so openly at table. At dinner-time Mr. Cook came back from London with a packet which caused my lord to be full of thoughts all day, and at night he bid me privately to get two commissions ready, one for Captain Robert Blake to be captain of the Worcester, in the room of Captain Deakings and Anabaptist, and one that had witnessed a great deal of discontent with the present proceedings the other for Captain Coppin to come out of that into the Newbury, in the room of Blake, whereby I perceive that General Monk do resolve to make a thorough change, to make way for the King. From London I hear that since Lambert got out of the tower, the fanatics had held up their heads high, but I hope all that will come to nothing. Late a writing of letters to London to get ready for Mr. Cook, then to bed. Sixteenth. And about four o'clock in the morning Mr. Cook waked me where I lay in the great cabin below, and I did give him his packet and directions for London, so to sleep again, all the morning giving out orders and tickets to the commanders of the fleet, to discharge all supernumeraries that they had above the number that the council had set in their last establishment, after dinner busy all the afternoon writing, and so till night, then to bed. 17th. All the morning getting ready commissions for the vice-admiral and the rear-admiral, wherein my lord was very careful to express the utmost of his own power, commanding them to obey what orders they should receive from the Parliament, etc., or both or either of the generals. 
The vice-admiral dined with us, and in the afternoon my lord called me to give him the commission for him, which I did, and he gave it him himself. A very pleasant afternoon, and I upon the deck all the day. It was so clear that my lord's glass shewed us Calais very plain, and the cliffs were as plain to be seen as Kent, and my lord at first made me believe that it was Kent. At night, after supper, my lord called for the rear admiral's commission, which I brought him, and I sitting in my study heard my lord discourse with him concerning D. Kings and Newbury's being put out of commission, and by the way I did observe that my lord did speak more openly his mind to me afterwards at night than I can find that he did to the rear admiral, though his great confidant, for I was with him an hour together, when he told me clearly his thoughts that the king would carry it, and that he did think himself very happy that he was now at sea, as well for his own sake as that he thought he might do his country some service in keeping things quiet. To bed, and shifting myself from top to toe, there being J. Goods and W. Howe sat late by my bedside talking, so to sleep, every day bringing me a fresh sense of the pleasure of my present life. 18th. This morning very early came Mr. Edward Montague on board, but what was the business of his coming again, or before, without any servant, and making no stay at all, I cannot guess. This day Sir R. Stainer, Mr. Shepley, and as many of my lord's people as could be spared, went to Dover, to get things ready against to-morrow for the election there. I all the afternoon dictating in my cabin, my own head being troubled with multiplicity of business, to Burr, who wrote for me above a dozen letters, by which I have made my mind more light and clear than I have had it yet since I came on board. At night sent a packet to London, and Mr. Cook returned hence, bringing me this news, that the secretaries do talk high what they will do, but I believe all to no purpose, but the cavaliers are something unwise to talk so high on the other side as they do. That the lords do meet every day at my lord of Manchester's, and resolve to sit the first day of the Parliament. That it is evident now, that the general and the council do resolve to make way for the king's coming. And it is now clear, that either the fanatics must now be undone, or the gentry and citizens throughout England, and clergy must fall, in spite of their militia and army, which is not at all possible, I think. At night I supped with W. Howe and Mr. Llewellyn, being the first time that I had been so long with him, in the great cabin below. After that to bed, and W. Howe sat by my bedside, and he and I sang a psalm or two, and so I to sleep. 19th. A great deal of business all this day, and Burr being gone to shore without my leave did vex me much. At dinner news was brought us that my lord was chosen at Dover. This afternoon came one Mr. Mansell on board as a reformado, to whom my lord did shew exceeding great respect, but upon what account I do not yet know. This day it has rained much, so that when I came to go to bed I found it wet through, so I was fain to wrap myself up in a dry sheet, and so lay all night. 20th. All the morning I was busy to get my window altered, and to have my table set as I would have it, which after it was done I was infinitely pleased with it, and also to see what a command I have, to have every one ready to come and go at my command. This evening came Mr. Boyle on board, for whom I writ an order for a ship to transport him to Flushing. He supped with my lord, my lord using him as a person of honour. This evening, too, came Mr. John Pickering on board us. This evening my head ached exceedingly, which I impute to my sitting backwards in my cabin, otherwise than I am used to do. To-night Mr. Shepley told me that he heard for certain at Dover that Mr. Edward Montague did go beyond sea when he was here first the other day and I am apt to believe that he went to speak with the king. This day one told me how that at the election at Cambridge for Knights of the Shire, Wenby and Thornton, by declaring to stand for the Parliament and a king, and the settlement of the church, did carry it against all expectation against Sir Dudley North and Sir Thomas Willis. I supped to-night with Mr. Shepley below at the half-deck table, and after that I saw Mr. Pickering, whom my lord brought down to his cabin, and so to bed. 21st. This day dined Sir John Boyce, and some other gentlemen formerly great cavaliers, and among the rest one Mr. Norwood, for whom my lord gave a convoy to carry him to the Brill. But he certainly going to the king, for my lord commanded me that I should not enter his name in my book. My lord do show them, and that sort of people, great civility. All their discourse and others are of the king's coming, and we begin to speak of it very freely, and heard how in many churches in London, and upon many signs there, and upon merchant ships in the river, they had set up the king's arms. In the afternoon the captain would by all means have me up to his cabin, and there treated me huge nobly, giving me a barrel of pickled oysters, and opened another for me, and a bottle of wine, which was a very great favour. 
at night late singing with w howe and under the barber's hands in the coach this night there came one with a letter from mr edward montague to my lord with command to deliver it to his own hands i do believe that he do carry some close business on for the king this day i had a large letter from mr moore giving me an account of the present dispute at london that is like to be at the beginning of the parliament about the house of lords who do resolve to sit with the commons as not thinking themselves dissolved yet which whether it be granted or no or whether they will sit or no it will bring a great many inconveniences his letter i keep it being a very well writ one twenty second easter sunday several londoners strangers friends of the captains dined here who among other things told us how the king's arms are every day set up in houses and churches particularly in all hallows church in thames street john simpson's church which being privately done was a great eyesore to his people when they came to church and saw it also they told us for certain that the king's statue is making by the mercer's company who are bound to do it to set up in the exchange after sermon in the afternoon i fell to writing letters against to-morrow to send to london after supper to bed twenty third all the morning very busy getting my packet ready for london only for an hour or two had the captain and mr shepley in my cabin at the barrel of pickled oysters that the captain did give me on saturday last after dinner i sent mr dunn to london with the packet this afternoon i had forty shillings given me by captain cowes of the paradox in the evening the first time that we had any sport among the seamen and indeed there was extraordinary good sport after my lord had done playing at ninepins after that w howe and i went to play two trebles in the great cabin below which my lord hearing after supper he called for our instruments and played a set of locks two trebles and a bass and that being done he fell to singing of a song made upon the rump with which he played himself well to the tune of the blacksmith after all that done then to bed twenty fourth this morning i had mr llewellyn and mr shepley to the remainder of my oysters that were left yesterday after that very busy all the morning while i was at dinner with my lord the coxswain of the vice-admiral came for me to the vice-admiral to dinner so i told my lord and he gave me leave to go i rose therefore from table and went where there was very many commanders and very pleasant we were on board the london which hath a state-room much bigger than the naseby but not so rich after that with the captain on board our own ship where we were saluted with the news of lambert's being taken which news was brought to london on sunday last he was taken in northamptonshire by colonel inglesby at the head of a party by which means their whole design is broke and things now very open and safe and every man begins to be merry and full of hopes in the afternoon my lord gave a great large character to write out so i spent all the day about it and after supper my lord and we had some more very good music and singing of turn amaryllis as it is printed in the song-book with which my lord was very much pleased after that to bed twenty fifth all the morning about my lord's character dined to-day with captain clark on board the speaker a very brave ship where was the vice-admiral rear-admiral and many other commanders after dinner home not a little contented to see how i am treated and with what respect made a fellow to the best commanders in the fleet all the afternoon finishing off the character which i did and gave it my lord it being very handsomely done and a very good one in itself but that not truly alphabetical supped with mr shepley w howe etc in mr pierce the purser's cabin we are very merry and so to bed captain isham came hither to-day twenty sixth this day came mr dunn back from london who brought letters with him that signify the meeting of the parliament yesterday and in the afternoon by other letters i hear that about twelve of the lords met and had chosen my lord of manchester speaker of the house of lords the young lords that never sat yet do forbear to sit for the present and sir harbottle grimstone speaker for the house of commons the house of lords sent to have a conference with the house of commons which after a little debate was granted dr reynolds preached before the commons before they sat my lord told me how sir h yelverton formerly my schoolfellow was chosen in the first place for northamptonshire and mr crew in the second and told me how he did believe that the cavaliers have now the upper hand clear of the presbyterians all the afternoon i was writing of letters among the rest one to w simons peter llewellyn and tom doling which because it is somewhat merry i keep a copy of after that done mr shepley w howe and i down with j goods into my lord's storeroom of wine and other drink where it was very pleasant to observe the massy timbers that the ship is made of 
We in the room were wholly under water, and yet a deck below that. After that to supper, where Tom Guy supped with us, and we had very good laughing, and after that some music, when Mr. Pickering, beginning to play a bass part upon the viol, did it so like a fool that I was ashamed of him. After that to bed. 27th. This morning Burr was absent again from on board, which I was troubled at, and spoke to Mr. Pierce, purser, to speak to him of it, and it is my mind. This morning Pims bent in my cabin, putting a great many ribbons to a suit. After dinner in the afternoon came on board Sir Thomas Hatton and Sir R. Malevra, going for flushing. But all the world know that they go where the rest of the many gentlemen go, that every day flock to the king at Breda. They supped here, and my lord treated them, as he do the rest that go thither, with a great deal of civility. While we were at supper a packet came, wherein much news from several friends. The chief is that that I had from Mr. Moore, viz., that he fears the cavaliers in the house will be so high, that the others will be forced to leave the house, and fall in with General Monk, and so offer things to the king so high on the Presbyterian account, that he may refuse, and so they will endeavour some more mischief. But when I told my lord it, he shook his head and told me that the Presbyterians are deceived, for the general is certainly for the king's interest, and so they will not be able to prevail that way with him. After supper the two knights went on board the Grantham, that is to convey them to Flushing. I am informed that the exchequer is now so low that there is not twenty pounds there, to give the messenger that brought the news of Lambert's being taken, which story is very strange that he should lose his reputation of being a man of courage now at one blow for that he was not able to fight one stroke, but desired of Colonel Inglesby several times, for God's sake, to let him escape. Late reading my letters, my mind being much troubled to think that, after all our hopes, we should have any cause to fear any more disappointments therein. To bed. This day I made even with Mr. Creed by sending him my bill, and he me my money by Burr, whom I sent for it. 28th. This morning sending a packet by Mr. Dunn to London. In the afternoon I played at ninepins with Mr. Pickering, I and Mr. Pett against him and Ted Osgood, and won a crown apiece of him. He had not money enough to pay me. After supper my lord exceeding merry, and he and I and W. Howe to sing, and so to bed. Twenty ninth Sunday. This day I put on first my fine cloth suit made of a cloak that had like to have been dirted a year ago, the very day that I put it on. After sermon in the morning Mr. Cook came from London with a packet, bringing news how all the young lords that were not in arms against the Parliament do now sit. That a letter is come from the King to the House, which is locked up by the Council till next Tuesday, that it may be read in the open house when they meet again. They having adjourned till then to keep a fast to-morrow. And so the contents is not yet known. Thirteen thousand of the twenty thousand pounds given to General Monk is paid out of the Exchequer, he giving twelve pounds among the teller-clerks of Exchequer. My lord called me into the great cabin below, where I opened my letters, and he told me that the Presbyterians are quite mastered by the Cavaliers, and that he fears Mr. Crew did go a little too far the other day, in keeping out the young lords from sitting, that he do expect that the king should be brought over suddenly, without staying to make any terms at all, saying that the Presbyterians did intend to have him brought in, with such conditions as if he had been in chains. But he shook his shoulders when he told me how Monk had betrayed him, for it was he that did put them upon standing to put out the lords, and other members that came not within the qualifications, which he did not like. But, however, he had done his business, though it be with some kind of baseness. After dinner I walked a great while upon the deck with the surgeon and purser, and other officers of the ship, and they all pray for the king's coming, which I pray God send. 30th. All the morning getting instructions ready for the squadron of ships that are going to-day to the straits, among others, Captain Tediman, Curtis, and Captain Robert Blake, to be commander of the whole squadron. After dinner to Ninepins, W. Howe and I against Mr. Creed and the captain. We lost five shillings apiece to them. After that, W. Howe, Mr. Shepley, and I got my lord's leave to go to see Captain Sparling. So we took boat and first went on shore, it being very pleasant in the fields, but a very pitiful town, deal is. We went to Fuller's, the famous place for ale, but they have none but what was in the vat. After that to Poole's, a tavern in the town, where we drank, and so to boat again, and went to the assistance, where we were treated very civilly by the captain, and he did give us such music upon the harp, by a fellow that he keeps on board, that I never expect to hear the like again. Yet he is a drunken simple fellow to look on as any I ever saw. 
After that on board the Naseby, where we found my lord at supper, so I sat down, and very pleasant my lord was, with Mr. Creed and Shepley, who he puzzled about finding out the meaning of the three notes, which my lord had cut over the crystal of his watch. After supper some music. Then Mr. Shepley, W. Howe, and I up to the lieutenant's cabin, where we drank, and I and W. Howe were very merry, and among other frolics he pulls out the spigot at the little vessel of ale that was there in the cabin, and drew some into his mountier and after he had drank, I endeavouring to dash it in his face, he got my velvet studying cap and drew some into mine too, that we made ourselves a great deal of mirth, but spoiled my clothes with the ale that we dashed up and down. After that to bed, very late, with 